Ten. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clark. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any of those proposals at the request of any senator. There being none, we'll move on and I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and a related bill, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Watt. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Federal Court and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. Labor is proud to have established a standalone specialist family court under the Whitlam government. Today we stand here to defend its ongoing existence. These bills threaten the existence of a specialist family court in Australia and so should be opposed. Together, these bills represent the most significant reform of the family court since its creation in 1975. What these bills seek to do is combine the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court into one court with two, two divisions. That court would then be called the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. The current Family Court of Australia would become Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Division 1, while the Federal Circuit Court of Australia would become the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Division 2. Like the courts that they would be replacing, the Division 1 court would deal exclusively with family law matters, including the most complex matters while the Division II Court would deal with family law and other federal law matters. Both divisions would operate under the leadership of a single Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Justice with a single set of rules and a single point of entry. The Appeals Division of the Family Court would not be replaced with anything. Instead, all Division I judges would be able to hear appeals either as a single judge or as part of a full court. The proposal, the proposal to merge these courts is not based on any consultation with Australian families or family law experts. Instead, it is based on an inadequate review from PwC that cites evidence from other reports not put together by experts in this area, but rather by bean counters at Ernst & Young and KPMG. Rather than a merger or amalgamation of courts, the evidence actually points to the need for a specialist family court to be more pronounced and better resourced. The Australian Law Reform Commission noted in its 2019 report on the family law system that when the court was established, it could not have been foreseen that it would, need, it would be seeing the level or growth in incidence of family violence and child abuse that it does now. But as we know, it is typical of this government to commission an expert review only to then completely ignore it and allow it to collect dust on the top shelf. The realisation of Whitlam's vision of a specialist family law court with interrelated co-located services and resources was about creating a structure that could deal not just with the legal rights of those appearing before it, but also their unique human problems. Finally realising this vision, not backing away from it, has never been more important than now. Vulnerable children and families need a system that is not only efficient but also safe and sensitive to their particular needs and vulnerabilities. This is not to say that there are not problems with the family court as it exists today. There are. The Australian Law Reform Commission report that I previously mentioned 
notes that the system has, and I quote, been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. We recently heard the word neglect used in relation to the aged care sector when the Royal Commission released its interim report. But this is not the only area that this government has neglected. Under this government, the federal court and family courts have been willfully neglected. Neglected first by the Abbott government, then by the Turnbull government, and now by the Morrison government. They have starved them of funding, sat on new appointments, and ignored a stream of sensible reviews that flagged problems along the way. A cynic might think that all of this has been a deliberate effort of systematic deterioration in order to justify the court's merger. This government has ignored any opportunity to fix a family law system and instead is pursuing its ill-advised restructure that is sure to make an already bad situation worse. There has been next to no consultation on these bills, at least not in any meaningful sense. No consultation with legal professionals, no consultation with counsellors or psychologists, especially those working with children. No consultation with family specialists or families with experience of the system. Not to mention the already di mentioned dismissal of numerous report, expert reports, including that from the Australian Law Reform Commission. And apart from the Chief Justice, the government did not even consult with the judges of the family court. The government is not interested in implementing evidence-based policy. Instead, they are pursuing ideological pet projects even when they put the health, safety and well-being of Australian families at risk. These bills have a list of opponents longer than a month of Sundays. More than 100 different stakeholders from the Law Council of Australia to various community legal centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, child protection advocates and disability services and women's legal services have all written to the Attorney-General and asked him to abandon his plans as outlined in these bills. He has ignored their expert advice. The government has ignored the advi their advice that the abolition of the family court will harm already vulnerable children and families in need of specialist family law assistance. They have ignored the advice that the abolition of the family court will place further stresses on federal circuit court judges who are struggling under unsafe, unsustainable and unconscionable workloads. They have ignored their advice that the abolition of the family court will increase rather than decrease cost, time and stress for families and children in the family law system. And they have failed to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence survivors falling through the cracks. No one likes this bill. No one in the system thinks this bill is a good idea. Just listen to what those, these eminent experts have said of the proposed merger of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court. The first Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Elizabeth Everett AC, has warned that, and I quote, Taking photographs in the chamber. Oh, yes, sorry. You are. Thank you. You are now. Uh, please continue, Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. The first Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Elizabeth Everett AC, has warned, and I'll quote, merging the family court into a generalist court will undermine the integrity and the structural specialisation of the family court. The impact of losing this institutional specialisation is not properly understood and has been downplayed. The increasing number of cases in which issues of family violence and child abuse are raised has led to an even greater need today for family law jurisdiction to be vested exclusively in specialised judges who can give their full attention to the needs of family law clients without being diverted to exercise other unrelated jurisdictions. The current bill undermines this principle, is not in the public interest and should, should not be enacted. And that's Elizabeth Evatt. The second Chief Justice of the Family Court, the Honour Honourable Alistair Nicholson, AORFDQC, who served in that position for 16 years, from 1988, backed up Ms Evatt's arguments, noting, and I quote, it is unbelievable that government would propose a dissolution of, the fed of a federal superior court in this fashion without the most careful and searching public inquiry 
and without carrying out significant research and without consulting the many experts in this field. So that's the Honourable Alistair Nicholson, one of the most experienced people in this jurisdiction. He went on to say, what those proposing this merger do, um, do not seem to understand is that family law is complex and nuanced, and it is not to be judged by the output by numbers of cases as if the courts are sausage machines. Throughout, th throughput is important, but so is the quality of the decisions made. The National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services noted that these bills will, and I quote, disproportionately impact the most vulnerable, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families who need the most support. Pauline Wright, the President of the Law Council of Australia, said that the Family Court is a respected, specialised and focused court dealing with family law issues, before positing that its abolition would mean, and I quote, that Australian families and children will have to compete for resourcing and hearing time with all federal matters, that is, other matters like migration, bankruptcy and those sort of things that the federal circuit courts and the federal courts deal with. There must be an increase, not a decrease, in specialisation in family law and violence issues. This is critical for the safety of children and victims of family violence, she said. The Law Council of Australia, Community Legal Centres Australia and Women's Legal Services Australia have variously said that these bills are a terrible gamble with the lives of children and families, that they are a retrograde step, that they will expose survivors of family violence to unnecessary risk, and that the focus of the government should be on ensuring the safety and best interests of the child and the safety of adult victim survivors of family violence in family law proceedings. Despite the government's protestations, there is no real rationale for these bills. Currently, there are two separate courts, the Specialist Family Court of Australia and the Non-Specialist Federal Circuit Court of Australia, that hear family law matters in Australia. The government is claiming that these bills will help reduce delays and backlogs in these two courts by creating a single point of entry for federal family law matters. Frankly, this is nonsense. So there are the, the people I have quoted, they are of this opinion. The delays that are a direct result of actions by this government. It is a government that is causing unacceptable del delays in the family court system, delays caused by the starvation of funding, delays caused by the refusal of new appointments, and delays caused by willfully ignoring se numerous sensible, sensible expert reviews. Average waiting times for the production of a family report by a family consultant have blown out. As at 12 March 2020, this was 11 months and six to nine months res re respectively for the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court in, a, in Sydney. 7.5 months and five to seven months respect respect res respectively in Melbourne and 4.25 months for each court in Hobart. The Morrison government and what they are doing here today is only part of the problem. This goes back seven years, spans three Liberal governments and a series of deliberate measures to undermine the family court system. As the experts have made clear, this merger proposal will do nothing to address delays in the family court system. There's nothing in this bill that will increase the number of judges, registrars and other court staff. There's nothing in this bill that will force the Attorney-General to do his job, even something as basic as appointing new judges as vacancies are created. There's nothing in this bill that will help Australian families. There is nothing in this bill that will help the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Pratt. Oh, yeah. beg your pardon. Is it Senator Waters? Sorry. No, okay. I'll go after Senator you. Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, today we again see misplaced so-called reform come before this chamber. The government has been uh, intent on merging the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia. Uh, and we know uh, that this bill was previously uh, rejected uh, by the Senate. I can't remember if it was actually put, but we went through a complex uh, Senate inquiry that looked in detail at the issues uh, raised by the desire to merge the two courts. And it was found 
that this merger is not supported by the evidence. Minister Porter went ahead with pushing this merger while he's yet to act on the substantial issues raised by the Australian Law Reform Commission's report into family law in Australia. And so what we have here is a bill that impacts on the most vulnerable families at a time when they need support and at a time when they need a dispute resolution most. And at a time when we see across our country family violence and abuse being on the rise. What we see here is in effect the Family Court of Australia ceasing as a specialist standalone superior court. And it would be collapsed into Australia's busiest and most overburdened courts, and that is the Federal Circuit Court, that deals with a great diversity of issues. We know since its creation, we know since the creation of the Family Court, that the vision for these courts was a specialist family court with interrelated co-located resources and services. And as our great late Prime Minister Gough Whitlam said, a court with regard to the human problems of couples and families, not just their legal rights. Because what we have here are not um, general issues that other generalist courts deal with. They are of the most fundamental nature to our being. They are issues uh, that are about life-changing decisions about children's lives. And it is essential, in my view, that the distinguishing feature of the family courts, which is their specialisation in families, must not be abolished. It must continue to exist. And it is bizarre and ridiculous to me that, you can, that the government thinks that you can merge these courts into much busier courts and still retain the same emphasis on the services required. But I guess I'm not surprised because I haven't seen any evidence yet of the government's desire to put more specialist services uh, into the family court. Uh, I certainly know they've done some trials uh, in particular communities around Australia that look at uh, innovative ways of resolving family court disputes, but there isn't systemic support for what is a nationwide problem. We know that the Australian Law Reform Commission found that the family court system has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia and to whose family law system other countries once looked and to and tried to emulate. Now they are telling words indeed. The first time this bill came forward, the Australian Law Reform Commission was uh, newly commissioned to undergo this review. And nevertheless, Minister Porter sought to push on with this court merger as if it was a great priority. And again, not just the, the reform of family law issues, and, but the resourcing, the very resourcing of the courts and services has been underdone. Instead, what the government has done is frankly blame the family court system uh, for being inefficient when the statistics uh, do not uh, back up uh, that argument. 
So this merger is, merger is taking place without consultation with family specialists like counsellors, child psychologists, uh, no one other than the Chief Justice, or, and it's taking place without any judges of the family court being able to participate in this. And I know this again from my previous experience in the Senate inquiries in these issues. Judges had to be very circumspect about making appearances before Senate committees because of the separation uh, of powers, and it wasn't seen proper that they should be able to come and talk to us directly. But there have been enough judges that have put their voices uh, up for us to see very clearly uh, what their views are. We very much need in our nation a specialised court that provides a system that is safe and sensitive to particular needs and the vulnerabilities of children and families. And I very much recognise that this bill undermines that need. I come from the state of Western Australia, where we have our own family court that hasn't been merged into the federal system. As a result of that, we were able to do things like um, uh, same-sex de facto recognition uh, back in the early 2000s. So we had a court system that tries to focus in law but also in the way it's resourced that responds to the needs of the community. Right now, almost 70 per cent of matters before the Commonwealth Family Courts involve allegations of family violence. And what we really need is a system that bolsters specialisation in this critical area. And I have to say this bill does nothing but undermine that. It's a bad situation for families. It's a bad situation for victims of family violence. We need cultural competence. We need resources in our family court. So, as I was highlighting before, WA is the only state with a state-based family court. And in WA, we have effectively two divisions, magistrates and judges, operating seamlessly to determine family law issues. And I would very much be the first to recognise that that state system uh, has its challenges uh, with resourcing, etc. But as Christian Porter, Minister Porter, uh, would know as the former Attorney General of Western Australia, West Australians value the expertise and focus of that court. The last thing that would be acceptable to the state of WA is some kind of generic uh, court system. Minister Porter would know that. It would never have been something he would have put forward uh, at a state level, and it should not be put forward now. The 2008 Future Governance Options for the Federal Family Courts in Australia report, which was called the Semple Report, um, recommends that kind of system. It's been endorsed by stakeholders, including the Women's Legal Services Australia and the Law Council of Australia. Again, the Attorney General should know this. I guess uh, Minister Porter is just looking for some things to put his stamp on because he's not capable of uh, engaging properly with the kind of cultural and legal issues that are really at the core of uh, enhancing people's uh, rights and protecting their vulnerabilities. We know that family violence is on the rise, and we want to be here in this place promoting safety for children, safety for adults by preserving access to this specialist family court. We have a family law system over the last seven years of the Liberal government that has been one of neglect. And I think that this bill makes that much worse. 
putting people into a much bigger melting pot of the legal system. We have a government that's cut funding to legal assistance, failed to replace retiring judges in a timely way, failed to respond to the dozens of recommendations that have been made by experts to improve the family law system. So we have a family law system that's been under-resourced and a family law system that has failed to have the kind of laws within it that are necessary for a quality system. And yet, this Attorney General has sought to blame the courts, the family court itself, for some of these problems. So, indeed, we have seen an increase in the number of unrepresented litigations, and these typically take longer to resolve. Why? Because of that lack of resourcing. The Law Reform Commission completed the most comprehensive review of the law reform system a family law that's ever been conducted. It did not recommend this merger, and the government has failed yet to even respond. So what flimsy evidence is the government basing this on? Instead, it's the discredited six-week desktop review by Price Waterhouse Coopers by two accountants. That's the evidence based, based for these radical reforms. And we quizzed Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, in the Senate committees about these reports. And indeed, the statistics don't take account of the complexity of matters. It simply looked at timelines in the statistics for the resolution of cases. And so if you once you account for those factors, if you were to take, to take into account complexity, then there is no evidence base, no evidence base at all to say one court is more efficient than the other, especially in an environment where you've got uh, unrepresented uh, people before the court, especially in an environment where legal services have been uh, defunded, and especially in a system where the law reform itself that should be embedded uh, in these courts hasn't been addressed. So there's a clear consensus among experts that collapsing the courts is a bad thing. A bad thing in terms of harming vulnerable children and families in need of specialist family law assistance. In terms of increased cost, increased time and stress for families and children in the system. And indeed, more stress on federal circuit court judges who are already uh, under unsustainable workloads. And I recognise that federal circuit court judges do currently deal with family law matters. But this is not their area of expertise, and it is an area of expertise that we should be supporting the growth of in terms of specialist courts and a specialist system. Evidence from experts that this merger proposal is that it will increase costs and increase time and stress for families and children. And indeed, it will place further stress on federal circuit court judges, and that I find also alarming. We have a family law system already in crisis in this country, and this so-called reform and merger of the courts is the last thing the court system and families of Australia need. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to, uh, to speak in extreme opposition uh, to this proposal to merge the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court. This government bill that's been brought on today um, in an awful hurry after it seems uh, one of the crossbenchers has changed their mind about their view on the bill. This bill has been hanging around for years and it's been a bad idea since the day dot. Now, I don't think there's anyone who thinks the Family Law Court is working terribly well at the minute. We hear um, harrowing stories of justice delayed. I'm sure everyone knows that justice 
delayed is justice denied. There is a lack of uh, proper training for judicial officers and support staff in uh, responding to and spotting and supporting domestic violence. Um, there is a desperate underfunding of community legal centres and, uh, and other folk that support people uh, seeking to access the family court. But merging the family court and the federal circuit court won't fix any of those problems. Uh, so I, I'm just baffled at why the government thinks that this is a good idea. Um, the, it's a friendless proposal and until this morning when we see, um, uh, I think it's One Nation and Senator Patrick who've decided to support this bill, no one else in the profession thinks this merger is a good idea. Um, none of the constituents that I've spoken to on this matter um, think that this will fix any of the issues that they have uh, with uh, getting their issues properly dealt with in the family court. The fact is the court is under-resourced. There's a massive backlog. You don't fix that by adding it in with a different jurisdiction. You fix that by properly resourcing the court, hiring some more judges. The court themselves has a proposal to hire some more registrars to deal with some of the, um, the, the less legally intense aspects. That seems like a meritorious suggestion, um, as long as there's more judges hired as well. There's so many things that could and should be done to fix up the problem. This is the wrong solution to the right problem, um, and it, it's just—it's—it's it's baffling to me that the Attorney General, in the face of so many letters, so many submissions, so many experts saying wrong way go back, that they are still persisting with this nonsense proposal that won't fix anything. Um, the safety of children needs to be paramount in the family court, and one of the um, advantages of the family court is that it is a specialist jurisdiction. It is a superior court, as the legalese calls it, with specialist expertise. Merging that with a generalist court can only, logic holds, reduce specialisation. And in this day and age where we have an epidemic of violence against women and their children and where many of the cases that end up in the family court um, in fact feature that as an element, why on earth would you reduce the specialisation um, of the courts to deal with that matter? So yes, of course we need more training um, for those judges and registrars and other support services that surround victims of violence that are seeking to access justice through the family court. Um, but we will have less of that when you reduce the specialisation of the court. Uh, it just genuinely beggars belief that the government could think this is in any way a good idea for anyone. So we strongly oppose uh, this bill, and of course it's not the first time um, the government sought to bring these bills on. They've been hanging around since 2018. Um, everyone recommended against them then. They're still recommending against them now, uh, and it's falling on on ears that just will not hear sense. Now, uh, as part of a separate but related inquiry into family law matters, I attended a briefing um, uh, in recent times and was told of the reforms that the court is already undertaking. There is already a process to harmonise court rules. So what administrative efficiencies can be gained, what closer association there needs to be, is already happening. We do not need this merger to deliver administrative efficiencies, and it certainly won't deliver justice. It will reduce specialisation. Um, and it is uh, an overly, comp um, overly complex and ill-fitting solution that does not address um, the real problems. So we are concerned about the loss of specialisation in the family court. We are concerned that victims of domestic violence, survivors, I should say, of domestic violence, will continue to be re-traumatised through the justice system and will now have an even less appropriate forum in which to raise those matters. Um, Women's organisations oppose this bill. Even uh, a bevy of ex-family court judges themselves oppose this bill. Um, and I might take the chance just to, um, to highlight some of those uh, concerns. I have a letter here which is signed by more than 150 um, professionals in this, in this space, some of them um, ex-judges, uh, the Law Council is a signatory, many of the women's support services have signed on. Um, it's a letter to the Attorney-General. And I'm going to quote selectively from it. One of the paragraphs says, any reform should strengthen a system, not lead to a diminution of specialisation. Um, if the government's proposed reforms proceed, we will lose a standalone specialist superior family court. 
Um, they go on to say, uh, we support having a single entry point to the family courts and common rules so that the system is easier for families to navigate, but this can be done without abandoning the benefits otherwise available to children and families from a properly resourced and specialised court system. Um, so they've referred to the fact that those rules are in the process of being harmonised, uh, and they too support that process. But we do not need to be merging these two courts and diluting the specialisation of the family court um, in order to achieve those administrative efficiencies. And indeed, what should be the driver here? It should be the safety of children um, and people seeking justice, and it should be facilitating affordable access to justice, uh, not simply a box-ticking exercise for the Attorney General. Um, those signatories to the letter go on to say, we believe an increase in specialisation in family law and family violence will increase the safety of children and adult victim survivors of family violence. The need for increased specialisation of courts to improve decisions and outcomes for families is supported by the evidence of many inquiries. Um, the safety of children and adult victim survivors of family violence require increased specialisation. The proposed merger serves only to undermine that important need. Um, this is a ludicrous proposal. It has no friends bar a couple of folk on the crossbench who happen to be in the balance of power in the Senate. Um, and this will uh, further delay the delivery of justice. It will further reduce the ability of the courts to acknowledge and address family violence. Um, it will continue to disenfranchise uh, people seeking justice from the courts. Um, it doesn't fix the underfunding of community legal centres and other support services. It doesn't fix the understaffing of courts uh, when it comes to the numbers of judicial officers and the workload that they have. Um, it doesn't fix the problem of uh, costly uh, applications to the court. It doesn't fix any of those real problems, which have real impacts on people's real lives. So it, it is the most shameless and disappointing of proposals um, to, to hold out false hope when uh, this isn't going to solve anything. In fact, it's going to make it worse. So we oppose this uh, bill with the strongest possible. Uh, might of our party. Um, we have many, much support in that regard, but sadly um, it seems that with the change of one vote from a crossbench member, this bill may well pass the Senate today. Well, we will be doing everything we can to stop that because we believe that justice should be accessible, that specialisation is appropriate um, and necessary, and that more resourcing for the family court, not a dilution of its specialisation with this merger, is what's needed to protect women, children and others seeking access from the family law justice system. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Today, the parliament is again considering the Morrison Liberal government's attempt to dissolve the Specialist Family Court of Australia as a standalone superior court. Should the parliament accept this legislation, it will be a sad end indeed to a decades-old institution which has served Australia well. The Family Court of Australia, of course, is an institutional legacy of the Whitlam Labor government. It is a proud legacy and has served our nation well. The enactment of the Family Law Act 1975 saw two significant social reforms for the nation. It brought around the key, about the key milestone for Australian women of no-fault divorce, and it established, finally, and with much need, a standalone multidisciplinary court designed specifically to consider the, uh, disputes arising within the family. This bill represents the most significant change to the structure of family law in this nation since that time, 46 years on. So it is more than appropriate that this matter is given the sort of consideration and debate worthy of the institution and the critical matters it deals with. Let us briefly consider some of the history of the family law and the, uh, and the court in Australia. Shortly after the passage of the Family Law Act in 1975, the then Labor Attorney General Kep Enderby wrote that, and I quote, and I know other senators have spoken about uh, the work of the then Labor Attorney General, but it is important that, um, that the Senate hear 
these words again, because this is a crit critical piece of legislation, a p critical piece of legislation that needs to be defeated. Mr M. Enderby said, and I quote, in public discussion of the Family Law Act, most of the attention has understandably and quite properly focused on the ground of divorce and, to a lesser extent, the maintenance provisions. While not underrating the magnitude of the reforms to the divorce and maintenance laws, I feel sure that, in time, the provision for the establishment of family courts will come to be seen as a reform of equal importance." End quote. Mr Enderby later said that the essential distinguishing features of the family court is that it would be dealing only, only with family law matters. This has been critical. And yet, the proposition before us today would abolish this essential distinguishing feature. It would roll the family court into one of Australia's busiest and most poor and most poorly resourced and overburdened courts, the Federal Circuit Court. And what of the modern day role of the family court in Australia? Much has been said about its pivotal role and the vital need as an important institution. In 2019, the Australian Law Reform Commi uh, Commission delivered a landmark report on the family law system. A report, it should be noted in this place, that whilst the government commissioned it, has completely ignored it. In the report, the commission noted that at the time of passage of the Family Law Act, the Whitlam government did not quite reasonably foresee the growth in the incidence and awareness of family violence that would come. Thus, the need for a specialist court to deal with these sensitive matters has only grown. Has only grown. And we must consider what specialisation actually means. At the time of its establishment, the specialised court envisaged was one in which the environment would have, would have regard to the human problems, as Whitlam described it, of couples and families. Not simply a clinical and sanitised institution that solely considered legalistic matters and requirements. It was to be a court with interrelated and co-located services and resources for families. This is, critically in, this is a critically important distinction, especially for vulnerable children and families in need of a safe and sensitive environment. It is universally understood and accepted that the family court system at present suffers from serious deficiencies. We need only look at the findings from the Australian Law Reform Commission, which determined that the family law system has, and I quote, been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia, and to, to whose family law system and other countries once looked and tried to emulate. End quote. A sad indictment indeed on the current state of affairs for families in need of a swift and quality judicial, judicial experience. The last seven years in particular has brought about, much, about such neglect and it would be hard to consider it to be anything other than deliberate. A deliberate trashing of Australia's system of family law from successive conservative governments. It started with deliberate cuts and neglected by the government and the neglect by the government led by Mr Tony Abbott and continued with fur further cuts and neglects by the governments led by Mr Turnbull and now Mr Scott Morrison. And how has that neglect manifested itself? It starts with the failure to replace judges of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court in a timely manner. Despite increased demands for services, funding has not been delivered to meet that demand, and the recommendation of repeated reviews has been continuously ignored, parked on the bench to gather dust. And so, after all of that, the government's solution, this bill before us. Instead of working to fix the family law system, it, this bill will only make this situation much worse. And that is bad news for Australian families and vulnerable people, including vulnerable children. The government's bill seeks to combine two distinct courts into one. It trashes the concept set forth by the Whitlam government of a single standalone and specialised, specialised family court designed to deal with the sensitive human problems of family law. 
In combining the Federal uh, Circuit Court and the Family Court, both these divisions would share the same single Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Justice. They would share a single set of rules and a single point of entry. Worryingly, the Appeals Division of the Family Court would not be replaced with anything. The same bench of judges will hear matters both in original jurisdiction and on appeal. When this merger was originally proposed by the government, the Attorney General said that he would stop appointing new judges to Division 1 as they retire. That would obviously amount to a gradual abolition of Division 1, that is, the Family Court of Australia, over time. Whilst he backed away from this proposition after sustained public criticism, there is nothing in this bill there is nothing in this bill that would prevent him from reverting back to his original position. He can, once again, have a change of mind and simply stop appointing judges. We are supposed to simply take him at his word. Unsurprisingly, there are few who do when it comes to this Attorney General. Even if, even if changes were made to this bill to guarantee the continuation of the proposed Division 1, the Family Court, it would not address the fundamental problem at the heart of this bill, and that is the abolition of specialisation within, uh, within our Australian system of family law. So why such a radical departure? Perhaps the government is relying on a quantum of supporting evidence. Perhaps they have consulted widely to reach, to reach and form this view. Nope and nope. No such evidence, no such cons consultation. The Morrison government claims that the proposed merger has been informed by independent reviews and, and inquiries over a decade. On his department website, the minister, the attorney general, has named five reports under a heading that reads the evidence base for the reforms. However, unfortunately, like most of the work produced by this attorney general, it doesn't even make sense because not one of the reports he lists has recommended these radical reforms. In fact, none of these report, re, reports have, been considered, have, have even considered these reforms. Just one of the reports recommended restructuring the family court. However, the model recommended would have maintained, would have maintained a standalone specialised court, not once in almost 70 reviews of the family law system undertaken since 1974 has it ever been recommended the family court system of Australia should be restructured in the way proposed by this government. These re reviews and reports are all listed in Appendix 3 to the interim report of the Joint Select Committee into Family Law. But the Attorney General continues to ignore all this, continues to ignore the evidence cited by his own department and this parliament. But senators, senators in this place should not ignore the evidence. So what does the government um, rely on? What evidence do they rely on? Amazingly, the most radical change to the structure of family law in Australia has been done off the back of a six-week desktop review of data by two accountants. That's it. A review, it should be noted, that has been widely panned and thoroughly discredited. And what about consultations on this bill? There has not been any meaningful consultation with the legal profession or with any other family specialist like counsellors or child psychologists. There was no consultation with users of the family law system, Australian families, other than with the Chief Justice, the government did not even consult with the judges of the family court. Such a radical reform should not be undertaken with such scant regard for, for consultation. Yet it is no wonder the government did not wish to consult, because they would have come across naught but an avalanche of, of opposition. Let's look at some of the commentary, opinion and analysis on this bill. No fewer than 110 stakeholders. In fact, the, the, the a letter that was sent to all members of parliament um, ha, indicates it's opposed by over 155 stakeholders, including 13 retired judges. And it also includes community legal centres, the Law Council of Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Legal Services, Child P 
protection advocate, women legal service, disability services, and many more have written to the Attorney General asking him to abandon this proposal. They have been silenced. Their views uh, have been ignored. To the last, these opponents have made it clear that it is their combined view that this proposal will increase rather than decrease cost, time and stress for families and children in the family law system, harm vulnerable children and families in the need of specialist family law assistance, place further stresses on the federal circuit court judges who are struggling under unsafe, unsustainable and unconscionable workloads, and fail to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence survivors falling through the cracks. The very first Chief, Chief Justice of the Family Co uh, Court of Australia, Elizabeth Evatt AC, has said, and I quote, the proposed merger of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court will lead to und undesirable outcomes for children and families, end quote. The Honourable Alistair Nicholson, the second Chief Judge judge of the Family Court, who served in that position between 1988 and 2004, has fully supported Ms Evans' remarks. Mr Nicholson has also said, in biting criticism, and I quote, it is unbelievable that government would propose the dissolution of a federal superior court in this fashion, without the most careful and searching public inquiry and without carrying out significant research and without consulting the many experts in this field, end quote. He went on to say, in pointed remarks, the family court is a court that has been envied throughout the common law world, and its judgments have been often cited with, but with approval by the courts of many countries, including New Zealand, UK, Canada, and the US, and others. Its significance as, only, as the only set specialist family court set up as a superior court of record, and particularly that of its appeal division, cannot be overemphasised." End quote. There are so many groups and organisations that, and experts in this field that have asked the government to stop with this reform, to stop with this legislation, but they've been unprepared to listen, unprepared to, to back down, and it's not good enough. We know that this legis legislation, if enacted, will lead to worse outcomes for very vulnerable families. Amongst the people that have written to all the senators and members here, I believe, there are a number of highly specialised expert organisations in South Australia. We've got the Women's Domestic Violence Service of South Australia. We've got the Family Violence Legal Service Aboriginal Corporation, SA. Justice Net South Australia. The South Australian Community Legal Centre. And it goes on. So I ask those senators to look to their own, look to their state experts Thank as you, to Senator what Brown. they are saying. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to speak on the government's Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia bill. Uh, let's be very clear about the government's intention with this bill. This bill would destroy the Family Court of Australia, leaving families and children at risk. And this government has been hard at work for some time running down the Family Court. There have been unacceptable delays in replacing retiring Family Court and Federal Circuit Court judges. Funding has not increased in response to increasing demand for family court services. Review after review with critical recommendations have been ignored by this government. And instead of fixing the family law system, the government wants to restructure the family court and the federal circuit court in a way that would make a bad situation for so many Australian families even worse and leave Australian children vulnerable. The Law Council of Australia has described the government's proposal as, and I quote, a terrible gamble with the lives of children, 
and families. And this government's bill is just another chapter in this government's long, long story of builders and wreckers. It's labour that builds and protects our most significant national institutions. It was labour that laid the foundation for Australia's world-leading family court system. We created Medicare, delivering free universal health care to every Australian. We invest in education and training so that our young people can fulfil their potential. We established a universal superannuation system so that working people have dignity in their retirement. We introduced the NDIS, making sure people with a disability are properly supported. And we built the social safety net uh, that is so important for vulnerable Australians. But the Liberals on the other side, the wreckers, are always trying to tear these institutions down, and this bill is no exception. Why do they do that? Because they just don't understand that ordinary Australians, working families and young people who are trying to build a good life and get ahead, retirees and pensioners, they just don't understand the people of Australia. Labor Prime Minister Gough Whitlam first introduced the bill to establish the Family Law Act back in 1975 in response to what he described as an overwhelming demand for reform. The Family Law Act instituted no-fault divorce and it established the critical Family Court of Australia, a specialist multidisciplinary court for the resolution of family disputes. And in 1975, Mr Whitlam said, the Family Law Bill is an achievement reflecting the Labor government's fundamental social and human priorities. It has completely refurbished the marriage and div divorce laws of Australia and done away with the medieval concepts of guilt and fault. The bill has established a Family Court of Australia to protect the rights of all parties in divorce proceedings in an atmosphere of dignity and humanity. And I'll repeat this for the wreckers on the other side of the chamber. Labor's family law reforms were and remain a reflection of Labor's fundamental social and human priorities, priorities which, with this bill, are in such clear deficit on the other side of the chamber. And Labor's reforms transformed outcomes for generations of families and, critically, for women and for children. In 1974, the Senate Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs described the Family Court as essential to give substance to key aspects of the Family Law Act. And the bill before us, it would collapse the Family Court into one of Australia's busiest and most poorly resourced and overburdened courts, the Federal Circuit Court. The bill would erode and ultimately abolish the Family Court of Australia as a specialist court. And that specialisation is intended to prioritise the safety of children. It's intended to prioritise the safety of adult victim survivors of family violence. Eminent Australian and the first Chief Justice of the Family Court, the Honourable Elizabeth Everett AC, has said that merging the family court will undermine the integrity and structural specialisation of the court. In her words, she has said the family court was designed purposely as a world-leading specialist standalone court to deal with family law matters with the support of a dedicated multidisciplinary team of counsellors and mediators. Its standalone nature, she says, is one of its greatest attributes, providing protections for vulnerable people in need of family law assistance. And her comments are fully endorsed by the Honourable Alastair Nicholson, second Chief Justice of the Family Court. He has said that it is unbelievable that the government would propose the dissolution of the Family Court. Let me repeat that word of his. Unbelievable. Unbelievable that the government would propose 
the dissolution of this court. He also says that the court's specialisation is what is absolutely necessary to deal with cases that can be extremely complex, involving the determination of issues relating to children, including their rights and need for protection, not only from individuals but also from government in its myriad forms. Who here in this chamber today doesn't understand the need to protect Australia's vulnerable children? Who here doesn't understand the advice that is coming from these eminent jurists? It's clear that the wreckers on the government benches just really don't care about taking advice or considering the overwhelming evidence on this bill. This bill does not have the support of people who work within our family law system the very people who work to protect Australia's vulnerable children, the very people who work to protect Australia's separated families, the very people who work to protect victim survivors of family violence. And Community Legal Centres of Australia has said that moving away from a specialist family court model would be, in their words, a retrograde step a retrograde step from this government. And they say it would expose survivors of violence to unnecessary risk. Women's Legal Services Australia's opposition to the government's legislation is, in their words, centred on ensuring the safety and best interest of the child and the safety of adult victim survivors of family violence in family law proceedings. And this, a damning observation offered by an eminent family law practitioner who says, it can't be anything other than ideology because there are so many groups opposed to it. Consultation with stakeholders on this bill, on the substance of the government's plans to abolish the family court in this bill has been absolutely terrible it has been missing in action. No meaningful consultation with the legal profession or with other family specialists like counsellors or child psychologists. No consultation with users of the family law system, Australian families. Uh, and other than with the Chief Justice, the government did not even consult with the judges of the family court. And over 100 stakeholders, ranging from the Law Council of Australia to Women's Legal Services, Community Legal Centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services, Child Protection Advocates and Disability Services from across the country have written to the Attorney-General to ask him to please abandon this proposal. Please abandon this proposal. And their pleas have fallen on deaf ears. This is what they have told the Attorney-General. They say that this proposal will harm vulnerable children and families in need of specialist family law assistance. They say the proposal will increase, rather than decrease, cost, time and stress for families in the family law system, families who are already under extreme stress. They say this proposal will place further stresses on federal circuit court judges who are already struggling under unsafe, unsustainable and unconscionable workloads. And they say this proposal will fail to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system. Again, this bill will fail to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence, um, survivors falling through the cracks. Women's Legal Services Australia has said these words, government commissioned inquiry after inquiry has recommended increasing specialisation of the family law system in family law and family violence, the safety of children and adult victim survivors of family violence and ongoing consideration of risk 
must be foundational in the family law system. And we recommend retaining the specialist, standalone, superior family court. Likewise, Victorian Women Lawyers does not support the government's bill, observing that there has been overwhelming opposition to the bill by family law experts and stakeholders, including a vast number of submissions from law societies and legal professionals calling for the bill to be rejected. In particular, VWL is concerned that the bill prioritises efficiency of hearing and resolving family law matters over and above the safety and wellbeing of families and children. The bill seeks to reduce, in their words, the operating costs of hearing family law matters at the expense of ensuring the appropriateness of judicial outcomes. The proposed merger, they say, of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court lacks sufficient justification weighed against the interests of parties to family law proceedings and goes against the recommendations of family law specialists. And I want to make particular mention of the government's proposal in the COVID context, uh, while parts of Australia remain in lockdown and remain at risk. For some people, home is not always the safe place that it should be. And a survey by the Australian Institute of Criminology has revealed more than half of women who had experienced violence before the COVID-19 crisis said the violence had become more frequent or severe since the start of the pandemic. COVID lockdowns and self-isolation, increased job insecurity and financial pressures are increasing the risk of family violence and a family breakdown in our country today. And that is why it is so astounding that the government would decide to pursue this legislation now. More than ever, it's time for us to actually strengthen and properly resource a standalone specialist family court, not tear it down. But the wreckers on the other side, the wreckers on the government benches, they are not listening. This bill, all the evidence says, will do nothing to help Australian families. Instead, the experts tell us that this bill will put Australia's vulnerable children at even greater risk. This bill will put Australian families already struggling, already under immense stress at harm. That is what the experts are telling us about this bill. Australian families deserve better from their government. They deserve protection from their government. They deserve a government that backs them up and supports them, not a government that tears down vital institutions that exist purely for the protection of Australian families. Australian families deserve better. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Well, it's a whole new low for the Liberal Party today, isn't it? Eh? I'll tell you who's gaining something out of this. And it isn't all those experts out there who said, do not do this, do not do this, because they would know it's gone from a lawyer's picnic to a lawyer's banquet, and they're going, you beauty, you beauty, bring in the money, bring her in, baby. That's exactly what's going on here. My goodness, like there isn't enough heartache going on in our family court system. Right now, it is under-resourced. It is understaffed. And if you think the heartache and the suicides that are going on out there right now is bad enough, if you've got half a conscience over that side, wait till you see what's coming. Because it is a train wreck in action. What is wrong with you people? You are playing with people's lives. And by the time they get to those family courts, they are vulnerable. Their mums and dads are vulnerable, and the poor kids, my goodness, where is your conscience today? Where is your conscience? Goodness me. Just take a moment and picture the judge hearing a case in an Australian court. Do me a favour and call up an image of it in your own mind for just one moment. And if you can get a slight feeling of it, that'd be great. And if you're one of the lucky people 
who has never had anything to do with our legal system, you will probably expect that the process is fast and fair. And I can tell you what, it is not. And not because of the judges, not because of the people who work in our courts, but because of the decisions that have been made up here. The under-resourcing, the understaffing, it is absolutely atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. And the harm you're going to bring and what you're already doing to these families is disgusting. No conscience whatsoever. I've never seen a government in my lifetime like this one. You should be ashamed of yourselves. I tell you what, you may picture something like what you see at the end of a cop show on TV. Maybe you're thinking of a system where the bad guys get locked up and the good guys are quickly let go. And in the back of your mind, you possibly have an idea that everybody has a high-powered lawyer in an expensive suit. And my goodness, are they expensive. And at the very least, you probably figure that normal people will get decent professional help to navigate through it all. And when it comes to someone's day before the judge, maybe you imagine that they have a lawyer who uses clever language and careful questions to get to the bottom of their case. If that's what you're thinking, you aren't alone. That's how I used to think our court system worked as well. Oh dear. It's so funny when you have life experience through something, not just in one year, two years, three years and four years. It's an amazing, amazing different picture that you actually get. Because I can tell you now it's pretty much how I would have, uh, because I've come to realise that this isn't true and that's, now, that's how things are. It's a fantasy, an absolute fantasy. Our courts don't look like courts on a TV or in movies. The truth is that process is messy and it is slow and it is incredibly expensive and is becoming out of reach to many normal Australians out there. That's where our justice system is going. And that is so unfair. Here's a great divide between the rich and the poor. And even the system finds the right answers eventually, it can take a lot of pain before you get there. The Attorney General knows this is a problem. He knows that the courts are running too slowly. They're too ineffective. People like to say the first step towards fixing a problem is admitting that you have one. And you've got to give it to the attorney. He has made the first step. Where he's gone wrong is in how he wants to fix it. He says that we need to merge the family and federal circuit courts to clear out the backlog. Well, I don't know where you've been, mate, but you've seen the backlog in the federal circuit court and you want to merge them? Oh, I don't know what planet you're sitting on, Attorney General, but come back to Earth. It was causing great harm to many Australians out there. Our court system, the whole lot of it, is in dire straits. And now you're going to throw this family court system in with the rest of it. Seriously. Seriously, mate. These bills don't, fix, don't do anything to fix what's going wrong. For so many Australian families who find themselves before the courts, Merging the two courts that deal with family law matters won't take the pressure off the judges to get through the hundreds of cases at a time, and it won't get people the legal assistance that they need to have the best chance that their day in court will go well for them. And if the Attorney General was really committed to making our courts faster and fair, he'd put his money where his mouth is once and for all and resource them. Because that's what's missing here, mate. Family law courses should be dealt with more quickly and more efficiently, so there was less harm done to the whole family unit. And that's not being done. Now you're just stretching it out. And like I said, I hope you can wear it, mate, because you're going to see a lot more hurt going on in these families and more suicides going on. You can sleep at night time. Quite frankly, you disgust me. Some judges in the circuit court have over 600 cases on their books. It isn't humanely possible for them to get through that kind of workload in a reasonable amount of time, let alone try and get through every case and understand it. The delays leave people stuck in limbo, waiting for hearing dates that are months away, years away. And when they finally get their hearing, they'll have to wait again for months for the judge to deliver their findings because they're so overstacked. These, are the, these sort of delays across all levels of all courts are causing the real harm to people and their families. The time it takes to get things resolved is the time that people aren't getting justice, either to have their defence upheld or their complaint acted upon. For families in the court system, it can mean months or years of waiting to be able to move on from a nasty marriage breakup, which has already caused havoc. 
on the family unit itself, let alone the destruction it's doing to our Australian kids, our future. It means that a five-year-old could end up waiting for a third of their life before the courts finally figure out whether they're going to stay with mum or dad. And you wonder why our kids are having psychological bloody issues out there. This isn't a problem that merging the courts will solve. It's happening because the government isn't giving the courts the funding they need to be able to get through the work that they have to do. It's happening because our judges are overworked. Family court judges are working well into the night, every night, to get through cases that often involve children who are at risk of abuse and violence. As hard as they work, they've got to churn through them like they're on a production line. And that is not the way our courts were set up to deal with things. We're asking judges to work like they're someone in a burger joint. Yeah, just chuck a bit more lettuce, double the cheese. Great, no worries. Rushing about to get your orders filled and out the door as fast as possible. How is that justice? How is that bringing any Australian justice, let alone Australian families? Sometimes judges in the Federal Circuit Court have to deal with 70 legal matters before 10 in the morning. That's 70 decisions they have to make before most people have even had brunch or their second cup of coffee. That's what we're dealing with. How can any judge give those cases the consideration and care that they deserve? I don't care how good they are at their job, they're human. They could be the best in the world and they wouldn't be able to get through all that properly. Nobody could. Unless you've got some sort of superpower, these judges have inherited that somehow, and I don't recall you giving them that, Attorney General. Every person who's behind a legal case like that has a story to tell. But the judges don't have time to hear them. Instead, they're in and out as quickly as possible. That's not how you give broken families justice. All you're doing is bring them more hurt and more misery. And I didn't, I didn't sign up to be a politician to do that. Obviously, the attorney did, though. Because the turn of the cases going through the courts means that the chambers end up feeling like a shopping centre. It's right up and down the escalators, no worries, in and out, get your purchases and back out the door. One lawyer spoke out and said that being in the Federal sort Kirk, sort Kirk, sort Circuit Court is like being in a zoo. We're sending Australian families into a zoo and expecting them to get a fair hearing. That's why we're asking the legal system to figure out how to look after vulnerable kids. We're asking them to look after our vulnerable kids and they can't even keep up with the cases. How much do we need to ask of them? Because I don't think there's much left. I don't think there's anything in reserve. They're overstacked. They're under-resourced. And this is not the way to fix it. Parents are supposed to get a fair hearing on whether they can get custody of their children. But instead they're running around the zoo waiting for the burger. That's what's going on here. The people who are copying it the most are the families who can least afford it. And that's getting further and further away from them and that's got to bring destruction. It's got to bring destruction to the nation. So the people losing out here are the good old Aussie family. Those ones that are already doing it tough, more than likely. The ones that don't have the money to fight these cases in courts. The, money, the people, the families that don't have the money to pay for lawyers' banquets. Tony knows that. My word, he does. He's got to know that. Because apparently he's the attorney. He's educated apparently well educated. So why doesn't he know that? He says people shouldn't have to fork out buckets of money to get before a judge. He's right. That there's a problem in itself. At least you've picked that up. But talking the talk ain't walking the walk, is it? Mm. You're not doing anything to fix it. You're actually making it worse which is really soul-destroying, to be honest with you. Hundreds of people are going through family law courses on their own, 
One study on the family and federal circuit courts counted nearly 250 hearings where at least one of the parties was self-represented, and that's a disaster in itself. That is an absolute disaster in itself. Those people not, may, might not be getting the legal advice they need, and many of them won't get the best chance of making their case properly to a judge. And it makes it harder for judges to get through their huge workload because those cases usually take longer to get through. Yes, top up of funding of legal assistance programs last year was welcome, but we've had successive cuts to legal aid funding for decades. A one off injection isn't going to cut it. It's not even close. You haven't even got to sharpening the knife, I can assure you. If the attorney was really committed to keeping costs down, he wouldn't be hocking up court fees for people in the federal court, sir, in the circuit court, like he's doing. I'm very worried that the recent increases in the fees for migration cases in that court, they're going to be paying five times what they were paying before. It's very possibly the thin, ed oh, thin edge of the wedge, and it's not very possibly, it is the thin edge of the wedge. It's coming. And if you think it's only just going to happen for those um, immigrants, I can assure you, it's coming. Will families be forced to pay five more times five will be forced to pay five times more than what they're already having to pay now? How many people will lose their chance to get before a court before because of those fee hikes? It's terribly worrying. How much more damage will be done to families? Justice shouldn't come more easily to people who have to pay for it. This merger won't fix our broken court system. The problems that we have don't come from a family court being inefficient. They don't come from confusion about where to lodge a case. They're much bigger than that. The issues are much bigger than that. They go much deeper than that. And to push complex family law matters through the federal circuit court is going to end up in absolute disaster. It is going to end up in misery. And it's going to take people's lives. And it's going to cost the economy a lot more. You spend, just, you spend and then it doesn't cost you more. Fix it in the first place and fix it properly because you'll save in the long run. Were you taught that growing up, attorney? Or was it all just out of a textbook for you? Get some life experience because you need it. The federal, courts, the federal Circuit Court is one of the busiest in the country, along with family matters that deals with things like migration cases, bankruptcy, intellectual property rights, workplace law and consumer issues and so on. We can't get family support and services they need if we're sending them into a zoo to get their cases heard. They can't do that if they're having to represent themselves to judges who are overworked and, and tired and don't have the time to hear their stories and their background. We're talking about some of the worst moments of these people's lives and their kids. And they deserve a lot better than that. It's so un-Australian in what is going on here today. Everybody should have a right to legal representation. Everybody. And fairness. That is what this country is about. You just stuck that knife in, didn't you, attorney, today? And you twisted. My goodness. Here you go, you most vulnerable families in Australia. Take that. Thanks for coming. These bills do not get to the heart of where the problem is, because to fix the problem, the government will need to put a lot more money in it, and they're not doing it, and they're not going to bring Thank it to you, it. Senator Lambie. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, when, uh, when Australian families break down, uh, this place and the system that we deliver for them uh, should be fair. Uh, it should provide families, mums and dads and kids with the love and support of a community that's going to provide them with the assistance to get the result that is in the best interest of them and, in particular, the best interests of Australian children. Uh, and I think what we've seen over the course of the development of this bill and its passage through the parliament and over the course of the last 12 months with this attorney just establishes that you can go to the best schools in the country. You can have the best education. You can be given the best opportunities uh, in life that any young person could expect, but it doesn't guarantee that you'll come to public life with any measure of empathy, any measure of a capacity for concern and to discharge your responsibilities as the attorney 
in the interests of families and, in particular, the interests of children. The abolition of the family court really says two things. Firstly, it is a catastrophe for Australian families and, in particular, in particular Australian children. But secondly, it will be an enduring symbol of everything that is wrong with this parliament and everything that is wrong with this government. Firstly, it shows us that we've got a government with no plan for the Australian people, no mobilising vision for itself, nowhere more clearly than this area of family law, a party that used to claim the dual mantle of progress and conservatism, but now it stands for nothing. The Prime Minister stands for nothing, but he's prepared to do anything, prepared to do anything in his narrow political interest or the government's narrow political interest. And we're seeing that unfold with this bill, and we're seeing that unfold over many, many issues, including some of the issues that the parliament's had to confront this week. Stands for nothing, prepared to do anything. It's dedicated to only one thing, continuing to occupy the Treasury benches. Dedicated to only one interest, its own narrow, venal political interest. The second thing that's wrong with this bill and this place and this government, and in particular this chamber, is the role that the One Nation Party is playing with the government's support to dismantle good protections for Australian families. See, the One Nation Party are hanging out with the black-shirted men's movement grievance brigade. That's what they support. And it's a sort of barely disguised misogyny and hostility to the interests of Australian children. It is no mystery that this backward nativist outfit supports the abolition of the family court. The real mystery is why on earth is the government supporting them? Why on earth? Why on earth would anybody with a shred of common sense or decency support this legislation? I noticed that Senator Boswell was in the chamber the other day. Well, I can't imagine the sense of disappointment that he must feel after being a leader of the National Party when, in this place when it took courage to stand up to One Nation and to try and provide a different political voice for his constituents and the constituents of the National Party and defeated the creeping backward nativist political voice, defeated them, only to have this government bring them back. The responsibility for this resurgent right-wing uh, nasty brigade is all on you. It's your preference strategies, your activity in this chamber, your legislative haggling that's brought it back and the consequences for Australian families and, in particular, Australian children are very serious indeed. We've got a weak, supine government that stands for nothing and is prepared to incorporate extremists into its electoral strategy. And I have to say and register my deep disappointment with the decision of Senator Patrick to support this legislation. It's elected by people who had lost faith, I suppose, in the major parties and wanted to provide a vote that registered a protest. But this is all about horse trading. It's all about entirely transactional politics. It's all about entirely secret deals with mealy mouthed justifications. So transactional that some on the crossbench have lost their way entirely, lost perspective entirely. Now, all taken together, a dysfunctional chamber 
and a government that has lost the capacity to govern in the interests of all Australians because it's so obsessed with itself. In this case, it's bad law, the abolition of the Family Court of Australia. In general, no plan for Australia. It's time for a new government that's actually prepared to be on the side of Australians, to be on the side of Australian families and Australian children. The Family Law Act in 1975 instituted two major changes. One, no-fault divorce, and two, it established the Family Court of Australia, a specialist multidisciplinary court for the resolution of family disputes that it was envisaged would support families through the process. The establishment of the Family Court and the Family Law Act did away with the brutal inquisitions, the dehumanising inquisitions that characterised proceedings under the Matrimonial Causes Act. These two reforms were and are inseparable. They come together, and it is not possible to separate them. It is clear that the agenda supported by the One Nation Party uh, is also to do away with the other. And I assume from the government's connivance with them over this legislation and the committee that led to this bill that there are people in the government who support it. Now, in November 1974, my predecessor in this place, Senator Lionel Murphy, the then Attorney General, made the case for change which has endured until now. He said the existing law and administration of divorce, custody and other family matters is too humiliating, too complex and too costly. These laws should be changed so that they may be characterised by dignity, simplicity and inexpensiveness. A broken down marriage should no longer be a prison which can be escaped from only by adultery, cruelty or the like. Prior to the Family Law Act, the Matrimonial Causes Act 1959 set out 14 grounds for the grant of a divorce, including adultery, desertion, habitual drunkenness, imprisonment and insanity. To get a divorce, one party had to prove that the other party was at fault. The provisions for divorce were costly, protracted and involved in dignity and humiliation to the parties because an inquiry into fault was the foundation for the dissolution of a marriage. It doesn't appear that the Morrison government is proposing to reinstitute fault-based divorce yet. That, I'm sure, will be the subject of another dirty deal with One Nation sometime in the future. But what it's proposing to do is to undo the second of the major changes introduced by the Family Law Act, the establishment of the court. It's a change being proposed in the absence of a shred of evidence to support it. And I heard Senator Lambie's account of the experience of Australian families uh, in the family court, and I agree with her that the answer to improving the experience of families in the family court is to provide them with more support to ensure that there are sufficient justices and sufficient staff to do their work. You know, I, I imagine that there are very few people who leave their experience in the family court of Australia happy. I'm sure that most people leave it with some sense of unhappiness and a sense of grievance. I'm sure that is true. That is no basis to abolish the court. That, that is not a reason for the kind of perverted reform that the government proposes here. The government claims that the proposed abolition has been informed by independent reviews and inquiries over a decade. No such thing 
has occurred. The Attorney General's Department's website lists five reports under the heading to evidence base for reforms. And the only problem with that claim is that none of those inquiries, none of those reports recommended these reforms. None of them. None of those reports even thought that this kind of reform was worthy of consideration. None of them. In Appendix 3 to the Interim Report of the Joint Select Committee into Family Law, what's called the Hanson Family Law Inquiry, that committee listed almost 70 reviews of the family law system that have been undertaken since 1974. Not one of those 70 reports or inquiries listed abolition of the family court as a sensible reform. The Attorney General and the Morrison government, of course, aren't interested in sensible reform. They're not interested in improving the lives of families and, in particular, supporting children and getting the best answers for children. The only possible explanation is a continued engagement and dalliance with the One Nation Party that is a grave political mistake. That is a long-term error of judgment from a group that have lost the capacity for good political judgment in the interests of Australian people. It's the One Nation Party that resents the existence of the family court. It's this government that selected Senator Hanson to co-chair the Joint Select Committee, along with the soon-to-be former member for Menzies. And that was a disgrace, and it has led us into this place. True to form, Senator Hanson hasn't provided a shred of evidence to support her statements. In a Facebook discussion with self-appointed men's rights activist Leith Erickson, along with Las Vegas stripper aficionado Mr Dixon, Senator Roberts accused, accused the, family support, the family court of being responsible for men's violence towards women. He said, I know you agree with me, Leith, on that, and you've counselled people against it. But when you're a father and you can't get access to your kids and you can't get access to the legal system properly, what else is there to do, he said, other than check out or hurt the other person? It's that kind of misogyny. It's that kind of thinking that would have been out of date at any point in the 20th century that mobilises your thinking, that mobilises the government's position of abolishing the family court. And it's that kind of approach from this government that's mobilised one of the worst pieces of legislation that I've seen come before this Senate, one of the most retrograde, regressive pieces of legislation that is taking this country backwards and is damaging the interests of Australian families and, most of all, Australian children. This should be sent back to where it belongs. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Three days ago, the president of the Law Society of Tasmania went to the media warning that the federal government's failure to appoint another judge to hear family court cases in Tasmania is leading to delays and angst for families. He said that one judge in Launceston was doing the work of two judges after a judge retired last year, last November. This means that Tasmania is left with one specialist judge tackling difficult issues, including family violence, child abuse and mental health. When the president of the Law Society made this comment, the Attorney-General Christian Porter refused to say if or when the appointment was likely. This scenario is playing out all around Australia and it's been playing out that way for many years now. The family law system in this country is in crisis. It is buckling under so much work that some judges are dealing with more than 600 cases, a glacial parade of desperate and troubled people. The court is being starved of resources, and in some federal circuit court and family court registries, it is taking, on average, 
12 months for court-appointed family consultants to produce family reports. A family report is a critical document that provides an independent assessment of issues in a case. Those reports help judges to make life-changing decisions about arrangements for children. If anything, the need for a specialist family court has only become more pronounced over time. As the Australian Law Reform Commission has noted in a report the government commissioned but then completely ignored, the Whitlam government, which established the court, could not have foreseen the growth in the incidents and awareness of family violence and child abuse since 1975. And yet, the Morrison government persists in refusing to own up to what they are seeking to do with this bill. They are seeking to abolish the family court as a specialist and standalone superior court. This would be a profoundly retrograde step. It would harm Australian families and, in particular, children at their time of greatest need. On this side of the chamber, we view the Family Law Act of 1975, which established the principle of no-fault divorce and established the Family Court of Australia as part of the proud Whitlam legacy. Like most of the great social reforms that have occurred in Australia, from Medicare to our world-leading superannuation system to free legal assistance services for Australians in need, the Family Court of Australia is an institution that has served our nation admirably. That distinguishing feature is specialisation. It's so important because family law matters are not like any other matters in generalist, that generalist courts tend to deal with. The parties to family law matters are not like the parties that generalist courts tend to deal with. They are often very, very vulnerable. Vulnerable children and families need family court system that is not only efficient but also safe and sensitive to their particular needs and vulnerabilities. The Whitlam government's vision of a specialist law court was of a court with interrelated co-located services and resources. It was about creating an environment that would have regard to Gough Whitlam described as the human problems of couples and families, not just their legal rights. This bill would rob the family court of that essential distinguishing feature by merging it into one of Australia's busiest, most poorly resourced and overloaded courts, the Federal Circuit Court. To be frank, that's just crazy, it's senseless, and it's also a friendless idea. But don't get me wrong, there are serious problems in the Federal Family Court at the present, but the main cause of those problems is no mystery. The Australian Law Reform Commission found the family law system, and I quote, has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. And it's getting worse. Over seven years of Liberal governments under Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull and now Mr Scott Morrison, right around the country, family court judges have not been replaced in a timely manner. In response to increasing demand, the court has been starved of fund and review after review, making considered and measured recommendations, has been ignored. And who is suffering in all this? Apart from dangerously overburdened court and support staff and judges, it's the families and it's children in crisis situation, children experiencing trauma, children who deserve the best service and support that we can provide for them in times of huge anxiety. This government's disgraceful level of neglect in letting these children down so badly should be a cause of national shame. And yet our Attorney-General, Mr Porter, persists defying logic, ignoring those in crisis and need, relentlessly refusing to appoint judges and provide adequate resources, and with no evidence that will improve the situation, pushing on with his agenda to collapse the court into the Federal Circuit Court in a way that will make a bad situation worse for Australian families, including vulnerable children. Just to can I just summarise the intent of this bill? It will combine the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court into one court with two divisions. That court would be called the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. 
Both divisions would operate under the leadership of a single Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Just Justice with a single set of rules and a single point of entry. The Appeals Division of the Family Court would not be replaced with anything. Instead, all Division I judges would be able to hear appeals either as a single judge or as part of a full court. A number of other consequential amendments will be made. When the government originally proposed this merger in the 45th parliament, the current Attorney-General said that he would stop appointing new judges to Division I as they retire. That would obviously amount to a gradual ab abolition of Division I, that is the Family Court of Australia, over time. The Attorney-General has now backed away from the position and promised to keep appointing judges to Division I. But there's nothing in this bill that would guarantee continued existence of Division I. The Attorney-General made his intentions for this merger very clear in the last parliament, and yet now the Attorney-General and this Attorney-General says, trust me. And all the while judges are retiring and new appointments are not being made to the family court, as we have so recently seen in Tasmania. And even if the bill were amended to guarantee the continued existence of Division I, that would not address the fundamental problem with this bill, which is that instead of increasing spe specialisation in the family law system, the Morrison government is going to water it down by effectively abolishing the family court. Some would argue that Mr Porter is trying to kill off our specialist family court by stealth, but he's made his intentions clear over two parliaments. And as I've said, his intention is friendless. In fact, it has an overwhelming number of highly credentialed and respected opponents. And this is just a list of some of them. There are no less than 110 stakeholders, ranging from the Law Council of Australia to women's legal services, community legal services, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, child protection advocates and disability services from Austro across Australia have written to the Attorney-General to ask him to abandon this proposal, and they have all been ignored. These opponents to the proposal have stated that it will harm vulnerable children and families in need of specialist law assistance, that it would increase rather than decrease the cost time and stress for families and children in the family law system, that it would place further stresses on federal circuit court judges who are struggling under unsafe, unsustainable and unconscionable workloads, and fail to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence survivors just simply falling through the cracks. The very first Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Elizabeth Evatt AC, has said that the proposed merger of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court will lead to undesirable outcomes for children and families. Ms Evatt has also warned that, and I quote, the increasing number of cases in which issues of family violence and child abuse are raised has led to an even greater need today for family law jurisdiction to be vested exclusively in specialised judges who can give their full attention to the needs of family law clients without being diverted to exercise other unrelated jurisdictions. The current bill undermines this principle, is not in the public interest and should not be enacted." End quote. The Hon. Alastair Nicholson, AORFDQC, the second Chief Justice of the Family Court, who served in that position between 1988 and 2004, has fully supported Ms Evatt's remarks. Mr Nicholson has also said that, and I quote, it is unbelievable that government would propose the dissolution of a federal, a federal superior court in this fashion without the most careful and searching public inquiry and without carrying out significant research and without consulting the many experts in this field. What those proposing this merger do not seem to understand is that family law is complex and nuanced, and it is not to be judged by the output of the number of cases as if the courts are sausage machines. Throughput is important, but so is the quality of the decisions made. And he went on to say, cases can be extremely complex and require specialist knowledge of the type that has always been available in the family court, 
which has provided leadership in the proper interpretation and principles to be applied by other courts with family law jurisdiction. Many involve the determination of important issues relating to children, including their rights and need for protection, not only from individuals but also from government in its myriad of forms. Many also involve problems of family violence and the effects of it upon the parties and their children. Others involve extremely complicated property disputes, either alone or combined with the above issues, and requiring other important specialist levels of legal knowledge, whilst understanding the important family issues that may be affected by this decision." Close quote. The President of the Law Council of Australia, Pauline Wright, has said that the proposed merger would, and I quote, result in the effective abolition of the Family Court of Australia, a respected, specialised and focused court dealing with family law issues. The 2019 merger bills, if passed, would also mean that Australian families and children will have to compete for the resourcing and hearing time with all federal matters. That is, other matters like migration bankruptcy and those sorts of things that the federal circuit courts and the federal courts deal with. There must be an increase, not a decrease, in specialisation in family law and violence issues. This is critical for the safety of children and victims of violence. The Law Council of Australia has also said that the proposed merger is a terrible gamble with the lives of children and families. Community Legal Centres Australia has said that moving away from a specialist family court model would be a retrograde step and expose survivors of family violence to unnecessary risk. Women's Legal Services Australia has said its opposition to the proposed merger is centred on ensuring the safety and the best interests of the child and the safety of adult victim survivors of family violence in family law proceedings. The National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services has said that the proposed merger will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families who need the most support. And the list of statements of opposition to this bill from those who know this system well, those who have daily experience of it, those who deserve our respect and should be listened to goes on and on and on. The absolute arrogance of this Attorney General, Mr Christian Porter, in dismissing these concerns is breathtaking. He's beyond listened and beyond reasoned, and he is being blindly followed by those opposite who should be seeking to question his reasoning and his blind determination to make this move. Australian families deserve better. Australian children deserve better. Those opposite intend to smugly stand by while the vision of this human-centred court, so profoundly important to our country, to Australian families, is desecrated and abandoned. As the experts have made clear, this merger proposal will do nothing to address delays in the family court system. There is nothing in this bill that will increase the number of judges, registrars and other court staff. There's nothing in this bill that will force the Attorney-General to do his job, even something as basic as appointing new judge as vacancies are created. And this bill will do nothing, absolutely nothing, to help Australian families. Senator O'Neill. Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise today to speak on the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019. This bill will seek to abolish the Independent Family Court of Australia. To abolish it. It's a proud legacy of the Whitlam government, and instead of honouring that legacy and properly investing in it, this government seeks to replace it with a Frankenstein amalgam of the Federal Circuit Court and a rump of a court dealing with family law matters. Reform is needed. A new approach to family law is needed. But this bill will only increase the problems currently experienced in the family law system. We need to improve efficiency in the family law system. We need to increase auxiliary services for families in need, caught up in uh, the need for the services of the family law system. And we need to ensure that specialist services are there for children and women fleeing violence. This bill 
follows a pattern, a clear pattern for this Liberal government and its two predecessors. For undermining a public institution, running that public institution into the ground, then clamouring for reform to fix the very mess that they themselves have made. The Whitlam government set up the Family Law Court as part of a suite of reforms, including no-fault divorce that revolutionised the family law system in Australia. When introducing the Family Law Bill to establish the courts, uh, Mr Whitlam remarked, and I quote, the essence of the family courts is that they will be helping courts. Judges will be specially and carefully selected for their suitability for the work of the court. There will be attached to the court a specialist staff, notably marriage counsellors and welfare officers, to assist the parties at any stage and even independently of any proceedings. Mr Whitlam went on to say the family court will, of course, determine legal rights, which it is bound to do as a court, but it will do much more than that. Here will be a court, the expressly stated purpose of which is to provide help, encouragement and counselling to parties with marital problems and to have regard to their human problems, not just their legal rights. What a visionary statement and what a practical, authentic response to the challenges that face us as human beings in our relationships with one another. There is none of that vision in what this government is advancing. This reform was passed to give better access to justice to women and children across Australia and to support a system that would work in a conciliatory manner to sensitively decide the personal matters of Australians. The auxiliary service that are services that are provided will be further cut and diluted by this bill and its proposed amalgamation. In 2019, the Australian Law Reform Commission completed a report on the family law system in Australia. They made their inquiry, and it was an extensive, highly uh, consulted one. And they made over 60 recommendations for reform. They noted that the family law system in Australia, and I quote, has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia, and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. That is a rounding condemnation of what this government and its withdrawal of resource capacity has done to the family law courts. The Australian Law Reform Commission did not make the recommendation to amalgamate the Federal Circuit Court, and the government did not even bother responding to that very important report. Sixty recommendations ignored by the government, and they come up with a recommendation that was not in that very august report. The government instead bases the major reform that they're proposing on nothing more than a six-week desktop review by two PricewaterhouseCoopers accountants. Even that doesn't endorse this drastic proposal. In a response to the Senate committee inquiry into the bill, PwC said they were told not to even consider detailed reform as part of their report. The Attorney General's website cites five reports as the basis for this reform, yet not even one, not a single one of the five reports that it claims it bases this legislation on considered, let alone recommended, the drastic change that the government is seeking to push forward with this bill today. Only one report recommended restructuring the family court, but in a way that would still leave a standalone specialist family law court. The interim report of the Joint Select Committee into Family Law, initiated by Senator Hanson, also noted that among the 70 reviews into the family law system in Australia since 1974, not one, 
Not one has recommended that family law courts be structured in the way that the government is now seeking to make happen. The bill even prejudges the work of Senator Hanson's committee, which is not due to report until next week. You'd think if the government actually valued the work of that committee, which has been travelling around Australia, hearing evidence advanced by Senator Hanson herself, if they valued the work, if the government authentically valued the work of that committee, they could have paused the biggest reform in the family law system in 40 years to hear the recommendations of her committee, to give some semblance of respect to the work of the senators who have been travelling around the country, to give some sense of hearing the testimony, which was in many cases traumatically delivered for witnesses. But instead, the government is advancing with this particular massive reform not recommended anywhere and ignoring the finalising of that very important report. It's profoundly disrespectful to Senator Hanson and the committee is not to wait that one week to hear the years of work that the committee has prepared. The question really is, anybody who's been involved with the family court will have an opinion on this, and, and I'm sure they, have, they won't land where the government's landed. Is there really any point, is there really any effectiveness in jamming two different court systems together? It's not going to decrease the lengthy process times. Do we think that removing specialist services like child issue report writers will lead to more truthful and more lasting resolutions to matters? Do we think, senators, that further disruption to the family court will decrease the escalating distrust and anguish that many in the system are currently feeling? Can we trust this Prime Minister on this issue? We all know he's much vaunted as a family man. He cares about his family. Well, that might be the case, but he doesn't seem to care about yours. This abysmal state of affairs is solely a result of the successive Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison governments gutting funding of all aspects of the family law system. Matters have ground to a halt. I've heard anecdotally that matters in Sydney will now take two and a half years to hear a matter fully. I come from a great state, but it's burdened with the trauma of these delays impacting family life, impacting children, impacting children's learning at school. If you're in Newcastle, it'll take 18 months, where a full report into abuse would take one month, so denuded of resources is this entire system, that it now takes four to five months to get a report. And this is despite divorce rates dropping nationwide to their lowest level since no-fault divorce was introduced. This is not an issue of the institution being broken. This is an institution of the resourcing being completely underdone. Family courts deal with matters of child welfare. They deal with sensitive matters of family breakdown. They need the appropriate resources to serve the needs of Australians. We've seen a degradation of public services across our country in the last seven and a half years by this government at a scale that is absolutely breathtaking. People pay their taxes to ensure that when they need them, public services are there and operating in an efficient way. How will reducing services, how will that help anguished mothers, fathers and children? How will cutting funding to the bone for child report writers help inform the courts on sensitive matters of child abuse and violence. The primary goal of the family law courts in Australia is to work in the interests of the child. Can anyone really kid themselves into believing that this bill, as constructed by the government, will be in the best interests of the children of Australia? This bill will only compound the government's neglect of the family law system. It will make 
a bad situation worse. The bill, if passed, will do the following things. It will combine the federal circuit court and family court into one court with two divisions, and that court will be called the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. The current Family Court of Australia would become Division I, while the current Federal Circuit Court of Australia would become Division II. Both divisions would operate under the leadership of a single Chief Justice and a Deputy Chief Justice with a single set of rules and a single point of entry. The Appeals Division of the Family Court would not be replaced with anything. Let me just say that again. The Appeals Division of the Family Court would not be replaced with anything. Instead, all Division I judges would be able to hear appeals either as a single judge or as part of a full court. And of course, there are a number of other consequential amendments that will be made. In the last parliament, the Attorney General refused to commit to replace Division I judges as they retire, amounting to a gradual abolition of the specialised family court. Due to public pressure, he is now committed to appointing judges to Division I, though there is nothing in this government's bill that would actually guarantee this. 110 stakeholders, among them Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders legal centres, community legal centres, women's legal centres, child protection advocates and disability service providers across Australia have formed a chorus of opposition to this bill. And I trust their voices. I trust their lived experience. I trust advocates for people who find themselves in a crisis in their family that engages them with the courts to have the, have the support of those community service agents who are walking the walk with them. Because this government, as much as it bleats about its care, is always missing when the work that has to be done, the hard work has to be done, they're missing in action. Those great advocates believe this reform proposed by the government will increase bills, time and stress for families in the system. The advocates I trust say that this bill will re remove specialist family law support services for vulnerable children and families, that it will increase the unsustainable workloads of circuit court judges who on average have 337 minute, uh, matters on their docks and ignore the major systemic issues of chronic underfunding and victims falling through the cracks. The family law system is a proud monument of the Australian legal system, and Christian Porter and Scott Morrison want to run a bulldozer through it. Once they have crushed this institution, it will be very difficult to put it back together in any way. The government bill is friendless, recommended by no independent report. It will devastate the most vulnerable in our community. It prejudges a years-long report into the family law system by a week and is rushed in at a point when the government clearly thinks it has the numbers in this place to push this incredible level of reform through. Like all Morrison government initiatives, this bill is a facade. It cloaks the hollowing out of a proud and vital public institution in the gilded glamour of reform. It speaks to the sheer arrogance of the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, who ignores the interests of vulnerable Australian families in order to chalk up at least one policy will win this week an otherwise barren agenda. This bill is a wrecking ball through our legal system, and I urge all senators to reject it. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, as has been made abundantly clear by uh, previous speakers of um, the Australian Greens, we will not be supporting this legislation. These bills cover an area where large numbers of Australian people are directly impacted by the decisions that we in this place make. And we have to get this right. And in this case, the government has not only not got it right, it's got it badly and tragically wrong. And the sad thing is that it's Australian families, Australian people, who are interacting with Australia's family law system who are going to pay the price for the terrible mistake that this Senate is about to make, thanks to Senator Patrick deciding 
to support this legislation and therefore give the government the numbers to pass it through this chamber. And those Australians who are going to pay the price for this terrible mistake are Australians who are already dealing with significant challenges in their lives. Challenges like the breakdowns of their relationships, challenges like decisions over custody of children subsequent to the breakdown of a relationship. Those things are difficult enough to deal with of themselves and they can be highly traumatising to people. But for those matters to be dealt with by people uh, in, the ref in a system that will be reformed in the way that this legislation seeks to reform our family law system will make it even harder for people who are interacting with that family law system. I might add uh, these so-called reforms follow a classic Liberal National Party strategy, where they firstly starve an institution of resources, and undoubtedly our family law system has been starved of resources um, through successive Liberal National governments in this country. And when uh, those, uh, those massively reduced resources start to bite on the effectiveness of, a legisl uh, of an institution, whether it be our family court system, uh, whether it be an institution like the ABC, when those uh, lack of resources start to bite, the government comes out and says, oh, see, we've got to do something because the, the organisation is not running properly. Well, earth to the LNP, it's not running properly because you deliberately starved it of resources. That's why it's not running properly. That's the major reason it's not running properly. Now, no one, I think, is going to get up and argue that our current family law system uh, and the courts that, uh, that are involved in, uh, in our family law system are running perfectly. Of course they're not. Anything that humans set up is going to run imperfectly, and the challenge uh, for people in our place uh, and people who work in those institutions is to try to continually improve them. And I'll talk a little bit uh, later in my contribution about how, um, how the Australian Greens believe that we could actually improve the way our family law system works. But uh, let me be abundantly clear about this. Um, the proposals that are currently before the Senate are not the way to make improvements and ultimately they will uh, make our family law system more difficult to interact with, they will make it more complicated and uh, they will mean that Australians who are interacting with our family law system will be significantly disadvantaged. Now, the Australian Greens approach this legislation with the principle that the strongest protection for children for families, um, for survivors of family and domestic violence, uh, is to maintain and strengthen a stand-alone specialist family law court involving a holistic specialist system of collaborative, culturally safe, timely co-located services and resources. And in general terms, that was the intention when the family court was created. Now, the Greens believe that significant changes to the family law system, uh, like the, one, the ones proposed in uh, these bills, should meet a basic test, and that is that they must strengthen the system, they must move it to being a person-focused system, they must ensure that it is a trauma-informed system, they must ensure that it is a collaborative system that it delivers outcomes in a timely way, that it is a holistic system and, very importantly, that it is a culturally safe system. Because there are people uh, in this country from a massive range of cultural backgrounds who interact with our, uh, with our family law system. And we have to make sure that uh, it is culturally safe and we need to make sure that it is appropriate for people 
from a range of cultures, whether they're from uh, our First Nations people, who remember have been here for uh, many, many tens of thousands of years before white people even arrived, or whether it's much more recent arrivals from cultures around the planet, many of whom are coming from places um, where uh, things like families and things like uh, family law systems are very um, differently conceived than they are in this place. So it has to be a culturally safe system that reflects the diversity of cultural background of everyone who interacts with it. Now, um, those tests that the Australian Greens propose are not met by these bills. They are not met by these bills. And it's not just the Australian Greens saying that these bills are undesirable. Uh, more than 110 stakeholders uh, and interested parties to the family law system agree that the merger proposed uh, in these bills is not the solution, and they oppose this legislation because it will put families at risk. And uh, it's important to say that a significant number of those stakeholders agree uh, that they prefer the Family Court 2.0 model proposed by the New South Wales Bar Association. Now, unlike the merger proposal that's currently before this chamber, the Family Court 2.0 model proposes a straightforward lift and shift of the Federal Circuit Court's family law jurisdiction and judges into a new lower division within the standalone specialist Family Court. Family Court judges would be in Division 1 of the Family Court of Australia. Federal Circuit Court judges who are hearing family law matters would move across to Division 2 of the Family Court of Australia. Now, interestingly, this model has been in place for many years uh, in the Attorney General's own state of Western Australia. This system was also recommended by the 2008 and eight Semple report and has been endorsed by stakeholders including the Law Council of Australia, Women's Legal Services Australia and former Chief Justice Elizabeth Evatt AC. Unlike the government's dangerous and fatally flawed merger proposal, the Family Court 2.0 model would have the significant advantage of promoting safety for children and adults by, pre by preserving access to services of a specialist family court. An increase in specialisation in family law and family violence will increase the safety of children and, uh, and uh, adult victims and survivors of family violence. This is particularly the case for groups that are disproportionately impacted in the family law and family violence systems, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people the need for increased and culturally safe specialisation of courts to improve decisions and outcomes for families is supported by the evidence of the multiple inquiries there has been over a number of years into the family law system. And the proposal uh, by the New South Wales Bar Association, the Family Court 2.0 model, would actually produce what Australians have consistently said they want from their family law system, a single specialist family court to address the needs of the country's families within an integrated system of collaborative, culturally safe and responsive and timely support services. So we absolutely do not support this legislation being passed and we're extremely disappointed that Senator Patrick has caved on this issue and that uh, the government uh, has moved with indecent haste to bring these bills on uh, once it believed it had the numbers in this place, even to the extent that uh, the inquiry they stitched up with uh, One Nation uh, into Australia's family uh, law system hasn't even reported yet. But let's make no mistake, um, that inquiry was stitched up between the LNP and One Nation as an exercise um, by the LNP in stakeholder relationship with One Nation, and now they're burning One Nation and all the work that has been done in that inquiry by moving preemptively before that inquiry has had the capacity and the time to report. So we're not going to support 
uh, this legislation. We believe the government should withdraw it and we believe the government should move forward uh, in a consultative and collaborative way around the development of an alternative like the Family uh, Court 2.0 system that is actually um, supported and preferred by almost all stakeholders in this area. Now, I mentioned um, the, uh, the starving of funding that this government uh, has engaged in over many years in regards to our family law system. And uh, something else that the Australian Greens are calling on the government to do is to properly fund the system. I mean, the delays that we all know about in the family law system, because we've had submission after submission after submission about those delays, they are just unconscionable. They are unconscionable. To say to Australians in some circumstances, you have to wait for two or three years before your matter can be addressed through the family law system. Well, you know, we are dealing with real people who are living real lives. They have real families, they have real children, they have real challenges in their lives. And it is incredibly traumatic to go through a relationship breakdown or a family breakup, losing access to your child. These things are, are traumatising of themselves. People don't need another layer of trauma put onto their shoulders in the form of having to wait for years before the family law system can actually address their issue. So the government needs to commit at least another $310 million a year in funding for legal assistance providers, as identified by the Law Council, to make up for the shortfall of successive cuts that have been faced by a range of organisations uh, inside our family law system and organisations like uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, community legal centres, uh, women's legal services, legal aid commissions who actually support people who are engaged with our family law system. Uh, we also need to make sure that substantial funding increases are made available to the social and support services that families and survivors of family and domestic violence require. So, the government needs to um, far better resource the community legal sector. And I'll make the point that, again, the government has slashed funding to the community legal sector over a number of years in this place. And, uh, and the government needs to properly resource our family law system. The Australian Greens hold dear the principle of access to justice. And your, your capacity to access our justice system, whether it be the criminal justice system, the civil justice system, our family law system, your capacity to access our justice system should not be determined by the thickness of your wallet or the size of your bank balance. It shouldn't be determined by those things. But tragically, too often, it is determined by those things. So these bills are a terrible, terrible mistake. And it is Australians who are interacting with the family law system who, uh, in almost all cases, are already traumatised by events that they've been through, who are going to pay the price for this government's terrible mistake. I urge the government to reconsider. I urge the government to listen to the stakeholders who work in this system every day. I urge the government to think rationally about the impact that these bills will have on ordinary Australians going about their day-to-day -day lives with the significant challenges that they are facing. Withdraw this legislation and let's work collaboratively to come up with a better approach. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I'd like to start with a tale of two family law reforms. The first reform promised by the government in their first women's economic security statement. I'll remind you that that was back in 2018 and it's a relatively simple proposal and it would make dividing super assets easier and fairer. It's supported by lawyers, by academics, by women's groups. And the government promised back in 2018 that it would have this reform up and running by July 2020, last year. And where do you think that reform's up to? Nowhere. 
It hasn't been debated in this parliament. Eight months after that system was due to have commenced, the government hasn't even drafted legislation for consultation. And why? Well, when we asked about it in Senate estimates, we were told by officials that this was not a priority for the government. Well, let's go to the second reform. Well, that's a proposal, the one before us, to abolish the Specialist Family Law Court, and it's contained in this bill. And it's a reform that is opposed by lawyers, opposed by judges, by experts and by the users of the family law system. It has been recommended by precisely no inquiries and no policy process. And the government seems willing to commit endless resources to make this happen. We should remember this the next time, the next time the government tells us that something is too hard. Because in this case, the government seems willing to punch through community opposition, through policy advice, through the objections of experts, to say nothing to the cost and disruption caused by a change like the one they're proposing. Because nothing is quite as powerful as this government just deciding that it wants to do something. Why is the government so committed to abolishing a specialist family law court? Well, I suspect, at least in part, it is because the family law system is one of Prime Minister Whitlam's great legacies. The family law reforms undertaken by the Whitlam government improved the lives of millions of Australians. The introduction of no-fault divorce freed men and women who had otherwise been trapped in marriages that were unhappy or worse. And the creation of a specialist family law court was an essential part of this vision. It promised the delivery of a type of justice in a different type of court to that which had been previously available. And speaking about the bill, back in November of 74, Prime Minister Whitlam told the other place. The essence of the family courts is that they will be helping courts. Judges will be specially and carefully selected for their suitability for the work of the court. There will be attached to the court a specialist staff, notably marriage counsellors and welfare officers, to assist the parties at any stage. These courts will therefore be very different from the courts that presently exercise the family law jurisdiction. The family law court will, of course, determine legal rights, which it is bound to do as a court, but it will do more than that. Here will be a court, the expressly stated purpose of which is to provide help, encouragement and counselling to parties, not just uh, with marital problems, but to have regard to human problems. Parties will not be driven to the court by their own despair as a last resort. They will be encouraged to come to the welfare and counselling staff of the court whenever they have a matrimonial problem, even if they are not contemplating proceedings of this kind. This help would also be available after divorce proceedings, and this would as I have already indicated, be of great importance where there were young children. There is no denying that more needs to be done to make the Family Law Court live up to that vision. Too many, when, too many men, women and children have been left feeling let down by a system that is increasingly difficult and expensive to navigate. But the answer is not to abolish the Specialist Family Law Court and fold it into one of the most busy and overworked courts, the Federal Circuit Court. At the start of this year, there is one Federal Circuit Court with over 600 cases on its docket. There are more than 25 judges across the country with more than 400 cases each. We know that men and women across the country are hurt by lengthy delays in contested family law court hearings, and delays hurt children most of all. The Australian Law Reform Commission referred to a number of concerns associated with the present delays in the family law system, including the potential for children and parents to spend long periods living in limbo while waiting for trial, the safety risks to parties and children arising from delayed res resolution of disputes that involve protective concerns, including contributing to homeless, homelessness, the scope for delay and uncertainty to exacerbate conflict, and the potential for clients to consent to outcomes that fall short of the security and protection a court, could a court order could provide. But the answer to these shortcomings isn't to have matters like this jostling for space 
alongside hundreds of migration and other matters on the docket of already overworked federal court circuit court judges. And as experts have made clear, this merger will do nothing to address delays. In fact, the evidence from the experts, which the government should listen to, is that this merger proposal will increase cost and time and stress for families and for children. We know that the first step to a better functioning family law system is to invest in it. As the Australian Law Reform Commission found, the family law system has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. A specialist family law court is important because family law matters are very different, and the parties to family law matters are not like the parties that generalist courts tend to deal with. They are far less legally sophisticated than commercial parties. This will often be the first time that either party has been in a courtroom. These people are more vulnerable and are in the midst of the most stressful and emotionally difficult period of their lives. And abolishing the specialisation of the family law court is not the right response to this challenge. The President of the Law Council said this, this is a terrible gamble with the lives of children and families. Community Legal Centres Australia has said moving away from a specialist family court model would be a retrograde step and expose survivors of family violence to unnecessary risk. Women's Legal Services Australia has opposed the merger on the basis of ensuring the safety and best interests of the child and the safety of adult victim survivors of family violence in family law proceedings. And Natsal have said that the merger will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families who need the most support. And I can tell you that last week, when I was in the Northern Rivers, the family workers who are working with children and women subjected to violence are horrified that this appears to be the law reform priority that is highest in precedence for this government. The government has tried to defend this bill by saying that it will reduce, uh, that it will reduce uh, delays and backlogs in these two courts by creating a single point of entry for family law matters, by developing common rules of court, by enhancing judicial appointment criteria and by streamlining appeals. All of these, all of these are worthy aims. Not one of them require this bill to be implemented. The Chief Justice of the Family Court told a Senate committee last year that all of this could be achieved without legislative change and certainly without abolishing the Specialist Family Court. In fact, if the government was looking for ways to improve the experience of families, they could do a lot worse than look at the recommendations of the 2019 Australian Law Reform Commission report that has been sitting forlorn, unloved, unattended to on the Attorney General's desk for years, sitting there while it pursued Senator Hanson's inquiry, another misplaced priority. And the family court itself hasn't been sitting still. It's initiated a project to allow early determination of family violence matters. It initiated a COVID list that has allowed matters to be held virtually and has helped improve accessibility for users. And there's another thing the government should do. At the start of my remarks, I mentioned a super-splitting proposal that the government promised would be in place by July last year, but hasn't been progressed because it's not a priority for them right now. Well, failures like this have consequences, and I'll explain. There is a separate program. It's designed to divert people away from lengthy and costly divorce hearings, and instead parties may go to mediation or a more amicable settlement can be reached more quickly and more cheaply. Separation is never easy, but this makes it quicker and cheaper to divide assets and reach a compromise both parties can live with. But there's a problem. It turns out that proceeding with mediation around property settlements requires both parties to trust that all of the information that they need to fairly divide property at mediation is on the table. And that requires the super reform that the government has been sitting on, which would allow the ATO to provide that information directly into that process. 
And the government's failure to deliver on its promise, its promise that it made back in 2019 to have this super reform in place by July last year, is stopping families from being able to mediate their family law disputes. The Women's Legal Service has written to the Attorney General about this. They have briefed the Minister for Women. But here we are, years later, and there is no action. This was a concrete plan. It was developed on the basis of evidence. It was supported by experts and family advocates. It would make family law proceedings fairer and easier for men and for women. And there is no progress on this at all by the government and no sign, no indication of when it will be progressed. The minister has said as soon as practicable or some other such diversion. But as the minister and her officials told us at estimates last year, I guess it is just not a priority for the government. Uh, thank you, Senator McAllister. I think we are now going to Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Deputy President. Well, this bill is an abuse. It's an abuse of the government's reckless agenda. An agenda that seeks to overturn almost 50 years of specialised legal practices wrapped up in a fake notion of reform. Ignoring the experts, ignoring the voices of everyday Australians, this government must own up to what they are really seeking to do here, abolishing the family court, a proud and lasting legacy of the Whitlam government. When it put it to the floor back in 1974, the family law bill lasted 28 sitting hours spread over six days. It was important. There were disagreements, there were debate, and lasting momentous change was made. The family law court is a Labor legacy, an Australian legacy, a parliamentary legacy, and one that I'm very proud of and one that Labor is proud to defend in this chamber. The Australian Family Law Court is a single, standalone court, one with real knowledge, real expertise, real understanding of the delicacies and importance of matters before it. Family law is not like every other aspect of law. It's emotionally charged. Judgments have real, deep repercussions. There is no doubt that in the area that there does require reform. And instead of a scalpel, of course, the government's using a sledgehammer. This 500-page long bill is the most significant change to the family court since it was established almost 50 years ago. As my colleague Senator Lambie rightly pointed out in this chamber moments ago, this bill has gone from a lawyer's picnic to a lawyer's banquet. Like most of the legislation this government puts to the Senate, it is a bill not reliant on research, not reliant on the advice of experts, not reliant on the voices of everyday Australians. It is a bill based on a six-week desktop review conducted by a pair of accountants from PwC and a host of other consulting firms. And what will this bill do? It will effectively abolish the family court by merging it into the federal circuit court, a single court with two divisions. It would abolish the appeals division of the family court, so instead of a scalpel, there is a sledgehammer. And as I've said, there is no doubt that the family law is in need of reform. As the Australian Law Reform Commission noted only two years ago, in a report to the family law system. No one could have seen the growth in incidents and awareness of family violence or child abuse. None of us here. But these twin plagues are the, on the fabric of Australian society. Without a court that can specialise in these incidents, that can see them day in and day out, a court that contains the interrelated, co-located services and resources that families in distress are desperately in need of, dealing with not, not just the legal issues but the human issues, 
providing the care and support that families in distress need. Whitlam envisaged the family court in this way, a court that dealt with people not as legal matters but as human beings. The realisation of Whitlam's vision has never been more important. The vulnerable children and families of Australia need a court that is not only efficient but safe and sensitive to their needs, to their vulnerabilities. And of course, what did the Australian Law Reform Commission find in its report? They found that the family law system has been deprived of resources to, and I quote, has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia, and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. Those damning words are a product of years of neglect. Neglect under Tony Abbott, there was neglect. Under Malcolm Turnbull, there was neglect. Under Scott Morrison, there's further neglect and failure to act appropriately. Eight years of liberal neglect. Of course, this is outright vandalism to the court judges in both the family and federal circuit courts who have not been replaced in a timely manner. Funding has been frozen despite review after review, highlighting the increasing demand for the family court services. And in a classic move by the Liberal Party, they pick a service they want to undermine. They want to underfund. They ignore calls to support it. They let it wither on the vine, overwhelmed by demand and under-resourced. And the response is always the same. A reckless attack dressed up as reform. This government is ploughing ahead with a sledgehammer to this court to its purpose and to its role. This bill will make a number of changes to the courts. It will combine the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court into one court with two divisions. The current Family Court of Australia would become Division I, while the current Federal Circuit Court of Australia would become Division II. Both divisions would operate under the leadership of a single Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Justice with a single set of rules and a single point of entry. The appeals division of the family court will be abolished and replaced with nothing. Instead, all Division I judges will be able to hear appeals either as a single judge or as part of a full court. When this new structure was first proposed in the 45th Parliament, the current Attorney-General said it would stop appointing new judges to Division I as they retire. This would effectively lead to the abolition of the division, the division of the Family Law Court of Australia, slowly but surely under this government. He may be trying to back away from this now, but we know his tactics. We know he'll pursue his ideological pursuit relentlessly, ongoing. This is just a tactical step back whilst he continues to pursue those, that position regarding not replacing experienced, knowledgeable judges, people that have the expertise and the capacity to deal with what is for often, for many people, human drama and human pressure in their lives. And of course, as I say, this ideological pursuit will be pursued relentlessly. And some might ask why this government is so hell-bent on this proposal. They must have some great evidence up their sleeve to proceeding with the abolition of an institution of the family court. And as my colleague Senator Ayres highlighted earlier, the Morrison government has claimed this proposed merger is informed by independent reviews and inquiries lasting over a decade. The website lists five reports under the heading The Evidence Base for the Reforms. Yet not a single one of the reports listed on the Attorney-General's website recommend this bill. None of them. Not even one of them. None of these reports even consider anything as radical as what is contained in this 500-page bill. Is this how legislation is conducted in this country, in such important, 
areas that affect so many across our community and so many into the future. You know, it's even courts relied on a hollow fake report, They're just outright citing evidence has nothing to do with the bill. In the interim report, published by the Joint Select Committee into Family Law, 70 reviews of the family law system have been undertaken since the court was established. Not a single one of these reviews calls for anything like what the Attorney General is proposing. Not a single one. This is a bit like the science of climate change. Despite all the evidence saying one thing, this government is focusing on minuscule pieces of evidence to confirm their predetermined view, a prejudged view that doesn't have relationship to the evidence as provided by so many experts. They're resting their entire 500-page bill on a six-week review of data by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Well, you get what you pay for, don't you? A desktop review conducted in the space of little more than a month. Isn't that pathetic? On a matter that is so important to so many of us in this country. One six-week six desktop review again against 70 comprehensive reviews, none of which recommend this bill. Well, maybe the government has consulted on this bill. The Senators present, present be surprised to hear there have not been any meaningful consultation, of course, in relation to what would be the most significant change to the Family Law Court in its history. There was no consultation with legal professionals, with family specialists, or with counsellors or children's psychologists. It's just simply outrageous to hear there was not consultation with a single judge who sits on the family court. The arrogance, the absolute arrogance of the Attorney General and this government to believe they know so much better than people have dedicated their lives and careers to making the family court work. Since the government chose to ignore the charges of the court, like many of my fellow senators, let me quote a few of the things these judges have said about the government's proposal. The experts, the people who have been there, who have been dealing with these matters for such a long period of time. People like the very first Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Elizabeth Evatt, AC, who has criticised the proposed merger. Now she warns us, and I quote, merging the family court into a generalised court will undermine the integrity and the structural specialisation of the family court. The impact of losing this institutional specialisation is not properly understood and has been downplayed. The increasing number of cases in which issues of family violence and child abuse are raised has led to an even greater need today for family law jurisdiction to be vested exclusively in specialised judges. I repeat, exclusively in specialised judges who can give their full attention to the needs of the family law clients without being diverted to exercise other unrelated jurisdictions. She goes on to say, the current bill undermines this principle. It's not in the public interest and should not be enacted. Then there is the Honourable Alastair Nicholson, the second Chief Justice of the Family Court from 1988 to 2004. Now, what did he have to say? And I quote, what those proposing this merger do not seem to understand is that family law is complex and nuanced. It is not to be judged by the output by numbers of cases, as if the courts are sausage machines. Throughput is important, but so is the quality of the decisions made. Cases can be extremely complex and require specialist knowledge 
of the type that has always been available in the family court, which has proved leadership and the proper interpretation and principles to be applied by other courts with family law jurisdictions. You know, I think it's just so telling. And the judge said, you know, this should not, the output should not be simply a number of cases, as if this court is a sausage machine. The president of the Law Council of Australia, Pauline Wright, has said that the proposed merger would result in the effective abolition of the Family Court of Australia, a respected, specialised and focused court dealing with family law issues. The 2019 merger bill, if passed, would also mean that Australian families and children will have to compete for the resourcing and hearing time with all federal matters. That is, other matters like migration, bankruptcy and those sorts of things that the federal circuit courts and the federal courts deal with. There must be an increase, not a decrease, in specialisation in family law and violence issues. This is critical for the safety of children and the victims of family violence. The National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service. So those that oppose Thank the bill. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Your time has expired. Let's give you a moment to get to the lectern, Senator Green. Senator Green. Thank you. Madam Deputy President, courts are daunting places and there's a secret code when you go there that no one tells you about. Um, there's specialised rules uh, that even some of the lawyers have a hard time figuring out. They're adversarial places and they're incredibly difficult to navigate if you're going through a family breakdown or, worse, going through a family breakdown that involves family violence. I, um, I know lawyers get a bit of a bad rap, particularly in this place, but I decided to go back to university when I was a bit older and study law. And my motivation for doing that was because I'd spent a week with a friend in the court system throughout the time of a hearing. And it occurred to me that this system had not been built um, by women or for women uh, experiencing um, sexual and family violence. Uh, and that to understand and to change the systems, we needed to um, uh, get more involved in that conversation. And there have been steps taken by state governments and federal governments over time to build specialised courts including the family court, to deal with the very difficult experience that families have when they go through a breakdown and family violence is involved. But this bill, this bill is a backward step because it abolishes the Family Law Court of Australia. And it means that we will no longer have a specialist standalone family court. In other parts of the country, in Queensland, I know that we're actually creating more specialised domestic violence uh, courts. But this government wants to go in the other direction. They say um, right now that there are two separate Courts. There's a specialist family court of Australia and the non-specialist federal circuit court. And they both hear family law matters. And the government claims that this merger will help reduce delays and backlogs in these two courts by creating a single point of entry for family law matters. The creation of a single point of entry, though, and the development of common rules, of forms, practices and procedures you know, making these courts easier to navigate for women and for family members that come to them. All of those things are being done and can be done without legislative change. You do not have to take my word for it. The Chief Justice of the Family Court told the Senate Committee last year that all of those changes can be achieved without legislative amendment. So what is this really about? 
Why is this government pushing ahead with a merger which abolishes the Family Court of Australia? Well, you can understand that Labor is very defensive of the Family Court and of all of the reforms that were introduced in 1975 that made the lives of families, particularly women, better. The Family Court was established as the dedicated legal forum for resolution of family law matters through the Family Law Act of 1975, a proud Whitlam government legacy. It was formed to provide a less adversarial forum for the resolution of cases concerning family law. It was structured to foster an informal, supportive atmosphere with proceedings based on the notion that family law matters should be perceived as matters of interpersonal relationships rather than morality. The Family Court's resolutions were to be informed with input from the social science experts, social workers, in-house counselling and uh, where services were structured into the court. These features were designed to move administration of family law away from a model which primarily sought to assign blame in interpersonal relationships. The Family Court continues to function as a specialised court right now, but this government wants to get rid of it. In passing the Family Law Court of 19 Act of 1975, the Whitlam government ushered in a major change to divorce law as well. Before the passage of this legislation, a marriage could only be dissolved in one if one party could prove that the other was at fault in the marriage breakdown. Matrimonial offences such as adultery, cruelty or desertion had to be proven before divorce could even be allowed. These things, according to Whitlam, were symptoms rather than causes of marriage breakdown. In introducing no-fault divorce, Whitlam argued that the process also reduced the chance of the parties having any sort of workable relationship after the divorce, and that this was against the interests of a children that the couple might have. It was the first instance where the interests of the children were being considered as the primary reason, purpose for the family law system. There was a vocal opposition to this reform at the time. Some argued that it would increase marriage breakdown and relationship instability, while others argued that it would encourage promiscuity and destroy the institution of marriage. Haven't we heard that before? The law abolished the requirement to, for blame to be assigned and in doing so made sure that many women in violent relationships would be able to leave. The family law system is in crisis right now, but this bill will not fix it. It will not fix it. In Cairns and Townsville, the North Queensland Women's Legal Service provides an amazing service to women living in regional Queensland, and I meet with them regularly. And the first time I met with them, I thought there would be a range of issues that they wanted to discuss. But the number one thing that Kate and her team, her hard-working team, wanted to talk to me about was this government's proposed merger of the federal court system, because they feared that it would mean more delays, more increased costs and less justice for women in the family law system. In some federal circuit courts and family court registries, it is taking, on average, 12 months for court-appointed family consultants to produce family reports. We know the delays are there. A family report is an absolutely critical document that provides an independent assessment of issues in a case. And those reports help judges to make life-changing decisions about arrangements for children. The average waiting times for the production of family reports in Cairns are up to three months, and in Townsville they're also up to three months. The Law Reform Commission spoke specifically about the importance of family consultants and the need to ensure that family reports were produced 
as quickly as possible. It is essential for all those involved in family law proceedings, but particularly for children, that family reports are thorough and prepared as quickly as possible so as to avoid delay with any attempts at settlement or ultimate adjudication of the matter. These family reports are essential, but the delays in producing them is impacting heavily on families and children across the country, and it's completely unacceptable. But this bill won't fix those delays. Resourcing, resourcing will fix those delays. But this government is not in the practice of producing the resources that the family law system needs. What they're doing in producing this merger bill is actually creating more work for less judges. There has been no evidence yet to support these changes. And instead, the overwhelming evidence of stakeholders who work in this system day in, day out, slog it out in this system day in, day out. It is hard work. And when they came to this government and they gave their advice, their first-hand experience on this matter, they said that this is not the way to go. And actually, what is required is for the family court system to be specialised even further. Now, some of the other uh, speakers um, have spoken today, um, some particularly Labor senators have spoken to today about the essentially sham consultation process that this government underwent to uh, justify this change. But what we know is that no less than 110 stakeholders, ranging from the Law Council of Australia to Women's Legal Services, community legal centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, children protection advocates and disability services from across Australia have written to the Attorney General to ask him to abandon this proposal, but they have been ignored. Some of the most vulnerable people in our society and the people that act for them every day have just been completely and utterly ignored by this government. Those letters and these pleas made clear that this change will harm vulnerable children, increase rather than decrease costs. They will place further stress on the Federal Circuit Court and they will fail to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence survivors falling through the cracks. So you really have to wonder, what is the motivation of this government to bring in legislation like this and to undo the years of progress. Well, it occurred to me that this has been one of Senator Hanson's pursuits and the One Nation Party's pursuits for some time, and it is well known. And because it is central to One Nation's pursuits, it is now central to this government. This government needs to own the platform that they have given One Nation Senator to, to devalue the family court. And I just want to read from the speech that Senator Hanson gave on this matter, because these are the comments that this government must own. She said, characterising the family court system, she described it as feminists who relish the toxic anti-men rhetoric, jaded partners who will stop at nothing to use their separation and the court system to crush their rivals, including unfounded claims of domestic violence. Really? That's what this government is supporting? And she goes on to say, how many people in this chamber have actually experienced domestic violence? Those are questions that need to be asked. People feel pain and anger. There are suicides, murders, the murders of children. Well, can I make it clear to this government and to Senator Hanson, because Labor will always stand up on this side of the chamber against comments like these, 
The family court system is in crisis because of these people, this government. But there is never, ever an excuse for family violence. Nobody is pushed, pushed to commit family violence by the delays in the system that this government has created. It is not a justification. And this govern government and these ministers must own these comments. Twelve months on from the murder of Hannah Clark and her children in Queensland, this government, this government is taking our family law system backwards. The Queensland government today announced changes to introduce coercive control as a crime in Queensland. But this government is teaming up with One Nation with those horrible comments and taking us backwards. Well, Senator Hanson, I have experienced domestic violence. My family has experienced domestic violence. And I stand with every victim of family violence today to call out this government's nasty processes, that they will put politics before people that they will do deals with crossbenchers to get this legislation through this week, instead of waiting and listening to the people that it actually impacts. That's what this government stands for. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, and it's a pleasure to follow on from Senator Green uh, and echo uh, her sentiments around domestic violence in particular, um, which I know had an impact on this chamber, particularly in her first speech, and something that um, she continues to advocate about. And it is something that is important that all of us in this chamber advocate about when we have the opportunity. Because the reality of what we're dealing with today when it comes to the family court is we are dealing with people at their most vulnerable. Uh, we are dealing with people uh, who are going through this when they are actually confronting it with the people they care about the most. And you would think that, given that scenario uh, that families are confronting, that the government would be providing the evidence to actually back up these changes, given what those families out there in Australia are confronting uh, going through the family court process. Uh, I feel for any families that are caught up in this system. Uh, I'm sure we've all had through our offices uh, some of those uh, terrible tales about how long these things have dragged on, uh, how the terrible impact it's had on families, uh, the impact it's had on children, obviously the human emotion that goes into this as well. But it's quite remarkable that the government have pursued these changes now, and let's face it, they've pursued these changes over the course of many years because they've had their agenda that they wanted to see. But they actually have not provided any evidence that this is actually going to make things better for those families, that it's actually going to speed up the process so that families can get a resolution quicker. It's not going to make what can be an expensive process cheaper either. And all of the Experts, the legal experts that deal in this system have condemned the changes. They said they're not going to make a difference. All of those support groups that are out there that provide support to families going through the family court process have criticised the changes to say that it isn't actually going to make uh, things better. And the government have not even bothered to try and actually justify it. Uh, we know they set up the select committee with Senator Hanson, who's been pursuing this, as Senator Green says, for a number of years now. They're not even waiting for the final report to pursue these. Um, they feel as though they've got the numbers and they uh, just want to plough on through and do it without providing any evidence that it is going to improve. So it's remarkable that the government solution to a crisis of their own making, they've actually made the family court system worse. They've deliberately run it down. Uh, and this is actually the way that they're treating people at their most vulnerable. Uh, at the end of the day, this is typical of an arrogant government, an arrogant prime minister, 
and an extremely arrogant Attorney-General who has been pursuing this for years uh, without actually providing uh, you know, there is zero evidence, absolutely zero evidence, that these changes are going to prove the system. The Attorney General and the government have had their pursuits that they wanted to see through, and that is actually what they have gone about. They feel as though they've got the numbers in the Senate, so they are going to try and get it done this week. So there is a problem in the family court system. But these reforms are actually going to make it worse. Uh, what we know is that there have been almost 70 reviews of the family law system that have been undertaken since 1974. Uh, many of my colleagues have talked about the history and the proud Labor history of the family court system. And never has one suggested of those 74 reviews that the family courts be structured in the way that the government is proposing. Yet the government is going ahead with changes they should be honest about their plan, which is seeking to abolish the family court as a specialist and standalone court. Labor is proud of its record of establishing the Family Law Act in 1975, which instituted two major changes. It instituted no-fault divorce and it established the Family Court of Australia, a specialist multidisciplinary court for the arbitration of family disputes. This was one of the many proud Whitlam legacies, like Medicare, and our world-leading superannuation system to free legal assistance for Australians in need. The Australian Law Reform Commission also conducted a review into the family court system prior to the Joint Standing Committee's inquiry into family law. The Australian Law Reform Commission said that the family law system has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia, and to whose family law system other countries once looked to, once looked and tried to emulate. There is a chronic lack of funding for the appointment and proper training of judicial resources, including judges, judicial registers, none of whom are currently employed within the courts and registers. Court-based social service professionals, including family consultants and Indigenous liaison officers, and legal aid services, including independent children's lawyers. As a consequence, children and families are deprived of sufficient time and attention being given to their matter at all stages of the process. So that is from the Australian Law Reform Commission. Over the last seven years, the story of the Australian family law system has been a story of neglect by the Liberal government. Neglect by Prime Minister Tony Abbott, neglect by the Liberal government under Malcolm Turnbull, and neglect by the current Liberal National Government with Prime Minister Scott Morrison. In my own state, the Queensland Law Society have said the changes and the ongoing neglect of the government uh, and the QL uh, Queensland Law Society president, uh, Ken Taylor, spoke on behalf of the society's 13,000 solicitors. And he said he was concerned that a lack of expertise in family law could result in erroneous decisions and poorer outcomes for families. It is a significant risk that the quality and proprietary of family law decisions will be compromised where determinations are made by judicial officers without family law experience. That's from Ken Taylor, the Queensland Law Society president. The chair of the Queensland Law Society Domestic and Family Violence Committee, Deborah Awiz, said, in our view, the society does not agree with the structural changes will provide efficiencies or reduce delay, or that these changes will reduce complexity or legal costs in the family law system, she said. The society has long warned that Australia's family law courts were in crisis, calling for further resources to the courts to avoid lengthy delays for trial dates and judgments. So exactly the point that we've been making consistently uh, and in these speeches, that the changes that are proposed, the evidence from the experts and those that deal with the system, is that it isn't going to speed up the process and it isn't going to reduce costs for those families involved. The Law Society, uh, Mr Taylor, the president, also went on to say, we cannot expect our judges to perform miracles. They require adequate resourcing. The solution is not this merger of the courts. It's ensuring that the correct level of experience and specialisation is paired with an adequate number of judges. So that again is from Mr Taylor, the Queensland Law Society president. An open letter that was sent to the Attorney General opposing the merger of the family court, co-signed by 157 prominent groups within the legal profession, have said, 
Stakeholders continue to oppose the bill out of concern the merger will increase cost, delay and stress for families. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the Family Court and Federal Circuit Court were facing delays of more than a year's worth of cases each. Two in three fe Federal Circuit Court judges already have more than 300 matters in their dockets, some more than 600. The Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit Court has previously indicated that the ideal number should be around 100 each. They are a long way off that mark. The Family Court and the Federal Senator Circuit Chair, Court— Please resume your seat. You shall be in continuation. It's now time for Senator's statements. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to withdraw notice of motion number 998 standing in my name for today. Leave granted. Leave granted. Thank you. Senator Askew. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> I rise today to speak about what I consider to be one of the most exciting opportunities in Tasmania today, renewable hydrogen production. As a state, Tasmania's clean green image is already synonymous with renewable energy, but hydrogen is an energy source where we are truly leading the way. At the beginning of this month, National Energy Resources Australia NERA, announced Bell Bay Advanced Manufacturing Zone as one of the successful applicants for its seed funding program awarding the organisation $100,000 to form a regional hydrogen technology cluster. The Tasmanian government matched the NERA grant, providing Bell Bay Advanced Manufacturing Zone with an additional $100,000 to further develop Tasmania's renewable energy future. This announcement comes hot on the heels of Woodside Energy signing a memorandum of understanding with the Tasmanian government for its renewable hydrogen facility in the manufacturing zone in January. A final investment decision is expected in the second half of this year, with Woodside planning to start hydrogen production at the site by 2023 if the project is to go ahead. Fortescue Metals Group is investigating the feasibility of developing a green ammonia plant at Bell Bay as part of the Tasmanian government's Renewable Hydrogen Industry Development Funding Program. The project would include constructing a 250 megawatt green hydrogen plant to produce up to 250,000 tonnes of green ammonia per year for domestic and international export. Bell Bay Advanced Manufacturing Zone Chief Executive Susie Bauer said a facility of this size would be one of the largest in the world and it would be powered solely by Tasmanian renewable energy. Not only do these projects show the energy industry is behind Tasmania's aspiration to become a leader in large-scale renewable hydrogen production, but such products, projects create jobs for Tasmanians in construction and operational roles and support our economy. The combination of the state's abundant and low-cost renewable energy options and the unanimous adoption of the National Hydrogen Strategy by Australia's energy ministers in November 2019 shows Tasmania has the means to match the desire for this renewable energy source. Australia aims to be a major player in the global hydrogen industry by 2030, so the timing is definitely right. Our existing hydropower, combined with wind power, means Tasmania can produce renewable hydrogen at a cost 10 or 15 per cent lower than other mainland power grids. We are hydro ready. Bell Bay Advanced Manufacturing Zone is located in Tasmania's north at the mouth of the Tamar River, allowing the deep water ports, stable transmission and the transport infrastructure needed for a renewable hydrogen industry. This makes Bell Bay one of Australia's strategically important locations, particularly as it sits within the northeast renewable energy zone. Northern Tasmania is already throwing its support behind hydrogen. In December, I attended a breakfast hosted by the Northern Tasmanian Development Corporation, Bell Bay Advanced Manufacturing Zone and the Launceston Chamber of Commerce, specifically held to explore the leadership role this region could take in green hydrogen production. Hydrogen is a clean fuel that can power cars, trucks and ships, heat homes and industries and generate electricity. It is also one of the most plentiful elements in the universe. To put hydrogen's capacity as a fuel source into perspective, Australia's former chief scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, who led the National Hydrogen Strategy, 
says that one kilogram of hydrogen is enough to travel up to 100 kilometres in a Hyundai Nexo SUV or power a 1,400-watt electric split-cycle air conditioner for 14 and a half hours. Further, around one tonne of hydrogen is equivalent to 3.4 times the average annual consumption of an Australian house with gas heating. Indeed, Hyundai has already de started delivering hydrogen electric vehicles in Switzerland and is planning to put 1,600 trucks on Swiss roads by 2025. And transport stock and services manufacturer Alstom has already produced a hydrogen-powered electric train in the Netherlands. Green steel making is under pilot in Sweden and international shipping fleets are using clean ammonia, made from hydrogen, as a fuel source via modified diesel engines. Closer to home, the Australian Government's Future Fuel Strategy discussion paper, released earlier this month, considers how road transport will develop in Australia. The paper explains how new technology for vehicles, including hydrogen fuel cells, will give consumers more choice, reduce emissions and increase fuel security and air quality. There are several commercial hydrogen fleet and refuelling trials planned or already underway in Australia. These include hydrogen fuel cell electric forklifts, cars, shuttle and regional buses and trucks for mining and refineries. These vehicles are supported by demonstration refuelling facilities located around the country. The Australian Government, through the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, has already invested more than $4 million for hydrogen transport related demonstration projects including with Toyota Australia and BOC Limited. There is clearly a global appetite for this resource. However, hydrogen does not occur naturally in a useful energy form. Instead, it needs to be produced from substances containing hydrogen, such as water, solar, wind, natural gas or biomass. Renewable energy can be used to electrolyse water to produce hydrogen and oxygen. When renewable electricity is used, little or no carbon emissions are produced during manufacturing use. Most of Australia's energy is generated from non-renewable fossil fuels. However, this is not the case for Tasmania, where large-scale renewable energy infrastructure has been developed over more than a century. Tasmania has achieved 100 per cent self-sufficiency in renewable energy and the state plans to double its renewable generation to 200 per cent of its needs by 2040. The draft Tasmanian Renewable Hydrogen Action Plan puts the value of the Australian hydrogen export market at $2.2 billion by 2030 and $5.7 billion by 2040. Conservative estimates suggest that global demand for hydrogen as an energy source will exceed 8 million tonnes by 2030 and about 35 million tonnes by 2040. Japan and South Korea have already indicated they will need to import significant quantities of clean hydrogen as a substitute for fossil fuel for energy and transport. The Australian Government has already signed a cooperation agreement with Japan and a letter of intent with South Korea to underpin future hydrogen export, and it has a plan to develop an international certification scheme for hydrogen, working closely with local and international companies. International supply chains to move hydrogen in bulk quantities safely are already being investigated. Such options include transporting liquefied hydrogen by ship or via other hydrogen carrying forms such as ammonia or liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Tasmania's draft action plan states hydrogen production and distribution costs are high now compared to other fuels, but they should drop as production scales up and with further technological development. The COAG Energy Council's Hydrogen for Australia's Future report shows development of hydrogen technology has been aided by the falling cost of generating renewable electricity. Over the past decade, costs associated with gener generating electricity from wind and solar photovoltaic PV have fallen significantly by around 70 per cent for wind and 80 per cent for solar PV. And the cost of making a hydrogen fuel cell has fallen by about 60 per cent since 2006. This is an ambitious vision, but growing demand will likely create pressure to accelerate the use of hydrogen energy. As Dr Finkel wrote in the conversation, and I quote, hydrogen is just the fuel the world needs to support a clean energy future, zero emissions, flexible, storable and safe, end quote. The best way to work towards adopting hydrogen as our fuel of choice is for all of us, <coughs> governments, industry and communities to work together. 
This includes keeping a strong focus on streamlining regulation, ensuring safety as we delve into this emerging industry, opening up international markets and encouraging commercial investment. The Tasmanian government's draft action plan estimates a 100 megawatt renewable hydrogen production facility would contribute around 120 ongoing jobs regionally. Further, a 1,000 megawatt facility, which could be feasible by 2030, would contribute an estimated 1,200 regional jobs and could support around 200 megawatts of renewable energy investment. I mentioned earlier job creation when um, developing, developing opportunities at Bell Bay Advanced Manufacturing Zones, but those jobs, coupled with the estimates included in the Tasmanian draft plan, are just the beginning. Outside Tasmania, the hydrogen industry could generate thousands more jobs and add billions to our gross domestic product. But most importantly, hydrogen could help Australia integrate renewable generation into our electric grid, reducing our reliance on important fossil, imported fossil fuels. Now is the time for Australia to fully embrace renewable hydrogen production, with Tasmania leading the charge. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to update the Senate today about a local business um, that I've visited um, and had some dealings with in the last uh, few months over uh, the economic impact of their pandemic. And it's a travel agent. Um, her name is Lisa Calabria from Capital Travel, Manica. And Lisa contacted me quite early on, on in the pandemic to give me an update of um, what was happening to her business. Um, she had just bought the business some months before the pandemic after working for the same travel agent as an employee for um, more than 20 years. Uh, and Lisa had uh, become the owner of this travel agent and knew a lot of the, the clients and had long-standing relationships. And then the pandemic hit, borders closed. Um, obviously, the impact on the travel industry has been enormous. And um, she wanted to make sure that she was letting her local um, federal representatives understand exactly what it meant for her business. And also how important JobKeeper had been. Uh, to allow her to keep her business open and dealing with the refunds and the requests for cancellations and all of the toing and froing that needed to happen for her clients, uh, but also keep um, and all of her employees employed. And I think there was one employee that retired, but other than that, um, Lisa employs five women uh, in her business. Uh, she's been able to keep them on with the help of JobKeeper. Um, it's very clear from visiting with Lisa and her team how much she loves her work as a travel agent, how um, the reason she does it is because she enjoys um, you know, giving happiness and pleasure to other people and as they organise their holidays and all the excitement that, that ha comes with that. And it's really a business that she's dedicated her working career to. Um, and I think, aside from the emotional impact of this pandemic um, and the impact it's had on her business and her family, just trying to keep her business operational and look after her employees and, and look after her clients as well was so clear to me, um, including the fact that many of her employees and herself are still chasing <coughs> refunds and organising, um, you know, making arrangements for people who have had to cancel holidays. Now, what Lisa said to me is there is really no light on the horizon for the rest, you know, for the next six months at least. Um, you know, international borders are going to remain closed. The amount of work that she gets domestically uh, for domestic travel is very low. People either make their own arrangements, don't need a travel agent, but also people aren't making those arrangements because of the uncertainty around border closures and um, the pandemic overall. So there is absolutely no way the domestic tourism industry is going to go anywhere near um, replacing the work that she would have if borders were open. Uh, and I guess from her point of view and those of the organisation that she's a member of, AFTA, who I'm sure many have had dealings with in the last six months, um, they need some certainty about what's going to happen post um, the end of JobKeeper. And we are now nearing you know, 40 days or so until JobKeeper ends. And there 
isn't any clear plan from this government about what happens. And it's not just Lisa and the travel agent industry. It's live events. You know, I had a meeting with the live events industry. Um, you know, they're in, you know, there is just no possibility of returning to business as usual in the foreseeable future. No one is booking big events. Um, the border closures make it very unpredictable about any events. There's no insurance. No one can afford to put them on in light that they'll be cancelled and people will be seeking refunds. Like people have lost homes, they've lost their businesses, they've worked for you know all their lives in, and for many that are surviving on JobKeeper just to keep food on the table and perhaps paying mortgage payments and keeping people employed, there is no certainty about what happens in a few weeks' time. But we hear the government saying you know they're looking at targeted assistance, um, you know, and that may be the answer. I don't know. I mean, We're waiting to see what the proposal from the government is. But it's clear that the aviation industry, the tourism industry, the arts industry, the li you know, live events, entertainment, hospitality in certain areas are not back at pre-pandemic business as usual, it, and it's not going to happen. The vaccine is going to take the best part of this uh, year to roll out, all things being equal. Uh, and that the vaccine actually is rolled out along the, um, the plan that the government has in place, that will not be done until the end of, uh, towards the end of this year, certainly to any uh, substantial degree, in the second half of this year for the broader population to get vaccinated. So what is going to happen? Um, you know, and why are thousands and thousands of businesses across this country being left hanging? I mean, what is the benefit to the government of not making it clear what their plan is at the end of March? I mean, we've got people that need to um, make plans and they have no idea if their lifeline, and JobKeeper has been a lifeline. We know there's around 1.5 million people still relying on JobKeeper payments who have met the turnover test that the government put in place to tighten access to JobKeeper. We know that even with that in place, that there's still 500,000 businesses and about 1.5 million Australian workers relying on that payment to get through this. And to suggest, I think, that nothing is going to be needed at the end of March or during April when the payments flow through, or that there's some sounds of targeted assistance perhaps for, for the tourism industry. You know, it's not that limit. It's not limited to the tourism industry. There's a whole range of businesses across this country that have flow-on effects to their business model because of the pandemic. Now, Lisa is a really clear-cut case. You know, a, a woman who has worked her entire life and, through no fault of her own, bought a travel agency. After working as an employee in that travel agency for more than 20 years, buys it nine months before. A global pandemic hits. This was her, you know, nest egg, her her way to a, a adequate retirement, uh, going from employee to business owner, and now she finds herself surviving on the JobKeeper payment, nowhere near to what she or her employees were probably earning before, trying to make ends meet, and she has no idea what's going to happen to her and her five staff at the end of May, and no one in this government is telling her what will happen. Um, no one is making it clear whether there will be an extension of JobKeeper for her. She, she applied for one of the tourism grants in the grants that got announced by Minister, I think Minister Birmingham at the time. She's not eligible for one of those. So she doesn't want to see, oh, we've got targeted industry assistance, here's $500 million and you can apply for this and you can apply for that. That's not going to work for her. What's going to work for her is an extension of the JobKeeper program in recognition that her business is still more than 90 per cent down on where it would be had there not been a pandemic. So any kind of false belief that come March people have not got enough savings in the bank, that's what Treasury keep telling us, you know, the balance sheets of businesses and households have, have shot up and therefore they'll be okay. At the same time, Treasury acknowledges that there could be 
hundreds of thousands of job losses in particular industries, they'll be just offset elsewhere. Well, that's, no cold, that's cold comfort for someone like Lisa and her team. So her job's expendable, perhaps, because JB Hi-Fi is employing more people. It's not really the comfort she's after or the comfort she believes she deserves after working hard for so many years, paying her taxes, doing the right thing, and here, not through any business decision of her own and not at the fault of anybody, and I'm not suggesting it, it's anybody's fault, a global pandemic arrives, the government puts in place rules that shut down her business, basically, effectively shuts it down, it remains shut down. And what she needs, and the thousands of other travel agents around this country, but, but more broadly than that as well, as I've touched on, they need some certainty that this government is going to do the right thing by them after they've done the right thing by everybody else and worked every single day during this pandemic to try and get money returned to travellers that have cancelled their bookings. She hasn't had a day off, and she needs to know that this government understands the predicament she's in and is going to respond to it. We need to look after them. We need the travel industry uh, to be in place when this pandemic's over. <clears throat> Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It has become easier over the last 12 months for many of us to forget about, or at least deprioritize, the struggles of oppressed people across the world. With our borders effectively closed and the economic and health crisis having enormous impact on Australian life, the world beyond our shores is easily forgotten. So today I'd like to reflect on global human rights injustices and fights for self-determination, equity and dignity. There are oppressed people across the world who continue their struggles. The people of Kashmir continue to suffer through a human rights crisis outside the imaginations of many politicians in here. About 18 months have now passed since the Indian government revoked Kashmir's special status or limited autonomy and further eroded Kashmiri's right to self-determination. Kashmir remains in lockdown and has been under a prolonged communications blockout, which has had devastating impacts on the people of the region. Only in recent weeks has access to 4G internet been restored after being blocked for more than 500 days. Basic human rights in Kashmir must be restored, including freedom of speech and association. As recently as December, we saw at least 75 Kashmiri political leaders and activists arrested following regional local elections in an apparent attempt to squash potential political unrest. Many others have either disappeared or been detained since the revocation of special status in August of 2019. The Indian government must withdraw its troops, end the restrictions placed on political leaders, end arbitrary detentions and disappearances, and allow humanitarian organizations full access to resume their work. The decision to forcefully reduce the auto autonomy of Kashmiris must also be revoked immediately, and the campaign to systematically silence and oppress Kashmiris must end. The Greens have been and will continue to urge the Australian government to call on the Indian government to respect the human rights of the people of Kashmir and their right to self-determination. The human rights crisis in Kashmir should not be ignored. We also cannot ignore the present situation in India. Since August last year, hundreds of thousands of farmers have participated in rolling strikes against a trio of bills they say will corporatize farming in India. Many of the protesting farmers are from Punjab and Haryana and belong to the Sikh religious minority but many others around India have rallied in solidarity. They have won significant concessions, but are fighting on in an effort to see the laws repealed in their entirety. At times, the scale of solidarity from the farmers on show in India has been absolutely breathtaking. On just one day in November, an estimated 250 million people participated in a union-led general strike. And I want you to try and imagine nearly 10 times the population of Australia on strike, united in their cause, steadfast 
in their opposition to government repression of unionism and industrial action. I want to acknowledge that the struggle of the Indian farmers has not been without cost. Many farmers have now died um, and others have um, been injured during the rolling protests. Just this week, Disha Ravi, a 22-year-old climate activist, has, has been arrested and threatened with sedition charges for organizing in support of the farmers. The striking farmers' strength in the face of government suppression is a lesson in the power of workers' movements. The right to strike and protest must be respected anywhere, at any time. As ever, we extend solidarity to the Indian farmers and unionists struggling for control in their workplaces world over. And I hope that we can one day see workers' power like that of the Indian farmers right here in Australia. The unequal and inhumane treatment of Palestinians has continued through the COVID-19 pandemic. While the Israeli government rolled out the vaccine to a large proportion of its population, now into the millions of people, very few Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza have been vaccinated. Human rights groups, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have raised the alarm about Israelis, Israel's apparent unwillingness to ensure that the Palestinians under its occupation are vaccinated against this deadly disease. The poverty and destitution that many Palestinians live in under occupation only makes more urgent the need to vaccinate them against COVID-19. The Australian government has proven time and again that it is highly unwilling to oppose or be critical of Israel. Australia was one of only a tiny number of countries last year to oppose the United Nations resolutions on the proposed annexation of part of the West Bank Palestinian self-determination and illegal Israeli settlements. Make no mistake, on the global stage, Australia is clearly in the minority on Israel and Palestine. And to make matters worse, Australia is shirking its international responsibilities by defunding international aid activities in Palestine. In the 2020-2021 budget, Australia cut its aid commitments to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine from $20 million to $10 million per year. Australia must step up and do more for Palestinians in dire need of support. Australia must show solidarity with the Palestinian people who for decades upon decades have had to pay the price for settler colonialism, carving up their land and giving it away. And Australia must push for an end to occupation, to oppression and violence against Palestinians. Just as Australia has failed to support Palestinians, so too have they failed Uyghurs in China. The lack of global solidarity to support Uyghurs has been appalling. In 2019, I reflected in this very chamber that there has been a deathly lack of meaningful action on this issue from the highest levels of government in Australia and around the world. It's 2021, and I'm devastated to say that each word of that sentence remains true today. Without significant global outcry and action, the genocide in Xinjiang has only accelerated. More than one million Uyghurs and other Muslim ethnic minorities remain detained by the Chinese government in what they call re-education camps. Recent BBC reporting has detailed the systematic rape, abuse and torture of women in these camps. Detainees have been subjected to forced injections of unknown substances. Women are being forcefully sterilized. Denial of food and any kind of freedom has become the norm. It should go without saying that the mass detention of Uyghurs against their will in internment camps is an abhorrent abuse of human rights. This systemic oppression is aimed at the erosion of their ethnic identity. They are being indoctrinated in an effort to wipe out their culture. They are forced to live under strict religious restrictions in an effort to wipe out their faith. 
They are constantly surveilled and threatened with punishment in an effort to wipe out their spirit and will to resist. The global community, including Australia, knows that this is happening, but has done far too little to help. And this has to change. I said in my first speech to the Senate that our country must be friend of people who are fighting oppression, marginalization, and injustices, wherever they may be. That we should look beyond our borders as a proponent of democracy and human rights everywhere, not just where it is politically expedient. We do not get to pick and choose the injustices against we must struggle. We and the entire global community have to do everything we can to see an end to the genocide of Uyghurs and justice and freedom for all in Xinjiang. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I will not vote for any policy, target or measure that comes at the cost of Queensland jobs. Likewise, I won't, for, won't vote for anything that hurts businesses in Queensland, which is why I'm sceptical about the rush to net zero emissions by 2050. While those who scroll through Twitter like demented semi-house trained woodpeckers might like bumper sticker economics, as a regional senator, I have seen these discussions play out around the patios, the verandas, at the local pubs and bowl club, bowls clubs in regional Queensland. I left home in January and I haven't returned yet, as I've been on the road listening to workers and businesses. Workers and businesses know that zero emissions by 2050 is part of this bumper sticker strategy of the left, the left who want a virtue signal rather than bring forward solutions. So the message I hear from regional Queensland, from all of Queensland, is loud and clear. At the heart of any 2050 target should be a focus on jobs and businesses, particularly jobs in regional Queensland. If we lose one job or one business, that means I will not support these targets. By all means, bring forward your plans, bring forward your costed plans, but make sure these plans protect jobs and protect businesses. Because year after year we see the Greens trot into this place and drone on and dribble on and drool on like, free, like leaking fridges about shutting down coal mining, as though it will provide an instant silver bullet to a long-term global problem. We saw Bob Brown lead a convoy of southerners into central Queensland ahead of the last election. It was an utterly arrogant display, and we saw the message the people in those communities send at the ballot box shortly afterwards. The undeniable fact is for any long-term plan for emissions, we must focus on opening up greater opportunities for Australians, particularly in regional areas. If we are to make a plan for the next 30 years, the best way for us to have reliable and cheap energy in Australia while reducing our emissions is with a mix of coal, gas, renewable and nuclear power. These industries combine to offer strong opportunities for us to take advantage of our resources, supercharge our regional economies and build a more sustainable and self-reliant future for all Australians. Jobs and businesses are more important than lefty claptrap about unrealistic targets. Acting Deputy President, today, the 17th of February, is, is a sad anniversary. Today marks one year since General Motors pulled the rug out from under our Australian Holden dealers. They smashed Holden like a corporate granny-snatching hoodlum. The decision by General Motors to discontinue the Holden operations in Australia is, of course, their prerogative. But their failure to do responsibly and in a manner that is fair to the very people that has enabled the company to operate in the Australian marketplace is nothing short of shameful. The decision not only impacted Holden dealers, but it's the suppliers, the mechanics, the service teams, the receptionists, the technicians, the owners of the cars and utes. The Holden family was beaten up and spat out like weak, weak old pizza by General Motors. And over the last 12 months, I've continued to call on General Motors time and time again to treat the Holden dealers with respect and to return the proud Holden brand that means so much to our car enthusiasts and motor dealers. Sadly, it appears these calls have fallen on deaf ears. 
How long will it be before the Holden brand, our Holden badge, is sold to a state-owned company in China? General Motors betrayed Australia when they shut down Holden. I fear nothing will stop them betraying the Holden family by selling the Holden brand to China. Acting Deputy President, Monday marked an important day for many Australians. Monday was the 79th anniversary of the fall of Singapore. Tuesday marked an equally important date. Tuesday was the 79th anniversary of the Banker Island massacre of innocent nurses. On Sunday, I joined my colleague Senator Paul Scar and Brisbane City Councillor Angela Owen alongside senior members of our Army, Navy and Air Force, alongside senior members of the Singaporean Defence Force who are based out at the Oki Army Aviation Base. We came together at the Shrine of Remembrance in Brisbane to mark and remember the fall of Singapore. More importantly, we did so in front of the families and friends of those, especially of the 2nd 10th Field Regiment Association and of the nurses and other associations who quietly each year remember the lost and remember those who suffered under the brutality of, of their captors. People like my great uncle Gray, who was a major and was in Singapore on the way to fight the Nazis, that was in Singapore when it fell and spent the next three and a half years as a guest of the Emperor. So I'd like to thank Libby and Wendy and their families and all the other volunteers for their work in organising the service. And I'd like to, to wish Wendy, who is in hospital, the best of luck with her own battles uh, that she's engaging on in, on the health front. And this is a service that I've taken part in for many years. And each year marks an ever important reminder that we must always stand up and we must fight for freedom. We must fight for freedom both here in Australia and overseas. We must stand up for freedom in Singapore. We must stand up for freedom in Taiwan. We must always be on the side of freedom and democracy, not just because it is righteous, which it is, but who will help us if and when the time comes when we, when we need to light the beacons and ring the bells for help. Our freedoms were fought by those who gave their all so we might have our day and so we might sleep soundly in our beds. So I support the call by Julian Simmons, the member for Ryan, along with numerous ex-service organisations for the Anzac Day marches and services to proceed in Brisbane and across Queensland. The RSL has asked for a small service at Anzac Square and for a small march at the showgrounds at Bowen Hills. The Premier, of course, hasn't replied to either the RSL or to the member for Ryan. If Black Lives Matters can have marches, then we must and we should support Anzac Day proceeding. To do anything less disrespects those who gave their all so we can have our today. Senator Ayres. <clears throat> Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, last week, the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee uh, reported on its inquiry into diaspora communities, and I was not able to make some reflections uh, on the report uh, and the conduct of that inquiry uh, then, and I intend to use this opportunity in Senator's statements to do it uh, today. Australia is a place where people from across the world can be included and ultimately thrive. It's a fundamental strength uh, for this country, and it's one of the things that makes Australia a great place to live and a great place for our children to grow up. It connects us to a globalised world creates a richer and more diverse way of life. But of course there are challenges in a multicultural society at making sure that we're continuing to improve the social, economic and political participation of Australians from migrant backgrounds. And that includes uh, having consistent and focused support and attention from this place. Addressing the inequalities of outcomes faced by these communities often stemming from racism and exclusion, is an important and challenging task that deserves all of our attention. Uh, the inquiry was an opportunity to hear from groups doing the important work 
that underpins Australian multiculturalism. Volunteer organisations across all of the different groups that make up the rich tapestry of our multicultural society. The committee received a suitably diverse range of submissions on a diverse range of subjects. And I want to thank all of the groups who provided submissions, in particular those groups that provided oral evidence. It did become clear over time that some of the participants in this inquiry uh, were particularly interested in using the inquiry to discuss the future of Australia's relationship with China and how it is expressed in the lives of the Chinese Australian community. There is no doubt that the future of this relationship should be a source of debate and critical engagement. Since Whitlam opened dialogue with China in July 1971 and how it is expressed in the lives of the Chinese Australian community. There is no doubt that the future of this relationship should be a source of debate and critical engagement. Since Whitlam opened dialogue with China in July 1971, engagement with China has been a key part of Australian foreign policy. Uh, China is a key country in our region. And despite some of the things uh, that put distance between us, it is not uh, a fact that can be wished away, uh, as is the case uh, with some people in this place. Trade with China is a key source of national wealth, particularly in our resources industries. Thousands of young Chinese students choose to study in Australia. However, that relationship is complex and it is changing. A more assertive China is more active in the region within and outside the norms of international order and rules. Australian produce has become vulnerable to trade bans, including in cotton, wine, lobsters, sugar, barley, timber and copper ore. Australia has and should have deep concerns about the status of Hong Kong, as well as the treatment of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. And there are legitimate concerns about attempts to interfere with Australian democracy. How we manage that relationship requires strategy, requires careful reflection uh, and requires leadership. And in managing that relationship, a key advantage is the success of Chinese Australians. There are 1.2 million Australians of Chinese heritage per capita. Australia has more people of Chinese heritage than anywhere outside of Asia. As with any large community, there is a diversity of political views. The diversity of those views can and should easily be accommodated and expressed in our democratic system. How this could be achieved was the subject of one of the public hearings in which a panel of Chinese Australian uh, academics, uh, amongst others, gave evidence about how, how Chinese Australians engage with Australia's democratic system. As has been the subject of much debate here and outside, Senator Abetz used his questions to demand that, the, that this group individually, publicly and unconditionally condemn the Chinese Communist Party. It was, in my view, an abuse of the Senate committee process and a deliberate attempt to humiliate the people who were participating in it. At least when Joe McCarthy asked people whether or not they were communists, he asked everybody the same question. This question this time was only directed to those Australians with Chinese heritage. Since that incident has been reported in the press, Senator Abetz has stubbornly maintained that his questioning was fair, that his words were misrepresented and that no request for loyalty was made. Here is what the hand side of the event records. Can I ask each of the three witnesses to very briefly tell me whether they are willing to unconditionally condemn the Chinese Communist Party dictatorship? Later in the exchange he said, but can you not pick a side to condemn the oppressive ugliness of the communist regime in China? Why is that so difficult? He said. He's since given several speeches to the Senate chamber about the matter and using parliamentary privilege to make particular claims about these people, calling them apologists, 
Labor operatives and self-described experts, not something that he's done with anybody else who's appeared before that inquiry. The name-calling misses the point. One of those uh, witnesses, Mr Osmond Chu, is a friend of mine, uh, and he's a thoughtful contributor to Australian political life. Ironically, Mr Chu's submission described exactly the kind of predicament that he found himself in. He said, Chinese Australians in particular have found it challenging to participate in politics over the last three years because of a growing public perception that the Communist Party of China operates within and influences the actions of Chinese Australian communities. The thoughtless assumptions that Mr Chu describes have, of course, in this country a long history. Chinese migration to Australia predates our federation, but so does racism towards Chinese Australians. The belief that Chinese Australians inherently have divided loyalties echoes a set of dark, racist ideas that have no role in modern Australia. The criticism of Senator Abetz's comments was entirely fair. Senator Abetz's stubborn response to his critics reflects traits that I suppose have served him well for his decades in political life. But they also reflect a set of views about China that has taken hold among particular members of this parliament. Rather than coming to terms with the complexity of Australia's relationship to China, and in particular the complexity of the issues in the Chinese-Australian community and the desire amongst many Chinese Australians to participate fully in our public life, these people increasingly view themselves as the antagonists in a sort of Manichaean struggle for good and evil, a sort of boy's own adventure, with little regard uh, for the consequences, uh, particularly the consequences for Chinese Australians uh, in our community. It's a worldview that's not supported by our intelligence community. It's childish and it does a profound disservice to the Australian people most notably Chinese Australians, because it hinders our ability to actually understand what is going on, to view the actions uh, of the China, of, of Chinese Australian community uh, properly, and it hinders our capacity. And that was made very clear uh, in later evidence, later public evidence, from the director uh, of ASIO. For those senators who are concerned with foreign interference, Mr Chu's submission offers this insight. He said, the homogenous nature of Australian politics is one reason why politicians find it difficult to deal with issues like foreign interference, because there is insufficient cultural and political knowledge of the foreign entities the government seeks to legislate against. A truly representative parliament is necessary if we want Australia to successfully navigate big foreign and domestic policy challenges and to reflect the values of equality which Australia stands for. Greater involvement of Chinese Australians in our democratic system is of immense value, not only in our engagement with China over the coming decades, but so that our democracy better reflects the country we represent in this building. Senator Abetz's comments and actions have undermined that effort. They undermine the purpose of the inquiry he participated in. Uh, and um, Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak of a game-changing new website for Australians planning a family. And that website is youriVFsuccess.com.au. My office was heavily involved in the formation of the Your IVF Success website and its tools, all of which were made possible with the support of the Health Minister Greg Hunt, UNSW and the IVF industry. Your IVF success is a game changer for those who are considering embarking on an IVF journey. A game changer because, for the very first time, Australians are able to access objective and comparable data on each IVF clinic's performance. The website also includes an IVF estimator, which will provide women with an indication of their chances of success based on their age and circumstances. Anyone who has ever gone through IVF or knows someone who has gone through this very emotional journey understands that until now it was impossible 
to find impartial and comparable data on fertility clinic performance. If you were to call a clinic, you would be given selective data and only that which they choose to share publicly. Some might give you their clinical pregnancy rate, others might give you their live birth rate, some might choose not to share data at all, whilst others will share selected stats on their website. Frankly, given the tens of thousands of dollars that Australians are forced to pay for IVF, it has long been time for the game of blind man's bluff to end. Consumers deserve to be able to make an informed choice when they choose a fertility clinic. They deserve truth and accountability. Of course, this is true not only in IVF, but across all medical specialties. It is my hope that one day we will have similar performance transparency for all specialists performing all surgeries in both public and private hospitals. Transparency and accountability is the key to improving health, in health outcomes for all of us. It also means outliers have nowhere to hide and must lift their game, all to the benefit of patients and to the benefit of the health system. From my perspective, the youriVFsuccess.com.au website has been about three years in the making. We started looking into the issue of performance transparency in the IVF industry back in 2017. It began by tasking the Parliamentary Library to help identify which countries require IVF clinics to publicly release their success rates. We found that the US and the UK were both leading the way by publishing performance data for individual clinics. We wanted to do something similar for Australian patients. After all, if it was possible to, to do it overseas, why should it be impossible here? Why are, is the IVF industry effectively running a uh, secret society? What became clear to us was that there wasn't any legislative path we could take to make this happen. The data resided in uh, private hands and de-identified data was able to be compiled only at a national level by UNSW through the existence of an industry code. So we had to think outside the box. We decided the closest approach would be to task the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare with collecting and reporting performance stats for every fertility clinic that receives public funds. We knew it wasn't a perfect solution, but it did show that something could be done. And so I introduced the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Amendment Assisted Reproductive Treatment Statistics Bill 2019. That bill got the ball rolling. That bill was enough to start a conversation with the IVF industry and government and to bring all parties together. With Health Minister Greg Hunt's support, an expert working group was formed to develop the website, which we, of course, finally launched Monday this week. The yourivfsuccess.com.au website is a wonderful example of what can happen when we don't let the past rule the future. We had always been told a website such as this would be impossible in Australia, that it would be impractical and undesirable to publish the performance of individual clinics in this way, and that it would only create a race to the bottom. I never accepted any of these arguments. The expert working group worked extremely hard to ensure the information contained on the website is not only rigorous, but that the data cannot be manipulated by clinics to game the system. It means that infertile Australians now, for the very first time, can view objective measures of the performance of each fertility clinic. An analysis piece on the ABC last month by medical reporter Sophie Scott and Angela, Angela McCormack demonstrated why this website is needed. It canvassed the views of 2,000 Australians who said they just felt like a number and who wanted very much oversight of the industry. 
They spoke of the emotional toll, the emotional roller coaster, the impersonal treatment, the frustration and the profound grief that can come with IVF. Their analysis posed a number of questions that patients want answers for, such as how can patients avoid spending outrageous sums of money to start a family? How can clinics find a way to make their patients feel less alone? Will unproven and costly add-on treatments be more tightly regulated? And will success rates published by clinics become more transparent? The story said, and I quote, more transparency around success rates of clinical practices will also provide patients with more realistic understanding of their chances of becoming pregnant. End of quote. This is exactly why this website was created. To give patients some of the important information that they lacked as they weigh up their options. All of Australia's 85 fertility clinics are listed on the website and 92% of them have consented to have their data shared. I must say though, I was somewhat disappointed that two well-known South Australian clinics, Fertility SA and Flinders Fertility, declined to have their data shown on the website. Both state they are proud of their clinics. I would argue that if they are as good as they say they are, they should be proud to display their results on the website alongside their peers. And I certainly hope that they will do that very soon. At the launch on Monday, I had the pleasure of speaking with two women undergoing IVF. Ella Mannix and Jessica Van Bridges. Both have been fortunate to have one child through fertility treatment. And Jessica is fantastically newly pregnant with her second child. It was gratifying to see how excited they were by the website. Jessica stated that she used two different clinics and found comparing the two and assessing her chances of success very challenging. She said that had the yourivfsuccess.com.au website been available at the time, she would more easily have been able to make an informed decision about where to go. She said of the website, and I'll quote, I think it will really help to empower couples. End of quote. Empowerment is what this website is all about. IVF is expensive and the process is often emotionally draining. The website can become a companion on the IVF journey for everyone who needs it. It is a useful resource and jumping off point for every woman thinking of undergoing IVF or who is wondering whether their existing clinic is best serving their needs. There are many people to thank for making this website a reality, people in the Health Minister's Office, the Department of Health and within the industry. But I want to particularly single out Professor Georgina Chambers from UNSW's National Perinatal Epidemiology Statistics Unit. I want to thank her for her careful attention to the performance data used and for her dedication on this project. I'd also like to thank two of my advisors, Maria Moscaritolo, who determined work helped lay the foundations that led to the website, and Dr. Des Suarez, who chaired the expert working group and steadfastly corralled the various interests to deliver uh, this particular project in a very short time frame. Senator Scar. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, can I first, before proceeding to my statement, if I could just congratulate my friend Senator uh, Sterling Griff in relation to his success in that regard and pay tribute also to our Health Minister, Greg Hunt, knowing personally people who have gone through IVF processes and how uh, emotionally draining and difficult it can be, how costly. I think this is an extraordinarily important initiative and I look forward to promoting uh, the website, certainly through my social media. So uh, congratulations, Senator Griff. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, the Honourable Anthony Albanese, member for Grandler, came to Queensland recently. And uh, my, my reflection is that uh, my re no, he didn't see me, Senator Stirl. Uh, and my reflection is my reflection is that Albo needs Queensland more than Queensland needs Albo. Albo needs Queensland more than Queensland needs Albo. And I say this having read 
uh, the speech which uh, the Honourable Anthony Albanese MP gave at TAFE Queensland on Wednesday, 10 February 2021. And I want to quote from that speech. And this is what the Leader of the Opposition said. The, he referred to the Labor Party's policy uh, for the abolition, and I quote, the abolition of the discredited and politicised Registered Organisations Commission and the Australian Building and Construction Commission. End quote. End quote. End quote. And I must say, I must say, Madam Acting Deputy President, how disappointing it is. How disappointing it is that the Leader of the Opposition casts a slur over all those good people who are working at the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisations Commission, because they're doing great work. They're doing great work for Australia, and they're doing great work for especially all those workers and subcontractors and others involved in the construction industry. Why are they needed? They're needed because at this stage in our history, we have not managed to get the construction division, and I say construction division, not the other divisions, but in particular, the construction division of the CFMMEU under control. They are a lawless union, a lawless union. And we need to deal with this issue. We especially need to deal with this issue because this country has generated and built up higher and higher debt, and we need to get every single bang for every single buck in terms of our infrastructure spend. We simply cannot afford, the people of Queensland cannot afford to pay an extra 30 per cent, an extra 30 per cent for every hospital, every police station, every highway, every other piece of infrastructure needed, including in my region, the Ipswich region, one of the fastest growing regions in Australia. We can't afford to pay that 30 per cent surcharge because of the lawlessness of the CFMMEU construction division. Something needs to be done. So let's have a look at the facts, Madam Acting Deputy President, in relation to, and using the opposition leader's words, the discredited and politicised body, close quotation marks, which is the ABCC. The ABCC continues to discharge its critical role as the full service regulator for the building and construction industry. Since it was re-established on 2 December 2016, the ABCC has recovered over $2.6 million in wages and entitlements for over 4,100 employees. Is this a discredited and politicised body? I wouldn't have thought so, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's collected over $11 million in penalties that have been awarded in cases brought by the ABCC. Addressing non-compliance, the ABCC has been successful in nearly 90 per cent of 81 cases decided. So just reflect on that, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's been successful in nearly 90 per cent, 90 per cent of the cases which have gone to court it's been successful in. 90 per cent. This is hardly a discredited and politicised body. Now, I don't believe, Madam Acting Deputy President, that my friends on the other side of the chamber, Senator Ayres, and Senator Stirl would ever conduct themselves, ever conduct themselves like some organisers and senior officials of the construction division of the CFMMEU conduct themselves. I really, I genuinely don't believe they would. I don't think my friend uh, Senator Tony Sheldon would either, or many of the other senators, many of the other senators, including you, Madam Acting Deputy President, who provided good service to the trade union movement. But there is a problem with the construction division of the CFMMEU. And the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Anthony Albanese, needs to recognise that. So instead of saying that these organisations are discredited and politicised, look at the facts. And let me give you an example of a recent case which was decided by His Honour Justice Rangia, a judge who I've known for close to 25 years prior to his uh, elevation to the bench, an extremely decent judge and someone who could hardly be said to be politicised or in any way uh, engaged in conduct other than the conduct one would expect from a superior court judge. And I refer to the recent case of the Australian Building and Construction Commissioner against James Fizenden and the Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union. And this judgment was brought down in July 2020. Now, what happened in this case was that a gentleman by the name of Cooper Crosthwaite was working at a 
uh, at the construction site for a new uh, shopping centre up on the Sunshine Coast. He wasn't a member of the union, and this was the problem. This was the problem. The owner of the company for which Mr. Uh, for which Cooper was working was actually approached by Mr. Fizenden, and he said that Mr. Crosswaite was not coming up as a union member, and that was the problem. He was not coming up as a union member. So when Mr Fizenden then attended the Sunshine Plaza site, he was threatened, he was actually threatened by the union uh, delegate, by this union official from the construction division of the CFMMEU, not the mining division, the construction division of the CFMMEU, and he was basically threatened that unless he paid his union fee, then he wouldn't be allowed to work on the, on the site. Now, it's interesting when you read the reasons for these judgments, how quickly the CFMMEU simply concedes. They simply concede all the relevant facts. They concede them. There's not even any dispute. So if you go to paragraph seven of the judgment, it says the commissioner alleges and the respondents admit. So they admit this, that Mr Fizenden took adverse action against Mr Crosthwaite by threatening to deny him the right to work at the Sunshine Plaza site on 10 March 2019, which Mr Crosthwaite had been engaged to do. So they actually admit it. And they admit that Mr Fizenden, their, their organiser from the CFMMEU, construction division, not the mining division, the construction division, took adverse action against the company by threatening to deny the company and its contractors the right to work at the Sunshine Plaza site on 10 March 2019. They actually admit it. So it just comes down to a question of what's the penalty going to be? They admit they breached the law. They're just absolutely, it's, it's, absolute, it's quite disgusting. And I'm sure those opposite, I'm sure those opposite who when they worked for the trade union movement, honourable profession, absolutely, absolutely. And I've said in this place before, my father was a member of a union, my mother was a member of the union, my sister was a member of a union. I have absolutely no problem with the trade union movement and I think they uh, carry out an absolutely essential role in terms of protecting workers' rights. No problem at all. Where I have an issue, where I have an issue is where you have this blatant lawlessness and it is just blatant. I'll read further from the judgment, paragraph 31. This is happening in my home state of Queensland. Workers in Queensland, whether or not they're employees, contractors, health and safety inspectors, do not deserve to be terrorised by the unlawful thugs in the construction division of the CFMMEU. They deserve a safe place of work. And this is from the judgment from Justice Rangier, and I quote, Two videos recording the contravening conduct was provided to the court. The videos show that Mr Fizenden was loud and abusive and used offensive language to describe Mr Crosthwaite. The contravening conduct was engaged in openly and in front of others at the Sunshine Plaza site. Mr Fizenden, Fizenden's conduct involved a threat to the incomes and revenues of Mr Crosthwaite and Norman Holdings, the company which he was working for. The people of Australia deserve better than this. They deserve better than this. And I implore those opposite, I'm not sure what discussions you have behind closed doors, but the conduct of the construction division of the CFMMEU is casting a slur on the entire trade union movement. I don't know why you put up with this. We have to find an answer to address this conduct. We can do better than this. Australia deserves better than the unlawful conduct of the CFMMEU construction division. Senator Stirl. Thank you, uh, Acting Madam Deputy President. It gives me great pleasure to rise and for the short time that I have to talk about a magnificent project being conducted in the East Kimberley, predominantly out of Kununurra, and it is called Waste to Wages. Now, in Kununurra, previous to the formation of the Revive Recycling Store, all waste went to landfill. Then, through the magnificent efforts of East Kimberley Job Pathways, and I want to acknowledge the CEO, Michelle Pucci, and they're ably supported and uh, backed up by Woonan Foundation, my very dear friend Ian Trust, they decided that they would start recycling. So, uh, crews were uh, employed, little truck, run around town, and they'd start picking up recycling stuff push bikes, old furniture, everything you could imagine. Now it's led to two sites. One is in Mango Way, that's a workshop where um, we have local Aboriginal uh, young men and women employed 
who um, uh, uh, fix up old bikes, fix up old furniture. They do some magnificent stuff. They create art through old car springs and, and you've got no idea the creativity of these, these young people. And then it goes around the corner to, and I'd like to say hello to Senator McCarthy. It's good to see you on there. Um, and uh, it's now, it is sold uh, in, uh, in the revived store. So I was walking through the store with um, an absolute diamond of the Kimberley and that is Paige McLaughlin. Paige runs Revive and Paige now has informed me as of uh, yesterday or the day before she's now been employed as a development manager which is magnificent. Um, and as we're walking through the store we're seeing all old cutlery, we're seeing bits of art, we're seeing old clothing, all sorts of bits and pieces. And then it struck me as we walked through the warehouse, old furniture. Now for those who might know my background, two things that made that formed a major part of my life was old furniture and uh, the Kimberley, where I was a uh, long distance road train operator. And I'd said to Paige, how does the furniture go? She said, we can't get enough of this furniture. She said, we can't get enough and it gets distributed through the East Kimberley. For those of us that know the East Kimberley, it's not a hop, step and a bit jump when you talk about going down to Horse Creek, going through over to Wyndham, going through Warman, but they have clientele that come as far away as Columbaroo, and that's a 12 hour drive into Kununurra, and even further down to Balgo, 300 kilometres south of Horse Creek to get second hand furniture. So I thought, well how can I use my uh, contacts and my old skills? To cut a long story short, I rang up my very dear friend Cam Dumancy from the Western Roads Federation, and I said, you and I got a job to do mate, we've got to go and get a truck, we've got to go get a couple of trailers, a dolly, we've got to get a fuel card, and I'm going to go get all the furniture and we're going to do a road train run and we're going to supply all second-hand furniture to revive so they could profit from the sales and all the profit that goes or comes from that store goes into training Aboriginal men and women in the East Kimberley. How good is that? They're doing that and I, we've seen the success. And Senator Cash, I can't wait because I know you want to get up there and you want to see it and I hope you take a whole cohort of your mates up there too to see what a great job they do. So on saying that, now come the thank yous. And it was, look, I'm sport. I got to do what I used to do for a living for 16 years and it was a pleasure. I was back, I should say, I was back in my safety boots. Well, I was while I was in the yard. Uh, back behind the wheel of a brand new 580 horsepower truck that was kindly donated by ACFS. And I want to thank Arthur Zaneros. And Arthur went one step further when he gave us the truck. And he also threw a fuel card at us. And he actually said, would it be all right if we could put some East Kimberley Indigenous art on the Prime Mover? I've got the photos. What a magnificent thing. I'm so grateful of Ian's son, who is the artist. And the scoops all painted in Indigenous art. And it was uh, food of the East Kimberley artwork. We also had the wound and stickers on the side. And we had the East Kimberley job pathways, just to show the support we had. I want to also thank Nick Dadamo. Nick's an old mate of mine. Nick and I started Nick in the transport industry in 19... 80 I think it was, and we watched his meteorotic rise as he went through the ranks as my co-driver, then bought his own truck and now he owns his own business and employs some 70 or 80 people. I'm just a baggy, uh, a baggy panted old truckie that never got past one truck. But Nick came good. Nick donated a heck of a lot of furniture too. Uh, Nick donated uh, the lead trailer for me and, and, uh, and uh, ACFS gave me the dog trailer and the dolly. And Nick threw on a big sign, Waste to Wages, with all art on it to put on the container. And not even that, Nick got his guys who I used to work with, some of the older guys like Nobby and Bruno. On a Saturday, he put on brekkie at the yard. We loaded, we loaded, I stood around and talked a lot. We loaded 120 cubic metres of furniture, hooked up the road train, and then off we went. I also want to thank for their support um, Mr. Scott Huntsman from the general manager of Allcast PPE. He said I couldn't supply furniture, but he wanted he supplied 1,500 face masks for Kimberley Health, so that went up. But now we come to um, my uh, support crew too, and I've got to do this. The old mates, they had to, I had to have a support crew in case I forgot how to get the Kununurra after all these years, or if I, you know, if I forgot how to hook up the road train. But my old mates, Reg Cowan, Johnny J D Davis, Graham Storky per Perkis, and uh, Eric Mac McGuinness. Thanks guys, you got me up there and back and you kept me lubricated while I was unloading with cold water. I just sort of throw that in. But the best part is I also want to thank, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Robert Bellato, sorry, from Northwest Quarries, supplying accommodation for us on the way up and on the way back, also fueling the, su the support vehicle, also supplying the truck. And 1,400 litres of diesel, that's no, that's no mean feat. So Robert, thank you very much. Now the best part, I've spoken to Paige and I've spoken to Michelle. It's on again. 
but this time we're not doing it in November. We're not unloading a road train of furniture in 41 degree heat like we did last time. So, Paige, I'm looking forward to working with you again and, of course, with Ash, Kira, Eric and your team. And I've uh, given uh, Paige the task of now putting out the wish list and I'm happy to say I rang Cam yesterday. He can't wait to get the riding boots back on. And I said to him, look, why you at it, mate? Get a learner's permit and I might even teach you some of my skills, so he reckons he's going to do that. So, selfishly, I can't wait to July next year as we head back up to Cunnamatnurra. But more importantly, we'll be dropping furniture off in Horse Creek for those disadvantaged families there, and we'll be supplying furniture for Wyndham as well. What a magnificent, magnificent project by Paige and her team up there in Cunnamatnurra. I wish her all the best. I can't wait. And in this place, we talk a lot about closing the gap, as we should do. We talk a lot about our, our visits to remote communities and, and, and how we love working with Indigenous leaders and Aboriginal communities. But when you see something as fantastic as this, they didn't put their hand out to ask for one cent of help. They did it all themselves. You can see the benefits rolling through the community when you can see young Aboriginal men and women who can break the cycle of dependency to actually have a job. If that doesn't bring a, a warmth to your heart, nothing will. I urge everyone, get to Kananara and visit Page at Revive. Order it being 2 p.m. We'll proceed to questions without notice. Senator Wong. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, and they relate, it relates to the allegations of rape which have been made publicly. The alleged rape occurred on the evening of Friday the 22nd or morning of Saturday the 23rd of March 2019. On or before Monday the 25th, the Minister's office is made aware an incident took place. On Tuesday the 26th of March 2019, the Minister's then Chief of Staff, who currently works in the Prime Minister's office, meets with both the alleged rapist and Ms Higgins. Ms Higgins discloses the alleged rape. On Monday the 1st of April, the Minister finally meets with Ms Higgins. How can the Minister maintain to the Senate and to the public that six days after Ms Higgins disclosed the alleged rape, to the minister's chief of staff that she, the minister, still did not know. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Wong for that question. Uh, like everybody in this building, I stand and I still stand ready to assist Brittany in any way that I can. And this begins and ends by allowing Brittany to guide this process respecting her privacy and respecting the integrity of what is now a police investigation. She has indicated that she intends to pursue her complaint with the Australian Federal Police, and all of these matters go to the heart of that inquiry. Has the minister... Sorry, on the point of order? But I, I do make this point of order, uh, that uh, it is... Uh, if there is an active investigation, the minister should demonstrate that. If an investigation is under the way, underway, the minister should demonstrate how being upfront about the minister's conduct, how that would compromise the investigation, because that is the test. That is the test. I've allowed Senator Wong you to make the point. Senator Reynolds, have you concluded your answer? You have. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. What have you got to hide? What are you hiding? Order. Yeah, clearly, it's clearly, it's so obvious you are hiding. I again ask, how can the minister maintain that six days after Ms Higgins disclosed the alleged rape to her chief of staff that the minister did not know? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And as I said again, uh, at the heart of my and my chiefs of staff response to this matter, has always been to seek the appropriate advice and to ensure that she was supported in whatever decision she made about her own life. Uh, this is, as I understand, now the subject and I of, of an active police investigation. Uh, it has always been an open investigation, is my advice. Order. And I Senator, understand Senator that she Wong, is making Senator a statement Wong on a from her order. public comments. Order. I have, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Order, and I raise my previous point of order. Is the minister assuring the chamber that she has knowledge of an active police investigation? And can she advise the chamber on what basis her being accountable for her conduct compromises that? Because that is the test, and anything less is you avoiding your order. accountability Senator to this Wong, place. Senator Wong, uh, uh, Senator Reynolds, have concluded. 
to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I really don't have much more to add to this. Uh, and order, order, order. So, thank you, Senator Wong. Um, S Senator I, Wong. I do not. I do not. In for a second. I do not for a second resile from my determination to make sure that Brittany, that the staff member herself, is in control of the process, and that is the case. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Didn't do the, right thing. the minister has previously said any complaint of violence, verbal, physical or sexual, must always be taken seriously, particularly when, as members of parliament, we must be setting the standard for members of the community. Why has this minister so failed to meet her own standard? Why is she continuing the cover-up? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And all I can reiterate is, as I believe this is a subject of ongoing AFP investigation, uh, that that is that is where that is where this matter rests. It is it is the right of the individual to control the process, Order. Order. which is why which is why which is why I referred I referred Order. and facilitated I, I her Reynolds. meeting with the Australian Federal Police at the time, because it was a I, I facilitated the meeting with the AFP with the member concerned. I, I, I have nothing Order. further to add, Mr President. Order. Order on my left. Order. Order. Senators on my left. Senators on my left. Senator Small has the call. Senator Wong. Order. Senator Gallagher. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Order. Can the Minister please update the Senate Order. on the Morrison Sorry, government's Small, comprehensive Senator Small, plan? please, I'll give you a chance to start again. I can't hear the question. I didn't even hear quite to whom it was. Order. 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 Senator, Order. Senator, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Payne, Senator, all senators, all senators, Senator Small, I ask you to recommence. Thank Senator you, Wong, Mr. Please. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister please update the Senate point on the order. Morrison government's comprehensive point, point plan oh, sorry, to roll point, out? Sorry, the Senator Small, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. I have been asked to withdraw an assertion that Senator Payne knew about the cover-up for two order. years. If she is telling us she didn't know, order. I withdraw, and I invite every other minister order. to make the same order. same Senator, assertion to the Senate Senator that Wong. they didn't know. Senator Wong, order. Order across the chamber. There are order. Order, everyone. Senator Small, you can start again. Thank you, Mr. President. A third time lucky. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister please update the Senate on the Morrison government's comprehensive plan to roll out the COVID-19 vaccines across Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Small, for your question. Rolling out the COVID vaccine across the country is one of the government's highest priorities, Mr President. 142,000 doses of the COVID-19 uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine arrived in Sydney Airport on Monday a major milestone in Australia's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first shipment out of 20 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine the government has secured as a part of COVID, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine treatment strategy. The country is on track for the first and most vulnerable Australians to start receiving the vaccine from Monday, Mr President. Approximately 80,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine will be released in the first week Approximately 50,000 vaccines will be made available for states and territories, for hotel quarantine and border workers and frontline healthcare workers. Approximately 30,000 vaccines will be made available for the Commonwealth Vaccine InReach workforce to aged care 
and disability care residents. It is expected that of these, at least 60,000 will be administ is administered by the end of February, with others to be continually administered thereafter, including to our most vulnerable uh, residents in more than 240 aged care facilities next week, Mr President. Suppressing the virus, delivering the vaccine and cementing our economic recovery to create jobs are this government's highest priority. Senator, a small supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the targeted and phased rollout roadmap prioritises the most vulnerable Australians? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Small. Mr President, we have prioritised the most vulnerable people in our society to receive COVID-19 vaccine first. The most vulnerable include our frontline workers and our senior Australians. They will be part of Class 1A, as I have just outlined. It's on track to roll out next week. Phase 1B will include adults over 70 years and either healthcare workers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, younger adults with an underlying medical condition, including those with a disability and high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire, emergency services and meat processing workers. Phase 2A, Mr President, includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 18 to 54 years and other critical and high-risk workers, Mr President. Phase 2B expands to the remainder Order, of the Senator Australian Colbeck. population. Senator Small, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister also update the Senate on how the government is working particularly closely with aged care facilities to distribute the vaccines? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, and, uh, the activation of the vaccination process into aged care is a significant logistic exercise for the government but also for aged care providers. Information has been sent out to aged care facilities for residents, their families, carers and loved ones about what to expect in the lead up to and on vaccination day. Our clinical workforce will work very closely with each facility in the lead up to, each vac to vaccination day to make sure the day runs safely and efficiently. Clinical staff at facilities will check the health of residents prior to administering the vaccine and each residential aged care facility will ask residents and their substitute decision makers if there's one in place to consent to receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. Mr President, I met with providers uh, and their representatives again this morning and engaged in a very active and, con and uh, constructive discussion with respect to the rollout. The rollout is a significant logistical exercise for all involved, and I want to thank Order. them Senator for their Colbeck, support and efforts for the to roll out has expired. Vaccine. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. On Monday, the Minister said that in her meeting with Ms Higgins on 1 April 2019, that she was, and I quote, not aware of the details or the circumstances of the alleged incident in my office. When did the minister become aware and who told her? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much and thank, I thank the senator for the question. Uh, and as I indicated in my previous response, uh, it's my understanding that Brittany has indicated she intends to pursue her complaint with the Australian Federal Police and that she has asked for her privacy to be respected. Order, and I will do Sorry, so. Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Point of order, just the information of the um, chamber. Ms Higgins has given... Um, permission for us to ask questions about this incident. Se Just sorry. for your information, I don't sorry. think you should Senator hide Gallagher, behind Ms Higgins I've allowed you to make by refusing point. to answer it, these not questions. A, technically a, a point of order. I'll call the minister to continue. Se Senator Reynolds has concluded. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. In terms of the Prime Minister's office and their awareness, and I quote from the government's own statement, as part of this process, the Prime Minister's office provided support to Minister Reynolds and her office in assessing a breach of the statement of standards for ministerial staff by the other staff member involved in the incident. Can the minister explain in her own words what the nature of this support was? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the Prime Minister announced yesterday that these matters uh, the one that Senator Gallagher has referred to would be examined thoroughly, and I welcome and I support that process. What I will say, again, is that at all times my staff and I try to support Brittany uh, in order. order. 
Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. What are you hiding? My supplementary, um, Mr President, is by whom was this support from the Prime Minister's office provided and why did the Prime Minister's office only provide support in relation to the alleged rapist? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and again, I'll just reiterate that the Prime Minister yesterday announced that these matters would be thoroughly examined and I welcome and I will support that process. Senator Reynolds has concluded her answer. Senator Wong. Um, Senator Reynolds has concluded her answer, I gather. Senator, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Birmingham. Uh, the Prime Minister has said that he was not aware of the allegations made by Brittany Higgins until Monday and that his office didn't know until Friday last week, despite the involvement of two ministers and current senior staff in his office. Former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says he finds it very, very, very hard to believe that the PM's office was not aware. Yesterday, the PM also said he wanted to listen to Brittany, but then he questioned her report that she'd been contacted by his fixer, Euron Finkelstein. Do you agree with the former Prime Minister that it strains credulity that Mr Morrison's office did not know about the alleged rape? And do you support the Prime Minister's suggestion that Brittany was confused and wrong about contacts from Mr Finkelstein? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, in relation to uh, advice provided uh, to the Prime Minister's office, uh, it's important to appreciate uh, what Senator Reynolds has indicated previously, the respect for Brittany's choices and confidentiality. The primary concern is for Brittany and her welfare. And it's out of concern for Brittany and to empower her decision-making that Minister Reynolds facilitated discussions between Brittany and police in early 2019. I note that, I note that parliamentary departments provided access to police with CCTV footage at that time and have preserved such footage to facilitate any future access. It's clear, obviously, from what has been said publicly, that Brittany believes the support ultimately was inadequate, for which Minister Reynolds has unreservedly apologised. Concern for Brittany's wellbeing remains paramount, including her right to preserve her choices around whatever actions or steps that she takes. But the government will certainly continue to cooperate with any investigations undertaken. Order, Senator, I have Senator Waters on a point of order. Senator yes, Waters. a point of order on relevance, please, President. My question clearly went to whether um, the minister agrees with Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Turnbull's views, um, and it pertains to whether or not he agrees that Brittany was lying. I, 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 Senator Waters, I remind senators again that when there is a, a, a long preamble, the minister can be directly relevant. That was a long question. The minister is clearly being directly relevant to the question. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, the Prime Minister has made clear his view that he believes he ought to have been notified earlier. Uh, but of course, as always, uh, how such notifications are handled in the future will be uh, a factor of consideration of the reviews that are underway, noting the fact that the privacy and confidentiality wishes of individuals also need to be respected uh, when such issues arise. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Yes, uh, thanks, President. The bungled response to incidents around Brittany Higgins' assault has involved senior staff in the Prime Minister's office, two ministers, security guards, the presiding officers and the Department of Parliamentary Services. The government's fingerprints are all over this, and it's simply impossible to imagine that an in-house investigation will be adequate to get to the bottom of this. When will the government commit to an independent investigation into the response to Brittany Higgins's rape allegations? Senator Birmingham. Oh. Mr President, uh, the government and the Prime Minister committed yesterday to uh, a non-partisan cross-party uh, review around workplace matters. And, uh, Senator, uh, I will be reaching out to you, as I will to others, uh, to ascertain the next steps in relation to how that review is undertaken. Senator Ward has a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Following the allegations aired on Four Corners last year, I wrote to both you and the opposition leader in the Senate requesting a cross-party meeting to discuss options to establish a robust, independent complaints procedure and to give staff confidence that allegations would be treated seriously and that there could be consequences for perpetrators. 
Well, I welcome the calls that are gaining some traction this week. Why has it taken nearly three months and the most serious of misconducts in this building for the government to finally act and act in a weak manner? Order. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I don't accept uh, the final assertion there. I've just given an undertaking uh, that I will be engaging with Senator Waters, uh, with Senator Farrell or whomever the opposition nominates, uh, and indeed with others who wish to participate to ensure that the type of cross-party response uh, to uh, create uh, a stronger uh, set of practices in relation to workplace relations matters in this building for the future uh, is as comprehensive as it needs to be. And I look forward to engaging with those parties uh, to achieve that outcome. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Sasolja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is ensuring that Australian families and businesses have access to the affordable, reliable energy they depend on, which will support job creation and continue our economic recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Oh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Hughes for the question. Uh, the Morrison government, unlike those opposite, uh, is focused on delivering affordable, reliable and secure electricity for all Australian families and businesses. This is central to our ongoing commitment to economic recovery and will support jobs, productivity and economic growth and our plan to reduce power bills for hundreds of thousands of households and businesses is working. As a result of the default market offer reforms introduced by the Morrison government, Australians are already benefiting from lower electricity prices. Wholesale energy prices across the national electricity market have fallen for 17 straight months, from well before COVID, with wholesale costs making up around a third of residential electricity bills and even more for industry. Uh, these price falls are delivering real savings for Australian families and businesses. Today, the Australian Energy Regulator released its draft determination for the default market offer for 2021-22. Now, the DMO will translate into lower prices for households and businesses across New South Wales, South East Queensland and South Australia. The DMO caps, the DMO caps the price of the most expensive offers in the market, protecting consumers from high electricity prices. The Australian Energy Regulator's draft price determination released today will drop prices for households on standing offers by up to 7.9 per cent, or $136 a year, and small businesses by up to 8.5 per cent. This builds on substantial savings already delivered in the first two years of our default market offer reforms. Average residential customers who are on the highest standing offers prior to introduction of the DMO could now be up to $802 per year better off in New South Wales, $794 better off in South East Queensland and $707 better off in South Australia. We're putting more money into people's pockets and supporting our economic recovery. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister update the Senate on how all Australian families and businesses, including in my home state of New South Wales, can make sure they're getting the best energy deal? Senator Seselja. Well, thank you, and I can. The Morrison government remains absolutely focused uh, on providing relief to Australian households and business, and, I, and I'm pleased to advise the Senate that we are empowering consumers to find the best energy deals available. Now, while the default market offer protects customers from the highest priced offers, it's important that households and businesses understand there are better offers available. That's why we're not only encouraging customers to shop around for the best deal, but we are giving them the tools, the, the tools to do so. So the government's Energy Made Easy website, energymadeeasy.gov.au, makes it easy for customers to compare all energy offers that are available in the market and to make the switch. We've also added new features to the website to make it even easier uh, to compare deals, including for solar feed-in credits. I'd encourage all energy customers, whether you're a household or a small business, to check out the website, review your energy policy and to find a cheaper power plan. Hughes, yeah. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please advise how the Morrison government's approach is ensuring that energy remains affordable for small businesses, particularly in my home state of New South Wales, and is the minister aware of any risks to this approach? Senator Seselja. Thank you, Mr President. And yes, I am. Since we introduced the default market offer, the average small business in New South Wales could have saved up to $3,124 a year. Now, that 
is in stark contrast and would be put at risk by those opposite. Now, not, 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 not for a lack of trying from the Otis Group, who have absolutely done their best. Uh, you know, they've had some early wins where they managed to get rid of uh, Mark Butler as the energy spokesman, and they thought they were onto something. And well done, well done to Senator Farrell for that. Order. Only, only to Order. have him replaced by Chris. I love a carbon tax, Bowie. Order. Uh, so they get rid of Mark Butler, and then straight away they get hit with Chris Bowen. And to add insult to injury, Order. they have the spokesman for Queensland Resources is Murray White. Murray Watt, who's never seen a resource that he would ever want to be de see deployed in any energy source, be it in Queensland or elsewhere. We're getting on with the job. We're lowering energy prices Order. in Senator contrast Sasselja, to those opposite. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. The Minister says she always wanted Ms Higgins to drive this process. If that is true, why has the minister failed to assure the Senate that neither she nor her staff nor any of the Prime Minister's staff said or did anything which may have encouraged Ms Higgins not to pursue the incident with police? Will the minister now provide that assurance? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Yes. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. The minister says... She has always wanted Ms Higgins to drive this process. If that is true, why, as Ms Higgins says, was the alleged rape, and I quote, a taboo thing it was never spoken about again? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Keneally for that question. Uh, and as I have observed uh, in this place over the last three days, that this process begins and ends with allowing her to guide this process, respecting her privacy and respecting the integrity of what is now a police investigation. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. The minister says she has always wanted Ms Higgins to drive this process, but when asked about whether, when, when Ms Higgins was asked whether she felt pressured in any way whatsoever not to proceed with the case to the police, Ms Higgins stated unequivocally, and I quote, Absolutely. Absolutely. Does the minister accept that Ms Higgins felt pressured not to proceed with her complaint to the police? Senator Reynolds. Uh, I'll refer back to my first answer uh, where I said yes. Senator Davey. Oh, order, Senator. All right, I'll, I'll call the minister, Senator Reynolds. I, 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 this is, this, this, Mr. Mr. President, this is a critically important uh, point. I have been very, very, very consistent and said Order. that this has always been about consulting Brittany Higgins and providing the advice to her and allowing her own agency to determine what she does. Order. Senator Keneally. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. I understand the minister got back to her up on her feet to attempt to answer the question, but she didn't actually address the question. It was, does she accept Ms Higgins felt pressure? I, it's I, not about what she with, did, it's about what does she with, accept. With, with respect, Senator Keneally, I, I cannot deem the minister's answer in any way not directly relevant. There's an opportunity after question time to debate questions. Um, Senator Reynolds, have you concluded or you wish to continue? Senator, Senator Reynolds. I cannot speak for anybody else in this place. I, I speak and I'm accountable for my own actions. And as I've said, Order. at the beginning and the end of this process, it was about respecting her privacy and her, and her integrity and her wishes. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small, Biz Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister please outline how our government is supporting jobs in regional Australia as we emerge from bushfires, drought and now the COVID pandemic, and how this investment will support further job creation and continue our economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey uh, for her question, and I acknowledge the commitment of all of us on the government side of the chamber to rural and regional Australia. Uh, Mr President, 
Supporting rural and regional Australia, in particular through the COVID-19 pandemic, has been a fundamental priority of the Morrison government. Our government has stood with rural and regional Australia through its most difficult times, and we are putting in place the right policies, the right investments to ensure that those in rural and regional Australia have that opportunity to emerge even stronger on the other side of COVID-19. When we look at the contribution of rural and regional Australia, uh, it produces our nation's most valuable export, it supplies our energy, and I think all of us in this chamber would agree. It certainly provides us here in Australia with some of our most attractive tourist destinations. When you look at the breakdown of the workforce, uh, Senator Davey, with over 32 per cent of the workforce is actually in New South Wales and over 50 per cent of the workforce in Tasmania and Queensland, they are actually located in our regions. And that is why our $74 billion job maker plan is such an investment in regional Australia and, importantly, the creation of regional jobs. Because certainly uh, the Morrison government are all about putting in place the right economic policies so that all Australians, but in this case rural and regional Australians, are able to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. Mr President, Research by the National Skills Commission, 51 per cent of the 260,000 resources jobs are in regional areas, and over 40 per cent of these workers they receive their qualification via vocational education and training. And again, that is why the government puts in place policies to support our communities, to support rural and regional Australia, to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs for Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. And as part of our government's more than $7 billion investment in skills, how are the apprentice wage subsidies supporting a new generation of skilled workers throughout rural and regional communities? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, we acknowledge that skills and training they are critical to the manufacturing and the resources industries that drive so many of our economies uh, in these regions. The government's put in place, as we've spoken about before, the Supporting Apprentices and Trainees Wage Subsidy. And this has, of course, provided crucial support across Australia, but in particular in our regional areas, for their apprentices and the small businesses uh, that have those apprentices throughout COVID-19. In remote and regional Australia, the subsidy has actually helped keep over 41,000 apprentices and trainees in work and almost 22,000 small businesses. Without that subsidy, those apprentices and trainees may not have been able, Mr President, to be kept on the job. And Senator Davey, you'd be interested to know that in those figures, it actually includes over 7,000 small businesses in your state of New South Wales. Again, the Morrison government putting in place the policies to keep our apprentices and our trainees where we Order, need them Senator on Cash. the job. Senator Davey, a final supplementary oh. question. Thank you. Now, while we've seen encouraging signs of economic recovery, what measures is our government putting in place to continue to support our regional econ economies to further recover and help drive our um, roadway out of the pandemic? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Senator Davey, you'd be also interested to know that in terms of our boosting apprentices' commencements wage subsidy, which of course is supporting that new generation, that new pipeline of skilled workers in Australia, to date around 23,000 new apprentice training contracts has been reserved under the program by almost 12,000 businesses. And where are they located, those businesses? In regional Australia. Again, the Morrison government putting in place the policies to ensure that our regional businesses, our rural businesses, have that capacity to keep those apprentices on the job where we need them. But of course, our investment does not stop there, Mr. President. We have a $100 million regional recovery partnership program. In terms of these par uh, partnerships programs, we're going to supercharge um, and, the, and coordinate investments with other levels of government to support growth, prosperity in at least 10 regions across Australia. We are putting in place the suite of policies that businesses Order. need Senator to Cash, prosper, time grow, to and create has more expired. jobs. Senator Seawood. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin. Minister, through you, Mr. President, will you guarantee that people on the job seeker payment won't go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? 
The Minister for Social Services and Families, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Saywet, for your, for your question and, uh, and clearly a long going and enduring interest in, uh, in those people that um, find themselves in the need of the receipt of welfare. Um, but one of the things I would say that, that has been very clear by this government is that um, we remain committed to walking side by side with all Australians as we work, walk our way through this pandemic. And we understand um, you know, that it has been a tremendously tough year for many Australians over the last 12 months as this pandemic has taken an unprecedented toll on our economy and our society, and particularly um, individuals who found themselves who lost their work. Um, but Senator, um, Senator Seawatt, one of the things that, that the government has been very clear about is that our focus must, whilst helping and supporting people who find themselves in a situation where they are unemployed, our most important role now that the economy is starting to open up, we are starting to see uh, um, all of the, st the, the statistics and figures of an economic recovery, a jobs market recovery. We're seeing, you know, um, renew or, or returned levels of job advertisements and, and job availability. That we must make sure that the efforts of the government are entirely focused on assisting people on the pathway back to work. And that's why the government has, has moved and transitioned much of our support uh, in terms of additional supports that are in the marketplace towards job creation and, and job access programs, like, for instance, the, the, uh, the hiring credits. Well, sorry, Senator Seward on a point of order. <laughs> Senator, uh, Mr President, point of order. I asked no preamble, a very simple question. So could I please ask the minister, thank her for the information she's given us. Will she guarantee that the payment won't go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? Yes or no? I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question, Senator Seward. You did ask a very simple and precise question. Um, if the minister is talking about that particular payment, I do consider that to be directly relevant, but I've allowed you to remind her of the question. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, but as I was saying, I mean, the, the point that I was making to, to Senator Seward in my answer, Mr. President, is the fact that we still remain in a situation where the COVID pandemic is impacting on our economy and on the response that the government is providing to the economy to support all Australians. And we believe that at the moment there are elevated levels of support that remain in place for people who find themselves unemployed Order, at Senator this time. Rustin. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. That is a no. Earlier this week, there were reports that you were, the government was considering simplifying the system and considering a flat rate for the job seeker payment. Today, we learn that the government might be consider, considering a so-called unemployment insurance scheme. Isn't this just a deliberate distraction from the fact that the job seeker payment is going back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I can categorically say no, it is not. Uh, and the other thing I would say in response to the, the question that you just put forward, or the commentary you just put forward, is that um, you know one thing I have learned very clearly around here is you don't speculate on speculation, uh, and that is clearly what you are currently doing. Um, there have there have been numerous commentaries around what governments do and don't do. I think probably the best thing to do is to wait and find out what government is doing when government actually does it. Um, but what I would say to you, Senator. See, well, it is very clear um, that the, uh, the economy has been significantly affected, our jobs market has been significantly affected, and we have had a year, an unprecedented year of upheaval. But the government has made sure that we have stood side by side with Australians by providing additional support to those people who have found themselves out of work. Currently, we have an, a, an elevated support level for people who are unemployed of $150 uh, a, a fortnight. That goes through for, for another, uh, another uh, sort of six or or eight weeks. Um, but Order, we are Senator absolutely Rustin, time focused. for the answer has expired. Senator Sea with a final Minister, supplementary question. Minister, you've just you've just admitted that the effects of the pandemic are still going. You've said you're walking side by side with Australians uh, through this pandemic. What do you say to the thousands of people who are on job seeker today, right now, to the mothers, the fathers, the young people, the older people, about certainty, if you're so keen on walking side by side with them, what are you saying about certainty of a payment that's going to go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, well, Senator Seward, um, I won't repeat the answers I've given to my first year two, your first two questions, but I would say um, you know, the, the government has, has been 
stood with Australians who found themselves uh, unemployed over the last 12 months by providing a coronavirus supplement in recognition of the conditions in the jobs market at the time. Clearly, when we first went into the pandemic, the $550 supplement recognised the fact that the jobs market closed down overnight. But now, as we're seeing the economy starting to open, the jobs market starting to improve, we're very keen to make sure that our initiatives that we have in the marketplace are helping people to get back into work, helping yeah. jobs to be created through the programs that are being put in place, uh, you know, like the job trainer um, program that Senator Cash is, the working hiring yeah. credits that, that have been put in place for young Australians. Because the most essential thing that we can do to help people who are unemployed is to create jobs, help with business to create jobs and make sure they've got pathways to those jobs. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Businesses in far north Queensland have made it clear to both the Morrison government and the opposition that JobKeeper is keeping businesses solvent and when, with its withdrawal, jobs will go. CEO Skyrail Ken Chapman said of job losses, and I quote, across the region it will probably be thousands, definitely hundreds. Why won't Mr Morrison be up front with these businesses about what ongoing support will be available at the end of March? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And uh, this is a matter, of course, that Senator Green has raised in the chamber previously. And I'm uh, pleased to add to uh, those uh, uh, responses I've uh, provided uh, in that context. Uh, in the last um, couple of weeks, uh, as uh, the Tourism Minister uh, has had the opportunity, uh, in fact since his appointment of course, uh, to meet with many tourism operators, many peak bodies, to understand the impacts of the pandemic and what pathways to recovery might look like. Specifically in relation to Queensland, Mr President, most recently uh, the Minister was able to visit regional Queensland. He participated in a series of roundtables. He met with tourism operators, with small businesses, with representatives of local industry. One of the reasons for that, Mr President, of course, is because members and senators on this side of the parliament believe it is important to meet directly with those business representatives and Order. to hear that feedback in person. Uh, for example, the minister held roundtables with exporters, with the tourism and aviation sector, uh, which were hosted by Order. Tourism Tropical North Queensland. He met with the CEO of the Star, Senator the Watt. theme park CEOs on the Gold Coast as well. Uh, he participated in uh, another meeting with Gold Coast tourism stakeholders. So he has had the opportunity here directly from those local tourist operators to understand how state border closures and the loss of international tourists particularly are impacting them. Uh, I think the minister has found that experience very valuable in terms of working so closely with the tourism sector in Queensland, uh, but also across Australia on a post-job keeper plan for tourism recovery. As a result of those discussions and many other engagements, uh, Mr President, the government is very conscious that JobKeeper has supported a large portion of the tourism industry. And, in fact, I myself have heard the positive Order. feedback Payne, from many operators about has that expired. support. Senator, Senator Payne, the order, time for the answer has expired. I was attempting to call order as well. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. Tourism operators in far north Queensland are crying out for certainty from this government, fearful of their jobs and livelihoods. When will the Morrison government make an announcement about what support will be available when JobKeeper ends? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As I was saying um, in my remarks in the uh, earlier response, the government is very conscious that JobKeeper has supported a large portion of the tourism industry. And so we are considering how best to support economic recovery in the tourism sector when JobKeeper does conclude uh, at the end of March this year. I would, however, also remind the Chamber, though, Mr President, that, as I have said previously, we have provided in the process of the response to the pandemic uh, and in the 2020-21 uh, budget, uh, a strong plan of support for the industry. That includes the $50 million for the recovery for regional oh, tourism sorry, fund Green, to boost to tell, tourism sorry, in Payne, nine regions. I have regions. Senator Green on a point of order. It's difficult to tell. My apologies because the lectern. Senator Green. 
Point of order, Mr. President. It's just on relevance. Uh, the question was very directly about when, when the Morrison government will make an announcement about support when JobKeeper ends. It's an incredibly important date order. for these businesses Senator Green, that need Senator certainty Green, now. You, Senator Green, I've made, allowed you to make the point of the second part of your question. The minister is entitled to be directly relevant to any part of the question. Uh, if the minister is talking about the first part of the question, that is You're also directly now, relevant. Senator Payne. I was going to respond further to the point of order, Mr. President, but oh, um, you dealt with that, and so thank you very My much. Uh, that's all right, Mr. President. I was speaking about, uh, well, let me say, in response to the point of order, that I did respond to that part of Senator Green's question uh, when I commenced my answer. That I did order, respond Senator to Payne, that. Senator Payne, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As the Senator has mentioned, the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment claimed that he was in Queensland last week to gather the information that he needs to target support to the industry. We already know that the sector is losing billions of dollars a month and hemorrhaging jobs. How much more information does the Minister need? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I can only imagine Mr. President, that if the minister did not meet directly with tourism representatives in North Queensland, on the Gold Coast, other parts of the state represented by Senator Green, and in other parts of Australia, I can only imagine, Mr. President, if the tourism minister did not do that, that those opposite would say he was negligent, that he was failing in his obligations to the sector. So the minister takes those very seriously, Mr. President. We absolutely understand the pressure order, and the impact order. of the COVID-19 pandemic on tourism on right in this country. Too. We understand and our response reflects that. Whether it is the Recovery Senator for Watt. Regional Tourism Fund, whether it is the Building Better Regions Fund, whether it is the Regional Recovery Senator Partnerships Watt. Fund, whether it is the Business Events Grants Program or whether it is the Consumer Travel Support Program, Mr President, all of those initiatives Order. are Senator directed Payne. at supporting Time this vital sector which has, has struggled. Order on my left and right. Order. Senator Watt. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the importance of Australia standing with other countries to oppose the practice of arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Patterson uh, for his uh, very important question. Mr President, one of the most powerful tools that we have to discourage countries from breaching their international obligations is speaking and working together to demonstrate a shared commitment to values and to goals. Early yesterday morning, very early Australian time, I joined colleagues from across the globe to endorse the Declaration Against the Use of Arbitrary Detention in State-to-State -state Relations, which has now been supported by more than 55 countries. The Australian government resolutely opposes the use of arbitrary detention, arrest and sentencing, including to influence state-to-state -state relations and exercise leverage over foreign governments. This is a malicious practice against international law. States' international human rights obligations include express obligations to foreign and dual nationals. In the declaration, we have highlighted the international rules, the norms and institutions that underpin stability and prosperity, human rights and enable global cooperation. I want to acknowledge the particularly strong leadership of Canada as well on these issues. The past year, I've been working very closely with former Foreign Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne and more recently with his uh, successor, Foreign Minister Marc Garneau, including to gather international support for speaking collectively against these practices and protecting the interests of our citizens. We'll continue to discuss areas of future cooperation with counterparts, as I did this morning in my conversation with US For um, Secretary, uh, uh, Foreign Secretary Raab. Australia's support for the declaration builds on a joint statement on politically motivated arbitrary detention delivered on behalf of 35 countries at the 45th session of the Human Rights Council in October. We will continue to advocate strongly for our citizens and others who are subject to arbitrary detention. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
can the minister explain how bringing attention to the practice of arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations is in the interests of Australians and their safety overseas? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. At any time, uh, as uh, parliamentarians uh, know as part of their daily work, Australian officials are dealing with many complex consular matters around the world, and every single case is different. Australia observes rules that apply to foreign nationals here within our jurisdiction and extends appropriate domestic protections. We expect all other countries to do the same. We'll always call for our citizens to be accorded justice and procedural fairness in line with international norms. And Australia will hold countries to account for their international commitments and their obligations to comply with international law and practices. There must be a cost imposed for states who subject the citizens of other nations to arbitrary test, arrest Order. and detention. Noting that international travel is restricted Order. because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we do strongly urge all Australians to monitor advice in relation to these matters on the Order. Smart Traveller Senator website. Payne. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how Australia is advocating to ensure COVID-19 is not used as a pretext to erode human rights protections? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for that supplementary question. Australia has been consistently maintaining that the COVID-19 pandemic should not be used as a pretext for reducing or removing access to either justice or to consular assistance for people in detention. Indeed, on 24 March last year, I made a statement expressing particular concern for the health, the safety and the well-being of Australians detained overseas during the pandemic in a number of countries. Further, we, as we said in our contribution to the UN Human Rights Council last June, we have condemned the abuse of emergency measures or the imposition of rule by decree to undermine human rights, to subvert democratic or judicial processes, to contribute to disinformation and to target opponents. I know these issues are of significant concern to the Australian community. I want to thank my colleagues uh, from across this chamber for their ongoing engagement. Before I come to you, Senator Watt, I'd like to draw to the attention of senators the presence in the gallery of the Ambassador of Austria to Australia, His Excellency Mr Wolfgang Lucas Strohmeyer. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Parliament, but in particular to the Senate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. I refer to reports that in October 2019, following media inquiries into an alleged assault at Parliament House and in preparation for estimates hearings with the Australian Federal Police, the Minister left Ms Higgins a voicemail message in which she said, and I quote, Daniel has got everything under control. I promise you. Can the Minister advise the Senate what her office had under control? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And can I just say that, like all of us in this chamber, I'm absolutely devastated uh, by, by what Brittany has gone through. Brittany was a valued member of my team for more than a year and a half. Senator Watt, in October 2019, a journalist made a media inquiry that involved brief Brittany and her previous employment. When Brittany discussed this matter with my Chief of Staff and I, she made it very clear that the matter had been dealt with at the time seven months previously. She did not want to discuss the matter and she did not want the matter taken any further. Her focus was on her distress at the journalist's inquiry and ensuring that at all times her own privacy was respected. We respected her wishes for privacy, but I made it very clear to her if she needed anything, she could always come to us. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When did the minister become aware that an alleged rape took place in Minister Reynolds' office in March 2019? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I only recently became aware, in fact, in relation to the alleged rape, it was when a journalist contacted my office for comment. On Friday the 5th of February, Brittany and I spoke and she disclosed details of what had occurred. I told her I wanted her to stay in her role and I would do anything to assist her. 
including relocating her position to Queensland if she wished. I offered to go directly to the AFP with her so that she could provide them with a statement. I said I would sit with her while she did this. She advised me she did not want to pursue it. I also offered to go to the Prime Minister's office with her to raise the issue directly with them. She said no. She advised me that at all times she wanted her privacy respected. I told Brittany that I would reluctantly accept her resignation, but I made it very clear from her. I was there for her, and if she needed anything, all she had to do was ask. Senator White, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I appreciate the minister answering these sensitive questions. How did the minister become aware of the allegation of rape, and with whom did she discuss this issue? What action did she then take? Senator Cash. I believe that I did just answer that question. I've provided you with the date. I discussed it with Brittany, and she advised me of what she wanted. I offered to go directly to the Australian Federal Police with her. I offered to sit down with her while she made a statement. She said she did not want the matter pursued. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr uh, President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin. What is the Morrison government doing to ensure families can give their children the best possible start in life? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator McLaughlin, for what I think is one, probably one of the most important questions you could ask, and that is you know, how do we support our children and make sure that we have well-functioning fa families to ensure that that support is able to be delivered? Uh, because we know that children's, children's development and their growth is so important to what happens to them later in life. Each year, the federal government invests more than $260 million in early interventions and prevention services under families and children's Order. activity and family mental health support services. Order, As Senator a government, Ford. the programs we invest in are about giving children the best possible start in life. Early support for families plays a really important role in making sure that we, we support and prevent families from family breakdown, child neglect, family violence, substance abuse, mental illness and, of course, making sure that the transitioning of young children into school is the highest possible priority uh, for any child. The flow-on effects of this are really very clear. Uh, it builds protections and skills and resilience in our young people so that they can go off uh, into their life and we can avoid intergenerational disadvantage, which is so, so important. And intensive family support programs are one example of the kind of programs that we, we have been targeting. Early intervention programs we know reduce child neglect by working intensively with vulnerable families uh, to improve parenting capabilities. On top of this, obviously, um, our childcare subsidy is a very, very important part to help working families make sure that they are in a position to be able to access early learning opportunities for their children. We are listening to providers and working collaboratively to make sure that we achieve the outcomes for our children that we'd like to see. We know longer term ongoing funding is absolutely critical to future planning. And over the next five years, we will invest more than $1.2 billion. A major task we are now undertaking is the development successor for the national framework Order, protecting Senator Australia's Rustin. children. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, Minister. I think there's a program uh, called Hippie, which is helping prepare children. How is it doing so to improve their learning outcomes? Senator Rustin. Correct. Hmm. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. And yes, I can confirm, Senator Wong, it is a Brotherhood of St. Lawrence program, and it has been amazingly successful. Um, and the most important thing about this program, which goes very much to my heart, and I know it goes to Senator McLaughlin's heart, is that it's, it's focusing on giving the same sort of opportunities to children that live in the regions uh, as those that in, in metropolitan areas, because we want to make sure every child in Australia has access to the opportunity of being able to have the best possible start in life. And in my home state, or our home state, uh, Senator McLaughlin of South Australia, 
We are really proud of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence program, the HIPI program, and what it is achieving on the ground. In fact, last week they launched two amazing reports that show the success of the program um, since it has been in place uh, from the Murray Bridge Centre uh, and delivering programs in the Murray lands. And can I thank the member for Barker, who represented me last week whilst I was in quarantine, unfortunately unable to attend. But the HIPI program recognises the importance in rural communities Order, Senator our young Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Minister, for regional families and children, what specific programs are helping to get kids and their parents ready for school? Senator McLaughlin. Well, oh, sorry, um, Senator for, Rustin. Sorry. Oh, did you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, Mr. President. Well, um, Senator McLaughlin, I mean, this hippie program is an absolute classic example of the kind of program that is absolutely focused on uh, in our regional, rural, uh, regional and rural communities. Um, it is a two-year home-based parenting and early childhood learning program. Uh, and it, what it does is it seeks to support parents and carers of young children uh, aged between four and five so that they can actually um, assist in the, the learning of those children, sort of like the child's first teacher. Uh, but what it is, is about is about intervening early to make sure that we are assisting in the growth and development of young children to make sure that the circumstances of a child do not impede their, uh, their growth or their readiness for school, because we know that young children when they first start school, if they're in a position to be school ready at that time, end up being advanced much more quickly than those children Order, that start Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. A spokesman for the Prime Minister's office said, and I quote, as part of this process, the Prime Minister's office provided support to Minister Reynolds and her office in assessing a breach of the statement of standards of ministerial staff by the other staff member involved in the incident. Can the minister explain what this support from the Prime Minister's office entailed? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, uh, Senator Reynolds has indicated uh, she acted in accordance with advice from ministerial and parliamentary services, uh, advice, in relation, advice in relation to uh, the interpretation uh, of uh, the ministerial code uh, would have been does that advice into the interpretation of the ministerial code. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. When and by whom was this support provided, and why was the support to Mr. Minister Reynolds' office limited to the alleged rapist? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, the uh, the advice. Uh, I would imagine was it provided uh, in the period uh, leading up to the termination of employment. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr President. We know that in March 2019, the Prime Minister's office provided the Minister's office with support. The Prime Minister's fixer was broadly in proximity following the alleged rape and contacted Ms Higgins in the week after Four Corners aired its Inside the Canberra Bubble expose. The minister's then chief of staff had previously worked for and currently works for the prime minister. How can anyone believe the prime minister when he says neither he nor his office knew of the alleged rape until Order. this week? Senator, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I refer to the statements of the prime minister on the matter and ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Um, Senator Birmingham. Senator if, we, Birmingham? if we're going straight to taking note, I think. All right. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Wong? Yes, uh, I write, rise to take note of answers given by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, and I begin by reminding senators of an important statement. Any complaint of violence, verbal, physical or sexual, must always be taken seriously, particularly when, as members of parliament, we must be setting the standard for members of the community. This was a statement made by the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds, in June 2018. Senator Reynolds was expressing what I think we all agree is the standard the community expects. But standards only matter if they are upheld, and that is the test. Because when you claim to have standards that you don't act on, you send a signal. 
The signal you send is this, that there really are no standards, that there are no consequences, not for those who engage in violent acts, not for those who fail to take violent acts seriously. This week, this, the community has not seen the standard it, it expects met at the highest level of the government. Indeed, Senator Reynolds has had the opportunity to lead by example. And I compare her behaviour in this place and her actions previously uh, with the response that we had from Minister Cash today, who was prepared to stand and speak of her offer of support to report this matter to police, her offer to sit with the complainant when doing so, and did not refuse to answer questions in this place about what she did. Instead, Senator Reynolds did not lead by example, and she let a woman down badly, a woman to whom she had a duty of care. Because we know from the courageous public testimony from Ms Higgins this week that she did not feel supported when she told her minister she had been raped by a colleague. Ms Higgins says she was given the choice as to whether she was going to give up on her career. She was told by her superiors she could go to the police, but they also added, we need to know ahead of time, we need to know now. She said she realised this alleged act of sexual violence in the minister's office was being seen as a, quote, political issue, end quote, a political problem. She said she realised my job is on the line. So rather than give up on her dream job, she agreed to be sent to Western Australia where she was just alone. It was really hard. And so where was Senator Reynolds while Ms Higgins was struggling through this? Well. I will use Ms Higgins' own words to describe that. She did sort of actively try and avoid me as much as possible. She didn't like me coming to her event. She didn't like me going to things with her. I think I made her uncomfortable. And Senator Reynolds never again raised with Ms Higgins the alleged rape in her office. In Ms Higgins' words, it was this taboo thing. It was never spoken about again. Eventually, the trauma of the alleged rape and its handing left Ms Higgins feeling she had to leave the workplace. But less than a year before that alleged rape in her office, when some Liberal women parliamentarians said they had been bullied over the Liberal leadership, Senator Reynolds stood in this place and said, some of the behaviour I simply do not recognise and I think has no place in my party. I cannot condone what has happened to some of my colleagues. I do not recognise my party at the moment. Well, I think many Australians will find those words jarring, to say the least, given Senator Reynolds' actions. Anyone who has read the reporting by Samantha Maiden and others about the wrenching ordeal Ms Higgins has gone through, anyone who watched Ms Higgins' interview with Lisa Wilkinson can see in her face and hear in her words the painful consequences. These are the consequences of standards not being upheld. It is not Ms Higgins who has not upheld the standards, but it is Ms Higgins who has paid the consequences for the actions and failures of others. Failures of the Prime Minister, failures of Minister Reynolds, the minister who is responsible for the defence of the nation. So, Mr President, I ask this. What are the consequences for Minister Reynolds? Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. The matters raised here today are, of course, uh, very, very concerning, um, and the, uh, we just can't imagine what uh, Ms Higgins must be going through, um, particularly considering the, um, the fact that these issues are um, being discussed by us all, and they're obviously very private issues for her. Um, but it's, uh, it is very important that things do change. Uh, there is no doubt about that. There is a, a sensitivity, though, that must be observed uh, when we're talking about such issues. And uh, the Prime Minister has said that the government takes these matters very, very seriously, uh, very seriously, that all matters of workplace safety must be taken seriously, and that anyone that works here in this place uh, the work, whether they're working for a member of government or they're just part of the staff uh, that help run uh, this magnificent uh, facility and institution, uh, everyone that comes into this place that works, whether they're here or in electorate offices around the country, that they feel 
that they are working in a safe workplace. Uh, the reports of the alleged sexual assault in 2019 in the Prime Minister's office are deeply distressing. Throughout the entire process, the overriding concern of the government has always been to support Ms Higgins' welfare in whatever way possible. However, it's clear that more needs to be done. And the Prime Minister has announced, uh, both yesterday uh, in answers to questions at a press conference and also uh, in the other place today in answering to questions, uh, the process that uh, he has put in place now to ensure that there is a, a thorough uh, process that has gone through to uh, establish uh, whatever necessary changes are necessary within, uh, within practices and within procedures. Uh, the Prime Minister has asked uh, my good friend and colleague from Western Australia, Celia Hammond, the member for Curtin. Celia was previously uh, Vice-Chancellor of Notre Dame and has had to deal with many situations uh, or the situations in, in their own institution there when she was Vice-Chancellor. Uh, she's very well established and, and someone that is uh, highly respected uh, that is going to be uh, working on a process uh, and she'll be working with MPs uh, in the government to identify ways that standards and expectations and practices can be further improved. Uh, further to that, uh, Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Now, I, I sit on, the, um, uh, on committees and in estimates when uh, uh, Ms Foster uh, presents, and uh, while I don't know her personally, certainly seeing uh, the way that she conducts herself through estimates and through uh, committees, she is uh, an outstanding, outstanding official and, and uh, is thoroughly independent in the way that she works. And I've got no doubt that the role that she will play in undertaking a review uh, and advising the Prime Minister on how processes can be improved, uh, that she will do uh, an outstanding job and will uh, ensure that, uh, that, that every avenue that needs to be explored will be. And I think the Parliament uh, can be confident in that because I know that she is someone that is respected on, on all sides uh, when she undertakes this role. Uh, we understand that this is a matter that is under police investigation, of course, uh, must respect that and, and follow uh, the necessary processes to ensure that that remains uh, um, consistent and that uh, there is no prejudice of that, uh, of that procedure, uh, uh, that undertaking at all. Uh, this is an important step that the government has consistently supported from the outset and, and we will, of course, await the, the outcome of that, uh, of that process. Uh, we, as a country, are dealing with, with many things. We've got, we've got uh, the nation dealing with the, the COVID pandemic uh, and the, the, the ramifications of that. Uh, there was a question asked by Senator Green uh, that uh, asked a question about uh, the impact of JobKeeper and you know, I'd rather be taking our time here now uh, actually talking about the, uh, the, the impact uh, that JobKeeper uh, has had and, and, and the impact that that's had in protecting jobs. In my home state of Western Australia, uh, some 350-odd uh, thousand jobs were saved and protected uh, as a result of that program. I wish I could have actually spent my time today talking about the impact of that, because that is, the, uh, that is what we know in Western Australia has had Thank you, a Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Like so many Australians, I am shocked and appalled by the revelations of the past few days that a young woman, a ministerial staffer, had an, suffered, was traumatised by an alleged rape in the minister's office on the minister's couch. It is shocking to even utter those words in the Australian Parliament in 2021. Feeling sick to my stomach, as I know so many Australians will be, at this news of a woman who, so excited, full of idealism, to come and work in the nation's parliament, to be so discarded, so diminished, so ignored and left so alone after this alleged rape, by the very people she came here to support and promote. That there is still a culture in this country and most disturbingly in this parliament. And it pains me to say, but after story after story of allegations of bullying and sexual assault in the Liberal Party,
that there's a culture clearly that does not respect women. A culture that does not respect women, does not support them, does not believe them. This is completely unacceptable. And I think we need to examine that when the Prime Minister took over from Malcolm Turnbull, he, in response to those allegations of bullying, promised a robust process to ensure a robust process, he announced, to ensure that these allegations would be taken seriously. Another announcement, no delivery. That robust process has not been delivered. The Prime Minister would also have us believe that his office only found out about this alleged horrific crime, a sexual assault, a rape of a staffer in his government that his office apparently only found out last week. It strains credulity, as Malcolm Turnbull said. It strains credulity, the claim of the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. We know that the then Chief of Staff to Linda Reynolds previously worked for Scott Morrison and is now back working for Scott Morrison. We know from Ms. Higgins' own evidence, her own testimony on national television that the Prime Minister's principal private secretary was around the office, involved in the conversations, was helping fix and manage the problem, and that's how Ms. Higgins described it, that she felt like she was a problem to be managed, she felt like she was a political problem to be sent away, that she felt absolutely felt pressure to choose between her job in the Morrison government or seeking justice for her alleged rape. The Prime Minister would have us believe that no one in his office knew about this alleged rape until that last week. The government's own statement last week, after, this week, the government's own statement this week after Ms. Higgins' interview says that the Prime Minister's office was involved back in March of 2018, 2019, assisting Minister Reynolds' office with this particular incident. So which is right, the government's statement or the Prime Minister's statement in the parliament? They can't both be right. This is a Prime Minister who does not like accountability, does not like transparency, and does not deliver. But here he has failed to deliver in the most extraordinary way, letting down every woman, every person who works in this building and letting down women right across Australia. Because this Prime Minister stood up and said it only became clear to him the gravity of the situation when his wife reminded him that he had daughters. You don't have to be a man with daughters to understand that rape is a violent crime, an assault on a woman. It should be taken seriously. She should be supported, and it should be thoroughly investigated. All across Australia, people shook their head in confusion as to how the prime minister of this country could not just respond as a human being. The prime minister, the minister for defense, and the Morrison government continue to compound Brittany's Trauma Thank by you, not Senator getting their story Your time straight. Has expired. Uh, Senator Small, I believe. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And it's, uh, it's tough. It really is tough to confront the circumstances in which uh, you know, this parliament as a whole finds itself in the wake of these revelations. I come to this place as a new senator and a new senator who has previously worked in, in the private sector for quite some time, where rightly the focus is on the health, the safety and the security of all employees, because as Australians we rightly expect the right to be safe in the workplace. From the Prime Minister down, I think the response that we've seen this week from the government has been one aimed at upholding that very fundamental position. So the reports that uh, we've been dealing with relating to uh, the events of 2019 are rightly felt, I think, not only by the people in this place but the people of Australia 
to be deeply distressing. Throughout uh, you know, the entire process, however, I think it is obvious to any fair-minded person that the overriding concern has been to support Ms Higgins, to empower Ms Higgins and, rightfully, to respect the privacy of Ms Higgins. That said, as much as the government's response has uh, thus far been made clear, it is also clear that more is to be done. The Prime Minister has immediately undertaken that we will undertake two separate inquiries aimed at addressing the culture and the environment of work in this place. The fact that Celia Hammond, the member for Curtin, a previous Vice-Chancellor for the University of Notre Dame, who has long and extensive experience of managing these sorts of issues in an institutional setting. Because let's not forget, Madam Deputy President, that these are not partisan political issues, but these are fundamentally human issues. So the fact that we have an inquiry led by the member for Curtin aimed at ensuring that the standards and expectations, the practices and the processes in this place can be improved is something that I think we all take heart from. Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of PM at C, will also be undertaking a review. And this could, it could include referrals to the Finance Department, obviously at arm's length from the partisan politics of the day. In relation to this, the Prime Minister has been clear that we shouldn't presume for the conclusions of those reviews. Indeed, we should be focused on ensuring that the people that work in this place get the support that they need, even in the most of extreme circumstances, as has clearly been the subject of matters exposed this week. In, uh, in, in relation to all aspects of employment, and that includes the terrible events that we've had to confront, there needs to be a change. The Prime Minister has been clear about that. But that will be a matter of good faith inquiry, which the government has committed to. The Prime Minister himself has committed to ensuring that that will be the outcome that this government upholds. In that spirit, we saw the Minister for Defence unreservedly apologise to Ms Higgins. Minister Reynolds was, in fact, the first woman to achieve the rank of brigadier in the Army Reserve. Today, we heard from Minister Cash Minister Cash, despite being a trailblazer in industrial relations legal practice before coming to the Senate, has also been the minister assisting the Prime Minister for Women and the Minister for Women. That was a heartfelt moment that we saw today, frankly, and I think that it goes to the heart of the fact that on this side of the chamber we seek only to uphold the dignity, the privacy and the integrity, the rights of those who come to work in this place with a very legitimate expectation of staying safe. So I think it is clear that the government's response is aimed only uh, at the right things and that we will abstain from any involvement in, in party politics. The reviews undertaken are non-partisan, across parliament and aimed at absolute integrity. We can do better. We must do better. We have been clear about that and I look forward to seeing the outcomes. Thank, thank you, Madam you Deputy Senator President. Small. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'd like to focus my comments uh, today on answers given by Senator Reynolds uh, to questions asked of her uh, by the opposition. And it, those uh, questions go directly to the conduct of this minister. And the conduct of this minister is something that she has to be accountable for in this chamber. And what we have seen over the last three question times is the minister, after being a bit shaky on her feet with the details and not really knowing how to answer on Monday, take the decision, probably under advice by others, to not answer any questions at all and hide behind two defences. One, using Ms Higgins as a defence that Ms Higgins' privacy needs to be respected now that it's inconvenient for the Minister yep. for Defence. And the second one is this notion that there's a 
ongoing police investigation, which to my understanding hasn't been confirmed. I understand there is an open investigation, but the conduct of this minister is a legitimate avenue of questions by members of this place and deserves serious answers by the Minister for Defence. As Senator Wong and Senator Keneally have said, this goes to one of the most senior officers in this place about allegations of a most serious crime occurring in this building to someone who came to work here. And whilst we accept that there are matters that may be subject to potential to police investigation in the future, there are matters which aren't. And those matters go to the conduct of this minister. When did she know? What did she do? How did she respond? And that is what she's avoiding in this place. And that leaves us, it can only leave us, with two explanations. One, that she's not being accurate in her comments to this chamber or deliberately not providing information. Or two, that she was willfully negligent in her role as an employer and as a minister. That is the only explanation we can be left with because we saw Minister Cash provide more information, frankly, in one question than we've had from Senator Reynolds in many questions. Yep. There is absolutely no legal constraint on Senator Reynolds telling this chamber when she became aware, what she did when she became aware, and what steps she took to support Ms Higgins. She tells us she did, but she doesn't explain what she did. It is not unreasonable to put those questions to the Minister for Defence. She is a senior minister in this place and there are very public allegations about a serious crime occurring not only in her suite but in her office on her couch. She cannot hide behind Ms Higgins any longer. She deserves better. So the language she uses about wanting to support Ms Higgins, she can support her by being truthful about what happened. Because by withholding information, what she is, is continuing is the cover-up that has been underway for two years and is the cause of much trauma to Ms Higgins. It's the cover-up often that is as much as, as, as traumatic as other elements of a serious crime like this, because it compounds the trauma. And it means that people she worked for, she looked up to, she, you know, that she expected to be treated properly and she hasn't been. And M Senator Reynolds does nothing to dissuade us from that, from that view, nothing, by not answering. We know, and it's on the public record, Ms. Reynolds, Senator Reynolds, Chief of Staff, knew after Ms Higgins disclosed on the Tuesday, I think the 25th of March 2019, what had happened to her. On the 1st of March, oh, the 1st of April, Senator Reynolds is in a meeting with Ms Higgins. What happened in that six days? What happened? And why can't Senator Reynolds tell us? Because that is the missing link of some of what we have asked, and she is willfully withholding that information from the Senate. She is hiding behind a police investigation, and she's hiding behind Ms Higgins. The Senate deserves better, Ms Higgins deserves better, and frankly, I think the rest of Australia Thank believes you, the Senator Defence Gallagher. Minister of this country should provide that information. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from uh, Minister Rustin to the question I asked on the job seeker payment. Well, here we are, 42 days out from when the job seeker payment goes back to just $40 a day, a rate that the government knows very well is insufficient because they knew there was an urgent need to double it with the coronavirus supplement when the pandemic hit, because they knew that people can't survive or couldn't, when they made that decision, survive on $40 a day. Well, they still can't survive on $40 a day. But when I asked, would the government guarantee that people on the job seeker payment won't go back to $40 a day on the 1st of April, 
She told us some information, but she would not say yes or no. The fact is, is that people cannot survive on $40 a day, that the government is subjecting people to uncertainty about their future, and that is unten untenable. What are people going to do in 42 days' time? Now, the government this week has been floating some balloons about what they might do about our income support system. There's the one about how we might simplify the system, that there's so many supplements that we might simplify the system. And some more cynical of us think that that's an, that will be an excuse to actually not significantly increase the job seeker payment. But then today we hear of the so-called employment insurance scheme, which some proponents would suggest would put 1 per cent on the Medicare levy to pay for it, which would create a two-tiered system in this country, which would cut people at six months which would significantly impact on, long on the long-term unemployed, would significantly impact on young people, would significantly impact particularly on older workers who are constantly suffering from age discrimination and finding it hard to find work. But the underpinning of all this is the government and the minister kept talking about, well, we're trying to encourage people into jobs. Well, at the moment, there's 1.3 million people unemployed. And at the end of January, there was 129,000 jobs. You tell me how 1.3 million people fit into 129,000 jobs. They don't. So the jobs aren't there for people to be able to apply for, for people to be able to find work. And that is still going to be the case on the 31st of March. The jobs won't be there. So it does make me think that the governments floating these various ideas with their favourite media people, oh, we might simplify the system. Oh, there's the unemployment insurance scheme. All muddy the waters when the, when the focus needs to be on the fact that on the 1st of April, an un totally unfortunate day for the government to be then letting people know, perhaps, that they're going back to $40 a day. Why can't the government guarantee that job seekers will not be going back to $40 a day? Because people cannot survive on that. They actually need to be immediately letting those people that are looking for work know that they won't be dropped back to $40 a day, that in fact they will be increasing the job seeker payment and increasing the job seeker payment so that people no longer have to live in poverty. Because the government still don't seem to get, no matter how much evidence is presented, that poverty is a barrier to work. That is what stop also help stops people being able to find work. When you're having to spend all day, if you haven't got a home because you can't afford it because you're living on $40 a day, you're working out where you're going to be sleeping the night, you're homeless, if you can't put food on the table, if you can't meet your medications, if you can't go to the dentist, all those things that people are saying they've been able to afford when the coronavirus supplement came in and doubled JobSeeker. We need to be making sure that Australians and people that are on the, people that are on the job seeker payment aren't living in poverty on $40 a day. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, Minister. Pursuant to contingent notice standing my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without debate or amendment, and I move that the question be now put. So the question is that the order so the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Against? No. Uh, division required? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the eyes have it. Division required. Ring the bells of four minutes. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister, that the motion be put, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'm going to put the motion as moved by the minister. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senators Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Are you happy with one minute? Ring the bells for one minute, please. Lock the doors. So the question is 
that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. The minister, I'm calling the minister. No, no. Oh, I'm now putting the main question, which is that the motion uh, as circulated be agreed to. Those of that, are, beg your pardon. So the question is that the president's motion as put by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. A division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister to be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion is circulated and move that the motion be now put. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No, Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. That concludes that matter, and uh, I'll now give the leaders an opportunity to get, to get back before we start notices of motion to be given for another day. <coughs> Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Oh, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I give notice of my intention to amend business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for 22 February 2021, proposing the disallowance of the ASIC Corporation's credit and superannuation internal dispute resolution instrument 2020 slash 98, so that the notice relates only to part three of the instrument. Thank you, Senator Fiavantiwell. Are there any other notices of motion to be given for another day? No. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Um, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Thorpe, are you seeking the call? No. I call the clerk. Uh, a postponement no notification has been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion 994 for today in the name of Senator Hanson Young to the 23rd of February. Thank you. Um, I remind senators that question may be put on any proposal at the request of 
any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal motions. Oh, Senator Smith, you uh, seek Madam the Deputy President, I'd just like to move a leave of absence for a senator, if I may. Certainly. Is leave the, granted? Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator McMahon for today for personal reasons. Is, uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So uh, we are now, um, now proceeding to the discovery of formal business. Uh, and we'll start with government business number one. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none. Minister. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Industry Research and Development Act 1986 and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill uh, may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Oh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Industry Research and Development Act 1986 and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum uh, relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the uh, second <laughs> reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 11 May 2021. So we'll uh, now move to uh, general business. Notice of motion one that, that, that number 1004, standing in the name of Senator Davey and others. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1004 relating to young regional Australians be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There, uh, Senator Lambie, uh, yes, there is. Yes. Sorry, Senator Davey. I'll now move to um, general business. Notice of motion number 988, standing in the name of Senator Polly. Senator Polly. Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 988 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? Thank you, Senator Polly. I'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 995, standing in the name of Senator Patrick. Uh, uh, Deputy President, I uh, seek leave to amend gen general business notice of motion number 995 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? I believe leave is granted. Senator Thank Patrick. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patrick. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunningham. I seek to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Deputy President. Home Builder is delivering targeted and timely stimulus to help build confidence and momentum in the industry across the country and particularly in regional areas. Home Builder was strongly welcomed by the Australian Forest Products Association when it was announced in June of 2020 and when the government extended the scheme at the end of 2020 to protect the one million Australians employed in the construction industry. Home Builder will keep this pipeline of work flowing into 2021. Uh, the government is committed to supporting the Australian forestry industry through the National Forest Industries Plan announced in 2018, which is supporting the forest industry's aspirational goal of planting one billion trees over the period to 2030. And there is no stronger supporter of Australia's forest industry than this government. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Senator Rice. I'll make a short statement. Is leave granted? Uh, no one's objected to leave being granted. Minister. I, I thought it was a general practice that if you um, 
uh, made a statement. It was, an, it was an indication of your voting intention and that you weren't, weren't calling a division. I was just um, wondering whether Senator Rice's intention was to um, vote against the motion, and that's why she was intending to put a position <coughs> statement. So, is leave granted? No, leave is not granted, Senator Rice. Um, that order, order, order. I remind senators to put questions to the chair. I believe you have been granted leave to speak for one minute. Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, the, the Greens will be supporting this motion because of its focus on the plantation timber sector. Um, and in particular, I'm on the record, and the Greens are on the record, of being strong supporters of the plantation timber sector. And indeed, we need a plan so that we can have adequate plantation timber in Australia to enable the timber industry to transition completely to 100% plantation-based timber. We have seen how native forest logging Order. does not is not the way forward for the timber industry. The Samarias Review, and I'll quote again, considers that the environmental considerations under the Regional Forest Agreement Act are weaker than those imposed elsewhere for matters of national environmental significance and do not align with the assessment of significant impacts on MNES required by the EPBC Act, which has also been confirmed by recent court decisions. So we are very pleased to be supporting this motion in support of the plantation-based timber industry. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that the motion as amended and moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 996, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 996 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? Um, sorry, Senator Urquhart. I'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 999, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 999 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. It's a motion. So the question at Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The cashless debit card uh, evaluation is publicly available on the Department of Social Services website. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 999, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business, notice of motion number 1000, standing in the name of Senator Carr and others. Senator Thank you, Carr. Madam Deputy. I wish to advise the Senate that uh, I'd like to add Senator Sheldon's name to this motion, and I'd ask that general business notice of motion 1000 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. Sorry, Senator Carr. Um, we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 1002, standing in the name of Senators Faruqi and Waters. Thanks. Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I inform the Chamber that Senators uh, McAllister and Senator Bragg will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 1002 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion standing in our names. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 1002, standing in the name of Senators Faruqi, Waters, McAllister and Bragg be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now move to general business, notice of motion number 1003, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie, Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1003 relating to sustainable game hunting be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Sorry, Senator Smith. We'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 971, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 
I ask that general business notice of motion number 971 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. So, oops. <laughs> Senator Gallagher. Can I make a short statement? Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator uh, Gallagher. Labor will be opposing this motion. The statutory requirements for governance of Queensland's local government system is established by the Queensland Parliament and any evidence of corruption and wrongdoing in a Queensland local government should be referred to, that to the Standing Royal Commission into Public Sector Corruption, the Crime and Corruption Commission. Thank you, Senator Gallas. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I too seek leave to make a short statement to explain our voting intention. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thank you very Waters. much. Uh, the Greens won't be supporting this motion either. We have consistently called for greater transparency in funding decisions to stop the pork barrelling and the rorting that's allowed grant, grant funds to be used to buy outcomes and benefit mates. But concerns regarding misuse of funds by uh, local governments should be investigated, but we understand these matters have been looked into and the Council's cleared. Uh, and moreover, the types of matters raised uh, in this motion are not matters for the Senate. Unlike the Commonwealth, Queensland has a Crime and Corruption Commission to investigate integrity issues and any outstanding matters should be referred to them. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 971, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the noes have it. No. I only heard one voice, Senator Roberts. Uh, is it? I'm sorry, no one's standing. I've, I've called the motion. Senator Hanson. Deputy Pre Madam Acting President, <coughs> is the fact that there was a call for it. You said the, um, the nose had it and it was called out the eyes have it. So yes, we are calling for a division. Thank you, Senator Hanson. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 971, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order, lock the doors. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 971, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Hanson as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being four ayes and 47 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I believe, Senators, there may be further divisions. We'll now move to um, general business, notice of motion number 997. Order, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 997 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele John. I move the motion. Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the government is committed to ensuring that people with disability fully engage with this nationally significant inquiry. As part of this commitment, the government is committed to introducing comprehensive con confidentiality protections in the autumn 2021 parliamentary sittings. The government's focus is on progressing these important legislative amendments, and this motion will divert resources from this important work. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 997, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 997 standing in the name of Senator Steele John be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 31 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, I believe Senator Gallagher is seeking the call. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move motions 988, 996. 1000, 1003 and 1004 together and that they be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move the motion and I ask that the question be put separately on each one. Thank you. So the just to repeat that, so Senator Gallagher has moved the motion and be asked that the question be put separately on each one. Senator Minister. And I table statements from the government on motions 988, 996, 999 and 1000. Thank you. So general business notice of motion number 988 standing in the name of uh, Senator Faruqi. I seek leave to table um, a statement from the Greens on motion number 996. Is leave granted? I believe leave is granted, Senator Faruqi. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Rice. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Rice. So the question is that general business, those of motion number 988, standing in the name of Senator Polly, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 996, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business. Business uh, 1000, standing in the name of Senators K 
Carr and others. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business number 1003, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie the, and others. So the question, I move to general business, notice of motion number 1003. So the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say, oh, beg your pardon, Senator Fruki. Table a statement from the Greens on motion 1003. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Faroki. So the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1004. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. That concludes our general business. I'll just uh, allow senators who aren't participating in the further business of the Senate to leave and for others to take their places. We're now going to move to the matter of public importance. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Pratt. Dear Mr President, Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's desire to make it easier for employers to cut workers' pay and conditions. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly and I call Senator Sheldon. Oh, is the motion supported? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask the clerks to reset the clocks and I'll call Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, you know, let's look at what's been happening with wages in this country. Pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Now, pre-pandemic, we've had wage stagnation under this government. Eight years of this government in power and we're seeing year after year of wage stagnation. Of course, now post-COVID, it's very clear whether you look at reports from economists, the Reserve Bank, that we're also facing not only wage stagnation but wage decline. So under eight years, wages stagnate. Over the coming years, wages decline. But don't worry, not everyone's wages have been suppressed because in reports today, Billionaires in the last 12 months, incomes have gone up by 56 per cent. So everybody else out there, your wages have declined, but under this government's watch, billionaires are making more and more and more money. I actually don't begrudge them that. What I begrudge is the fact that government doesn't understand how trickle down doesn't work. You actually have to give workers, working people, People in the communities, small business that negotiates with those billionaires, quite large business that negotiates with those billionaires, you have to give them power to actually get a share of the wealth, not leave it into that small clique which they support. The system that they support and they've generated is to say that billionaires are OK and the rest of us aren't. And of course, then you go to what the government's doing in the latest drive for a pay cut, scrutiny of enterprise agreements. Well, let's get rid of that. Let's make sure that enterprise agreements that don't meet standards 
Let's make sure that the Commission is rushed and required to enter and look at and review agreements before they have an appropriate time to properly review, because that's what they've proposed. But they've actually gone a step further. They've said that appropriate parties, and such as unions, can't make applications to appropriately, as previously been done, to criticise or highlight those dodgy deals. Now, what happens with those dodgy deals when they go through? Not only are workers abused, but also it destabilises markets. It means that those companies who are doing the right thing are destabilised by the people who are getting away with theft. That's legalised theft. But there's nothing effective about wage theft, and the latest proposals are a small uh, shadow of what's needed. But what they want to do is actually legalise it. And they want to put bad employees in the front seat and put good employees down on the ground. They want to make sure that there is a disproportionate and destabilising effect in the labour market. Because what are they about? Wage decline. Wage decline year after year, and their record proves it. Of course, now they want to also have, you know, they wanted to have non-monetary benefits. Now they want to expand the non-monetary benefits, which were originally put in acts so that people had protections of the Industrial Relations Commission for benefits they received in negotiated agreements and elsewhere. It wasn't below the NES. But what they propose is now that McDonald's application, that rather than paying you wage increases, you can have wage cuts based on getting a packet of chips, fries. You know what's the saying? You know what do they say when you go into McDonald's? In this case, here's your pay cuts, and do you want fries with that? Well, this government's now making it legal for the company store to operate. That was something that was thrown out in the early 1900s in this country and progressively abolished effectively throughout the 1900s, even further. But this government wants to go back to it. They want to go back to it because they just can't help themselves. They have to say, here's a pandemic, here's a crisis, and who do we really need to do over? Those people have the chance, the opportunity, the desire to express their voice collectively. And of course, I'll have to finish on the gig economy. Bajal Paul, four others that were killed as a result of being the gig economy. Tens of thousands of people in the gig economy. And what does this government do? No regulations to support them, to protect them or give them rights. In actual fact, if you look at a number of their people on the cross bench, on the, on the back bench, they're fully thank supporting you, those people being you, exploited. Senator. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We've just heard another divisive old class war warrior rhetoric contribution, rhetorical contribution to the Senate. Let's all remember that the workplace relations framework in this country is under the Fair Work Act, heralded by the Australian Labor Party, introduced by the Australian Labor Party. And so that independent umpire that sets wages and conditions is now being slagged off by the Australian Labor Party, the very creator of the system. Now, to my friends opposite, you can't have it both ways. You cannot say that we have championed the cause of workers and brought to you the fair work regime and, on the other hand, somehow condemn the government for the decisions that are allowed to go through the Fair Work Commission. Now, look. A fair day's pay for a day, fair day's work is a biblical injunction which is embedded at the very heart of coalition policy in this area. No Liberal, no National wants to see workers' pay cut. Instead, what we seek to do is pursue policies to not only grow jobs but also wages. And that is why, after a decade of the Howard government, we saw unemployment with a three in front of it, unheard of for a long, long time and since, and might I add, real wages growing without impacting on inflation. 
That is what good sound economic management delivers. And why do we pursue good sound economic management? Because of the social dividend that it delivers for the men and women of Australia. So, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, it takes the economic illiteracy of the Labor Party to have ripped apart those credentials that the Howard government left. And here we are today grappling with a global pandemic seeking to restore the Australian economy, Australian jobs and Australian opportunities. And we've got the shamelessness of Labor. And indeed, Senator Sheldon reminded us of dodgy deals. And it triggered something in my mind. Who actually sought enterprise agreements to see workers in the mushroom sector worse off? Workers in the cleaning sector worse off? Workers in the building sector worse off? None other than the now Member of Parliament, but former Secretary of the Australian Workers Union, Mr Bill Shorten. Let's be very, very clear. Three areas where workers were underpaid in circumstances where the agreement was signed off by the Australian Workers Union whilst Mr Shorten was in control. And let's be very clear. There are certain allegations that in relation to those deals there were quid pro quos which allowed certain benefits to flow to the member for Maribyrnong. That remains to be seen. But let's be very clear. Why are the Labor Party bringing this up today and do it from time to time? To try to create a smokescreen to distract attention from their real policy, which is to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisations Commission. And why are they so manic about it? Because the Registered Organisations Commission has an active investigation going on as we speak into the activities of the Australian Workers' Union while Mr Shorten was the secretary of it. The Australian Workers' Union documents that have now been filed indicate over $1 million worth of Australian Workers' Union funds have been expended in fruitless and vexatious litigation against the Registered Organisations Commission. These people opposite that cry crocodile tears for workers have no compunction about signing up deals that rips off workers and then rip off their union funds as well. And so why is it that the Australian Workers Union is so spending so much money in protecting Mr Shorten? Because the Australian Workers Union haven't done that to another secretary of the Australian Workers Union, namely one Caesar Mellon, who is in the Victorian Parliament. And that issue has seen a $148,000 fine being imposed on the Australian Workers Union. Of what do I speak? The falsely enrolling of various bogus members without their knowledge or consent, including workers of companies with whom the AWU had enterprise agreements. And most creatively, jockeys who were members of the Australian Jockeys Association and netballers who were members of the Australian Netballers Association. And when these allegations came to the fore, what did the Australian Workers Union do? They raised the white flag. They did not seek to defend. They did not seek to take this matter to court. It begs the question why, given what they did in relation to Mr Shorten. And I suppose it begs this question. If it had gone to court, if it had gone to trial, Mr Mellon may have been asked a question such as, how long had these rorts been going on? And whose idea was it in the first place? In the case of the netballers and jockeys wrought, the answer to these questions seemed quite clear. It was on the 13th of February 2005, the Australian Workers' Union issued a media release entitled Netball Stars Join the AWU, which included the following boast. 
The AWU's experience in representing other elite sports people, such as horse racing jockeys, will help us to better represent the interests of some of the most talented women in Australian sport. Do you know who made that boast? None other than the current member for Maribyrnong. There he was on the public record boasting about these rorted numbers being introduced into the Australian Workers' Union, which in turn, of course, had the impact of being able to impact Labor Party votes and Labor Party pre-selections. So there are a number of issues. Right, Senator, uh, you're raising a point of order. It's a chamber. Is sailing very close to the wind in the way that he is talking about the member for Maribyrnong, and I'd ask him to uh, cease reflecting on a member from the other place. Um, on the point of order, I will remind you, uh, Senator uh, Abetz, to uh, be mindful of the way that we speak about people in that other chamber, and I invite you to continue your remarks. I can understand the sensitivity of those opposite to the facts that I've laid out exceptionally carefully. There is no doubt that Mr Mellum and the Australian Workers' Union provided to the court an agreed statement of facts agreeing that the figures that they had presented were rorted. They were falsified. People's names had been put on the record without their knowledge, courtesy of the enterprise agreements and cooperation from their employers. And the boast that I just read out, which seems to have excited the um, interjection, was on the public record on the 13th of February 2005, which can be easily shown uh, to be correct. So I understand the sensitivity of the Australian Labor Party, and when these matters, these dodgy deals, these matters are fully highlighted, one gets to see what really motivates the Australian Labor Party in this. Is there any Australian who genuinely believes that anybody in this place would want to see Australian workers paid less? Of course there isn't. Each and every one of us is dedicated, one would hope, to the service of the Australian people and wanting the very best for them. We know on this side, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the opportunity of employment enhances somebody's self-esteem, their social interaction, their physical health, their mental health. The social good of employment is there for all to be seen. And that is why it's so important that any policy initiative is designed to ensure that more of our fellow Australians can get onto the ladder of opportunity, which is employment the capacity to be self-reliant, the self-esteem of knowing that you can look after yourself and your fellow family members of the same household. These are the good things that come out of employment. That is why we, on this side, we as a government, so unrelentingly pursue not only every single employment opportunity, but also good wages and outcomes, always as determined by the independent umpire who is the Fair Work Commission, established by none other than the Australian Labor Party. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This government is full of the ideological children of John Howard. A fundamental project of the Liberal and National Parties is shifting the balance of power from workers to capital. At every turn, they will privilege profits of corporations, of billionaires and rent seekers over the well-being of people and communities. Their policy agenda is the result of laziness, malice and an irrational obsession with free markets and competition. Decades of market-led policy, labour market deregulation and union busting have diminished the quality of work for so many people. It has turbocharged inequality and worsened the degradation of our environment. This government's version of common sense is that what's good for big business is good for the community. They have no real abiding belief in the value of meaningful work, social labor, or care. 
no real commitment to the rights of workers to be safe, to be happy and respected at work, to be able to work and play and flourish. The only kind of flexibility that this government is interested in is supporting the flexibility of employers to hire and fire workers. Inevitably, favoring flexibility of, for businesses will mean precarity and powerlessness for workers. COVID-19 has shown us just how dangerous precarious employment can be for workers and for society. That the government is trying to use this crisis to further undermine workplace rights, uh, workers' pay and conditions in favor of businesses is cynical, it's despicable, and is, it is staggeringly irresponsible. They've been wanting to do this for a long, long time. With regards to the anti-worker IR omnibus bill, just removing the appalling measure to suspend the boot won't cut it. The bill will still remain appalling. It will still make it harder for most casuals to convert to permanent work. It still effectively casualizes part-time workers without any increases in entitlements. It still locks workers and unions out of enterprise bargaining. It needs to be scrapped. Maybe workers' wages and conditions are abstract concepts to this government. Maybe they are so out of touch with working people that they don't actually know how precarity and poverty feel. I've lost count of the numbers, number of times I have sat right here in this chamber and watched members of the government giggle and gossip as they vote to plunge people into poverty, take away their rights and dignity and entrench and worsen inequalities. Workers deserve so much more than the cold, callous disregard of the Liberals and Nationals. Senator Polly. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Everything that this Liberal government does and has done since I came to office in 2013 is to weaken unions and drive wages down. That's the reality of it. No matter what other senators from that side come into this chamber and say, that's exactly what they do. When they took away penalty rates to people in hospitality and retail and they promised they'd create job after job after job, how many jobs were created? None. None at all. That is actually driving down wages. Don't come into this chamber and try and rewrite history. We know that it's in your DNA. You want to weaken unions, you don't want workers to have representation, and you have no interest in ensuring that wages growth will increase. We have seen stagnant wages year after year under your watch while you're in government. And we know that there's some 13 million Australians that rely on good government and good working conditions. What we also know in this country is the attack that you are now applying and trying to get through this place will only disadvantage some of the lowest paid workers in this country. If you look at aged care, we know they're some of the most underpaid employees in this country. They don't have the respect that they deserve working to look after the most vulnerable people in this community. And we know with these changes, they will lose $12,000 per year. An aged care worker, that's what your agenda is. That is so wrong. And we on this side will year after year, day after day, week after week, we will defend workers' rights and we will do everything that we can to ensure that their pay and conditions are preserved. We don't want to see uh, penalty rates taken away. We don't want to see changes to part-time workers because if you do not have a full-time job or a job that has legitimacy so that you can go and apply for a bank loan, you're not helping the economy. You are stifling people's opportunities to buy their own home. The day-to-day the -day stress that is placed on so many workers in this country with the casualisation and the underemployment in this country is abuse of these workers. That's not doing anything um, to actually uh, build our economy. If you want to come out of this pandemic from uh, COVID-19 and you want to uh, rebuild the economy, you want to get people back working, well, that's not the way to go about it. It's certainly not the way to go about it. But what we've seen time and time again is an attack on the most vulnerable, 
workers. We know many of those, whether you're talking about hospitality, whether you're talking about uh, retail, whether you're talking about aged care, disability, the majority of those workers are women. So again, you're hitting women again and again and again. You don't want to increase the superannuation um, for Australian workers. You don't want to do that. And once again, who are those in our community that are going to be hardest hit? A, you want to change and lower the wages for those sectors that I've outlined already, which means women, again, are going to be the most disadvantaged, uh, not only in their take-home pay and the amount of hours that they're going to have to work, but just as importantly, you're attacking superannuation. And we know already women in this country don't have, the majority of them do not have enough money to retire on. That's your legacy. That's the Liberals' legacy. That's the DNA of the Liberal government, the Liberal coalition. That's what they are about. Now, if you want to build a strong economy, you want to build uh, a strong, highly skilled workforce, then you need to not attack workers and try and take money away from them. You should be investing in TAFE, for instance, investing so we can skill up Australian workers, so people can go and retrain when there's changes in their work um, environment. But what we see time and time again is rhetoric by those opposite coming in here and they want to drag up and they want to vilify unions when, in fact, every Australian worker needs to be a member of a unit, union and there's no more important time than right now because you need their protection. Thank you, Senator Polly. I call Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm glad Senator Polly raises the DNA of the Morrison government because in our DNA is jobs and more of them for all Australians. Our track record speaks to that, with 1.84 million new placements through the Job Active program since its inception in 2015. But the Morrison government will not rest on its laurels, Senators, and indeed we look at the industrial relations bill before this place now that improves enterprise agreements, delivering on average 40 per cent more into the pockets of hard-working Australians, offers the opportunity to grow jobs, increases freedom and flexibility within the labour market and offers, offers new protections for employees in this place. Why then? Why don't Australians already enjoy those benefits? It is because the Labor Party chooses to obstruct more money in the pockets of hard-working Australians. On the flexibility and freedoms afforded to those in the gig economy, the Labor Party are most focused on racing to the bottom as usual and talking about a minimum wage. The Victorian Labor government's inquiry into the gig economy found, on average, the mean wage of a gig economy worker at $32.16, which represents a 62 per cent increase on the Australian minimum wage. Ladies and gentlemen, senators, the Labor Party would rather that Australians not enjoy 62 per cent extra earning capacity because of their ideological attachment to standing between Australians and employers. 30 per cent of part-time workers in, retail, in the retail industry and 40 per cent of part-time workers in the accommodation and food services sectors can work extra hours under the modifications and reforms contemplated by the IR, IR Omnibus Bill. Instead, we see the Labor Party saying no. We've offered a clear and consistent pathway to convert casual employment to full-time employment for the first time. But by blocking this legislation, Labor would rather have casual workers remain casual, even if they'd prefer permanency. In opposing these changes, Labor has decided that it is against casual employees and it would rather keep those casual, uh, uh, keep those casual employees as collateral damage in their ongoing class warfare in this country. So much for Labor being on your side. If you're not a casual who wants permanent work, they will leave you aside. In fact, when we talk about cutting workers' pay and conditions in this place, at the moment, the Labor Party are proposing to cut workers' pay and conditions. Because we've seen 
From the thought bubble from the Leader of the Opposition last week, a $20 billion a year business tax and a cut for casuals equal to, on average, $153 a week. That's right. They would take $153 a week out of your pocket and impose a $20 billion a year tax on Australian business. So, you know, we've seen this from the ACTU. Which side of this chamber, which side of this chamber proposes to cut taxes, it has to cut workers' pay? It is those opposite. When Labor vote against this bill, they are also voting against increased criminal penalties for wage theft. Now, those who have experienced wage theft or underpayment will be better protected under the reforms proposed by this government. You might have thought that it would be uncontroversial, but those opposite are too busy playing politics with this bill to the detriment of hard-working Australians. The tougher civil and new criminal penalties to stamp out wage theft are simply casualties of Labor's class war collateral damage like the casual workers that they would sooner deny uh, the opportunity of permanent employment. Indeed, a quicker way to recover underpayments where they occur is also included in this bill. Instead, Labor have said, by blocking this bill, that they don't want it easier to recover wages for those exploited workers in Australia. So much for the Labor Party being on your side. In this bill, uh, enterprise agreements are, 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 are said to be more easily implemented, with tighter approval timeframes, and will deliver 40 per cent, on average, higher wages into the pockets of Australians compared to award, and yet the Labor Party stand in their way. When we consider 2020, we should be doing everything in our power to reduce the red tape to reduce the restrictions, to reduce the amount of time between employees lawfully reaching an agreement with an employer and the increasing amounts of money in their pay packets. Instead, because of the prevarication of the Labor Party, we see nothing. Instead, what we have seen is a proposal for portable entitlements. And it should be no surprise to us that Labor has trotted this out. It's an attractive idea on first glance. But when we stop, and we take stock of how that would actually be implemented, we see examples already written large in the Australian economy of the Labor Party doing dodgy deals, as Senator Sheldon referred to, to join forces, take money from hard-working Australians and instead put them away in secretive slush funds that donate money from the unions to the ALP. The idea that Australians be empowered to control the fruits of their own labour take more of the hard-earned money that they earn for themselves and their families is what motivates us. And yet those opposite, instead, under the union control that they, they seem unable to step from, uh, instead happily take, in the case of IncoLink in Victoria, uh, money from working Australians and instead donate $8.5 million back to the CFMEU and take $10 million off Australian workers and give it away in wages in a jobs for the boys scandal that, frankly, Australians should be appalled about. You tell me, who cares about the wellbeing of working Australians and their pay and conditions? It seems to be the government, the Morrison government, with a track record of being focused on job opportunities and job creation, and instead the Morrison government finds itself unable to deliver for those hard-working Australians because of those opposite. Now, you might think that you know, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this loss of, of workers' entitlements would be well known, but far less well known is the fact that even having taken money from those uh, hard-working Australians and putting it into a slush fund under the guise of them being entitlements, portable entitlements, instead the payment of those entitlements, far from being governed by law, is in fact at, and I quote, the absolute discretion of the trustee. And when determining the amount uh, and period of, of the entitlement that the worker shall receive, the decision of the trustee is, and I quote, final, and the worker has no right of appeal. The silence is deafening from the Labor Party when it comes to defending themselves on this matter. In fact, we shouldn't expect anything less from the CFMEU 
Funded by money stolen from workers in this way, building unions break the law more than anyone. Responsible in 90 per cent of federal court cases for coercion, right of entry and freedom of association breaches, they are 20 times more likely than all other unions combined to break the law. Indeed, the CFMEU secretary at the time said, if you played by the law, you will never win. So it is no wonder that the Labor Party, beholden to these union thugs, has chosen to stand in the way of a proposal to, to offer Australians new opportunities to convert casual employment to full-time employment, to offer flexibility to accommodate uh, family life, caring responsibilities, sport, education and everything else that makes up modern life. And instead, they obstinately stick to their, uh, their union domination uh, in obstructing the government from implementing these important reforms. I thank you. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator, we're oh, going to toss a coin here. No, Senator Patrick. Sorry, sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise tonight, to, this afternoon to make a, a quick contri contribution, and I just want to draw Senator's attentions to two graphs that I think uh, are important. Uh, the first of those is uh, the ASX 200. It's currently sitting at about uh, 6,885 points uh, as, at close today, but it's actually very close to where it was uh, in February last year, just prior to COVID, when it was in the low 7,000s. So that's one graph where we see companies doing well, we see wealth, uh, we see prosperity in a particular camp. And I'm going to look at another graph, which is the Australian Bureau of Statistics Wage Price Index. And that uh, shows a, a graph that goes in the opposite direction, that uh, sees uh, wa you know, wage growth co uh, has collapsed over the last decade. And you know, that is concerning because whilst I, I uh, absolutely respect the idea that those who go into business and take a risk, uh, those that invest, uh, should get the right uh, should get a rightful return. Um, it's got to be proportioned. It's it's got to be reasonable. Wealth and prosperity needs to be shared by all of those involved in economic activity. And so these two graphs uh, cause me great trouble. You know, I see uh, uh, I see workers paying tax. Um, I see companies not paying tax. And these are sorts of differences that I think we need to look at very, very closely. Uh, lot of, lots and lots of focus, uh, traditional battlegrounds for Labor and Liberal in relation to IR. Um, I, I get that there is absolutely a need to protect uh, workers' salaries and to look for an increase. Uh, but uh, as I look at this next uh, IR bill, I'll be looking at it through the lens of prosperity Senator for all. Patrick, your time has expired. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. And well, 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 after seven years of government, uh, after more than seven years of being in power, um, they are absolutely out of ideas to take this country forward. And all we've seen in this debate from those oppos opposite are some bizarre conspiracy theories. I don't think there's any other way you could describe it as that. Um, some old attacks from Senator Abetz, but he does like the old attack. Um, we know that he's always good for that, and we've seen him trot him out uh, over the last couple of years. But what we actually haven't seen from this government is no plan to actually take the country forward. No plan to help workers and their families get ahead. No plan to offer those workers and their families a better future, something to look forward to. And we know that they offered none of that before the pandemic. And since the pandemic hit, as Australians are actually looking for that vision, they actually want to see a better future, we see nothing from this government but attacks on workers and their conditions. And it is absolutely a challenge for working people at the moment. Uh, we know that they do want to be optimistic about what the future looks like, but the government are incapable of actually having a vision. They didn't have one before the pandemic and they don't have one now as a way to take the country forward. So stagnant have the conditions been for working Australians since this government was elected that they've actually given up trying to look for that better deal, uh, look for that optimism to give them that solution. No, the only thing they come up with is that tired old attack on workers and their conditions uh, and they trot it out uh, trying to appeal to uh, crossbenchers to back them in that mission. 
And the concerning thing for Australians is that the government have been in power for so long that they continue to fall back on this trick, that this is the only thing they've got. Um, we see it with working conditions. We see it with the role that they're trying to play at the moment, undermining superannuation and deny working Australians dignity in retirement. But let's actually consider what Australians are confronting at the moment. And according to the OECD, and uh, we know those opposite actually have a lot of faith in the OECD at the moment. Um, I'm sure that they're uh, all keeping a close eye on what is going on there. But according to the OECD, since the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government was elected in 2013, real wages in Australia have declined by 0.7 per cent. This is actually their record. Real wages in Australia have declined by 0.7 per cent. And for wage growth in 2019, Australia was third last out of 35 OECD countries. So this is the record of the government uh, that been in power since 2013 that they have delivered for Australian workers. And this is before the pandemic has hit. So this was after six years in government, this is what the conditions that they left for working people in Australia. Um, real wage growth had declined by 0 0.7. And in 2019, we were third last out of 35 OECD countries. And we know the underutilisation rate is at 15%, um, well above pre-pandemic levels, and 2.1 million Australians who are unemployed or looking for more work. Uh, in Queensland, there is 16% underutilisation, uh, 240,000 people are underemployed, and 209,000 people are unemployed. So when you look around the country, when you look at what's happening in Queensland, there is such a raw deal for workers. Uh, and we know that the Liberals and Nationals have dropped uh, their um, pursuit of the better off overall test. But they only did that because it wouldn't pass the parliament. And you can see in even what the Attorney General, the minister responsible, has said since when he announced that he wouldn't pursue it, is that he called those changes sensible and proportionate. So this is the minister that is pursuing these changes, or was pursuing these changes, still saying that these changes are sensible and proportionate. So what the Australian working people need to know and what their families need to know is that this government will not stop their pursuit of working people and their conditions. Uh, we know it becomes an ideological obsession for them, uh, but they actually have no plan that is going to offer those workers uh, a better deal. Uh, no plan that is going to give those people something to look forward to, something to look over the horizon, not actually tougher conditions when it comes to working people uh, and the way they are dealt with at work. So it is now, after seven years, uh, too late for this government to actually offer up that vision for the Australian people. It's really important that Labor start to identify that, and we saw elements of that in Queensland last week where Federal Labor leader Anthony Albanese started to outline some of his vision for working people in Australia and that is important. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you. Too many times I hear Labor take a very ordinary position, but today's statement is a new low. This Labor MPI demonstrates the counterproductive, anti-business, anti-family and, in fact, anti-employee position. The politics of Labor is class war, and in this war, the casualties are the very people that they are purporting to stand for. The worker who desires the flexibility to earn as much as possible while balancing the commitments to family, to school hours, to events. They should not be locked into some draconian system that forces them and their employer into an unfavourable work plan, dreamed up by a union hack convinced a class war is not only imminent but required. The world is changing and the unions are struggling to keep up. A couple of months ago, I heard evidence at an inquiry uh, where a union told me that they did, not, uh, they did not believe that employees would want to give up uh, work, they did not want to work from home and in fact had not asked them that. And yet we know that since the pandemic, the world has changed very rapidly indeed. This position demonstrates the fantasy world that Labor lives in, where jobs are magically created, their lack of understanding of what it means to mortgage your home, to work all hours, to build a business, carefully budgeting 
to add another staff member, to deal with the paperwork, the changing awards, the complexity of payments. All they want to talk about is stolen wages. And I can tell you, as one of the people who has employed the 60 per cent of jobs in Australia as a small business operator, that this is not a responsibility that is taken lightly. The res relationship that you have with your staff is so important. This is a position that Labor has taken that can only be reached by people who've never employed someone else, who've never sweated over paying creditors and wages and hopefully leaving something in the tin for your family. And it is a position based on a lie. My experience was quite the reverse. When I came into that business, I offered casual workers permanent roles. And while some were pleased to take that on, there were others who absolutely did not. They enjoyed the uh, additional 25% um, for a payment in lieu of uh, holiday pay and sick leave. They like the flexibility of being able to manage their family life. They like to be able to start at hours that suited them and me. And this belief that employers are just out to exploit workers and stamp on the throat of the little guy is rooted in the dark ages. It bears no relevance to today. They don't understand that there is already a condition in place that allows casuals to be offered permanency and, in fact, that converts casuals to permanency. But many casuals do not want that. They want the flexibility of home life and work. If we mandate that casuals must become permanent or if we mandate that employers must alter the working hours of casual people every week in order to comply with that requirement, how is that good for employees? How is that good for families? It is just, again, a lack of understanding of what it is like in the world of small business. We should be protecting those people who want more flexible working arrangements and who want to be able to negotiate with their employer wages and conditions that are mutually beneficial. The Coalition's industrial relations reforms achieve balance it makes it easier for workers and employers to get the job done with minimal fuss, less red tape and more flexibility. And again, I cannot uh, express enough the role of the small business person in Australia who is employing anywhere from one to a hundred additional people who create jobs not from some magical fairy dust, as Labor would have you believe. They, they create these jobs out of blood and sweat and sacrifice from their families. So I want to welcome Labor and the unions to join the 21st century, to listen to what workers actually want, instead of simply channelling Karl Marx to dictate old-fashioned employment practices. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In serving the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that Senator Pratt is fixated on a problem, not the solution. Yesterday, the government took the first step in recognising One Nation's legitimate concerns for employees and employers. It booted out the boot. Australians need and deserve genuine improvement to our broken industrial relations system. Firstly, casual workers are being abused and exploited. Secondly, the needs of small business have been ignored by everyone except One Nation. The new bill's definition of casual is complex. It suggests that the employer's intention expressed at the time of commencement of employment is the only factor. It's not. The definition also refers to no firm advance commitment. Yet many casuals have a firm advance commitment and many have a regular pattern of hours because it suits both the worker and the business. My second concern is with the proposed right to conversion. It burdens many small businesses and puts the casual loading at risk for workers who enjoy the benefit of a casual loading. The answer is to reduce red tape and complexity for small business and likewise to widen the window of opportunity for workers to apply for conversion. My third and overriding concern is offsetting claims, section 545A. I do not support double dipping on entitlements, yet I will fight to protect workers' legal and moral entitlements, just as I have done relentlessly in the Hunter Valley for 20 months. 
Recently, the CFMEU Mining Division agreed that their union has ignored casuals for many years, and its national legal director, Mr Bukarika, had the courage and integrity to acknowledge that the Hunter Valley Division has caused and enabled exploitation of casual workers. Labor's Joel Fitzgibbon also ignored abused casuals in the Hunter and hidden their core problems. One Nation stands for the ignored workers that Labor ignores. We're ready to work together with the government to improve this bill for employers and for employees and with all parties. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. I am pleased to speak on today's matter of public importance because it represents one of the most critical issues currently before this parliament, an issue of the utmost importance to many millions of Australian wage earners and indeed for the broader Australian economy. Because it is, un it is clear that no matter the circumstances in the economy, the Morrison Liberal government is hell-bent on making it easier to cut workers' pay and conditions. This will, of course, come as no surprise to hard-working, wage-earning Australians. But it certainly does seem a strange way to try and rebuild our economy and improve the lives of working Australians. Strange because pretty much every economic commentator, including the Reserve Bank, have said that lifting stagnant wage growth poses one of the most significant challenges to Australia's short, medium and long-term economic success. Strange because wages, already flatlining, already struggling for many years under this government, have really taken a tumble in the past year. In fact, just yesterday, the latest weekly payroll figures from the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, showed that since the 14th of March last year, wages for men in my state of Tasmania have fallen 5.6 per cent, fallen by more than 5 per cent, a real cut to the take-home pay of tens of thousands of working people and their families. And Mr Morrison and his Liberal government want to see those pay packets cut further. It's ideological, not to mention economic lunacy, and it's been, no it's been noticed in the community. Just today, in the Hobart Mercury, eminent Tasmanian barrister Fabiano Cagilosi wrote, after analysing the Morrison government's industrial relations omnibus bill, said, and I quote, the bill seeks to replicate the Howard government's work choices legislation by unbalancing the beneficial value of the economy against working Australians. The omnibus bill amounts to an attempt to, at capitalising on COVID-19 disruption to wreak lasting change on the industrial relations landscape. If passed into law, the overall effect will be a f workforce reduced to the level of mere exploitable resource for big business. The omnibus bill repudiates the core cons cons constitutional role of the federal government to make law for the com common good." End quote. Apt descriptions of the government's bill and their intent indeed. In fact, just yesterday, the Morrison government again confirmed it still wants to cut workers' take-home pay. The Attorney-General and the Prime Minister were quite clear. They are only prepared to remove from their bill their plan to scrap the better off overall test because they do not have the votes in this place to secure passage. They are not prepared to drop that component because they have suddenly realised that it is unfair. They are not to prepared to drop it because they have accepted that enabling the further erosion of the pay of hard-working Australians is not in the national economic interest. No, they just can't get it through the Senate. In fact, in his statement yesterday, the Attorney-General stated he still believed the changes to the boot is, and I quote, sensible and proportionate. Sensible and proportionate. Not quite the description I would use for a change that would remove the safety net for workers and give employers significantly more power to cut pay and reduce entitlements. But we know that they are merely retreating on this occasion for the sake of political expediency, because they know that the remaining components of their omnibus bill will continue to work towards their aim of making it easier to cut workers' take-home pay. And we know that, given the opportunity, they will rapidly bring back changes proposed to boot. Labor has always set a very simple test when it comes to any changes to industrial relations. We would support the legislation if it delivered secure jobs with decent pay. The government's legislation 
still fails that test. Labor has always made it clear that while the boot change was the most egregious attack on jo job security and workers' pay in the, in the government's bill, it certainly was not the only one. The new laws will continue to make it easier for businesses to employ people as casuals, even when they work like permanent workers. This will only result in, in more insecure work. And insecure work over time always means lower pay and fewer conditions. What is crystal clear is that the Morrison government is not on the side of working Senator families Brown, and they never your deliver. Time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Greens could not agree more with this motion. But it's clear that not only does the government want to allow employers to cut wages, it, that is the government, is actually leading the charge to suppress wages in this country. One of the biggest levers the government has to change wages across our society and across our economy is its setting of public sector wages. And they are using that lever ruthlessly to depress wages as quickly as they can. Public sector wage caps have helped ensure that wage growth for private sector workers has been flat for years. There has been no pressure on private employers to lift wages. And the government's official policy is, and I'll quote from government documents, that Commonwealth public sector wage rises can no longer exceed wage rises in the private sector. This policy locks in low wages and low wage growth for all workers in the country, public and private sector workers. By increasing wages to public sector employees, the private sector would have to follow and most workers would end up better off. But that's not what this government has chosen to do. We know that big businesses are pocketing more and more of their profits and their servants in the Liberal Party want to keep it that way. And one of the ways they are doing that is by gutting protections in the already weak Fair Work Act. Now, make no mistake, there is a growing gap between the rich and the poor in this country, and the Liberals are working to widen that gap at every opportunity. Colleagues, the combined wealth of Australia's billionaires rose by more than 50 per cent in the last 12 months in the middle of a global pandemic, turbocharging the gap between the super wealthy and the not so well off in Australia, and that gap is still growing. Because while the billionaires get ever more obscenely rich, wage growth is flatlining and millions of Australians remain unemployed or underemployed. The Liberals want to keep wages low and they want to make sure house prices keep soaring. And that's all well and good if you're a wealthy landowner or the CEO of a major corporation or a billionaire, but if you're a renter and a worker, you're left to fight for the scraps. And if you're currently out of work or underemployed, you've been completely left high and dry by this <coughs> government. We need to make sure that income supports rise in this country, and we need to make sure that billionaires and the big corporations, particularly the big polluting fossil fuel corporations, pay their fair share of tax so we can fund quality Senator public King, services you, in Senator Australia. King. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this week the Morrison government has confirmed two things. One, they can't get their nasty plan to get rid of the better off overall test through this parliament. And two, they are still determined to cut your pay. In the words of Christine, a cleaner and united workers' union member, there will always be bad bosses. We do not need to make it easier for them to cut wages and change the limited working conditions we currently have. Christine, she is one of my heroes this week because she had the courage to speak out publicly about the government's plan to cut workers' pay. She, along with thousands of Australian workers, have sent a strong message to all of us in this place. And that message is to completely reject the government's nasty industrial relations bill. And along with Christine, I also want to recognise the courage of Karen today. Karen is the registered nurse and ANMF member who came to testify at public hearings on the government's plan. 
despite turning up to the hearings on time, prepared and ready, Karen was denied the opportunity to speak, denied the opportunity to tell her story. So I will tell her story here. This is what she wants to tell Scott Morrison and everyone in this place. We are the backbone and the forefront of our healthcare system. We are the ones who know our patients. We are the ones who keep our patients comfortable and safe. We are the ones that reassure our patients and their families. We are the ones that care for them at night, all night, when most other people are tucked up in bed. We are the ones who work weekends doing what we always do, missing out on kids' sports and family functions. We are the ones who cheerily spend Christmas Day with our patients while missing out on our own. And she says, to allow the possibility of removing the protection of EBA standards is a slap in the face of myself and all the other nurses in the country who, without question, sacrificed so much for our community. So Australians should not be fooled. The government's backflip on the Better Off Overall test this week will not protect Australians from being worse off under this bill. Jules is a hospo worker and a member of the Hospo Voice Union, and she sees right through the government's spin. Jules says the government has worded and spun the bill in a way that sounds like it's friendly to workers. After all, increasing flexibility and ending the confusion of casualisation sounds pretty good, right? Wrong, Jules says. When you get into the nuts and bolts, workers end up getting less. She is right. There are wholesale changes in the government's bill that will mean more low-wage and non-union agreements. Exactly when Australians need a pay rise to keep their heads above water. And there are wholesale changes in the government's bill that will make more workers casual, exactly when Australians are crying out for more job security. And there are wholesale changes in this bill, in this nasty plan, to make part-time work casual, exactly hurting our essential workers who need regular, secure hours to make ends meet and to care for their own families. The experts have spoken on this bill. And I'm talking about the workers like Christine, like Karen, like Jules, who have spoken out about this government's nasty plan. They already work hard for wages that are as, at best modest. They are the people we've called on again and again in this pandemic to keep us safe and to keep our community moving. Cleaners, nurses, hospo workers, these are the people who fought for us during the pandemic. They should not have to fight a pay cut that is being inflicted by their own government. But today I stand with them and I congratulate them for having the courage to stand up and do just that. Thank you, Senator Walsh. The time for discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page three of today's report. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave of the Senate to have the Greens' opposition to motion 1003 recorded. Is leave granted? I take that. Yes, leave is granted, Senator. Thank Bruce. you. So, could I please have the opposition to uh, Greens' opposition to motion 1003 on sustainable game hunting be recorded, please? Okay. Thanks, Senator Faruqi. So, um, as I said, we now move to um, consideration of documents on page three. Are there any speakers? Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, on behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present scrutiny... Oh, no, so sorry, 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 Senator Walsh. No, we're on consideration of documents on page three. We will come to that. And I take it there are no speakers, so now I'll proceed to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy. Chair, Acting Deputy Chair. 
On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest 3 of 2021. On behalf of the Chair of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, Senator Kitching, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the issues facing diaspora communities in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister. Uh, thank you. I table a response to a question taken on notice during question time yesterday, asked by Senator Wong relating to members of Parliament's staff, and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave being granted? I'll call the minister. Call the minister. Call the clerk. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Customs Tariff, Tariff Amendment Incorporation of Proposals and Other Measures Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. All those in favour say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the debate be now adjourned. Those in favour say aye. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Agriculture Legislation Amendment Streamlining Administration Bill 2019 without amendment. Clark. Business of the Senate, Order of the Day number one, Environment Communications Legislation Committee presentation of report. Thank you, Senator Davies. Uh, on behalf of the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Product Stewardship Amendment Packaging and Plastics Bill 2019, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings and documents presented to the Committee. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one. Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and a related bill, debate on the second reading and an amendment moved by Senator Watt. Senator Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak on the Federal Circuit, Federal Court Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and express my strong opposition to this misguided reform. The Family Court was established in 1975 under the Whitlam Labor government as a standalone specialist family court. The establishment of the court, along with no-fault divorce, put Australia at the forefront of developments in the field of family law. Whitlam's reform served as a model that was lauded and adopted around the world. This is a history and legacy we should be proud of and committed to constantly improving, not dismantling. And that is what this bill seeks to do, dismantle one of the most important components of our family law framework, while at the same time failing to address the real issues plaguing the current family law system. The bill would strip the family court of its essential distinguishing feature, its specialist nature as a, supreme, as a superior court dedicated to family law. It would emerge the family court with one of Australia's most poorly resourced and overburdened courts, 
the Federal Circuit Court. As Ms Pauline Wright, President of the Law Council of Australia, has explained, this merger would mean that Australian families and children will have to compete for the resourcing and hearing time with all federal matters. That is, on matters like migration and bankruptcy and those sorts of things that the Federal, court, the federal Circuit Court and the Federal Court deals with. The merger would result in the effective abolition of the Family Court of Australia, a respected, specialised and focused court dealing with family law issues. She said, and I agree, there must be an increase, not a decrease, in the specialisation in family law and violence issues. This is critical to the safety of children and the victims of family violence. Family law matters are not like other legal matters uh, that, that, general, that generalist courts tend to deal with. They involve complex relationships, power dynamics, and most importantly, the lives and well-being of children. These matters require nuanced, experienced and specialised responses. The kind of responses that are made possible by a specialised court like the Family Court. At the time of the Family Law Bill uh, was debated in 1974, Gough Whitlam recognised the importance of specialisations when he said, and I quote, the Family Law, the, the Family Court will of course determine legal rights, which it's bound to do as a court. But it will do much more than that. Here will be a court, the expressly stated purpose of which is to provide help, encouragement and counselling to parties and to have regard to their human problems, not just their legal rights. Recognising the importance of a specialised family court is not to deny the serious problems that currently exist in the family law system. Multiple reports over the last decade have explored these problems and diagnosed them as real causes. The Australian Law Reform Commission has conducted one of the most comprehensive inquiries into the family law system. Its landmark report, which this government has ignored, stated the family law system has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia and to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate. Over the last seven years of Liberal government, the family law system has been neglected. Family court and the Federal Circuit Court judges have not been replaced in a timely manner. Funding has not increased to match growing demand. Legal assistance services that support children and the most vulnerable litigants have been squeezed of resources. But instead of fixing these underlying issues, the government is determined to restructure the family court and the federal court, the circuit court in a way that makes a bad situation even worse for families and children. This bill is not the solution. It is opposed by virtually all of the family law sector. Some 110 stakeholders have written to the Attorney General asking him to abandon the bill. This includes judges, legal sector representatives, child protection advocates, and First Nations stakeholders. To take just one eminent example, Elizabeth Everett, Everett AC, the very first Chief Justice of the Family Court, warned, and I quote, merging the Family Court into a generalist court will undermine the integrity and the structural specialisation of the Family Court. The increased number of cases in which Issues of family violence and children abuse are raised as yet to an even higher and greater need today for family law jurisdictions 
to be vested exclusively in specialised judges who can give their full attention to the needs of family law clients without being diverted to exercise other unrelated jurisdictions. The current bill undermines this principle and is not in the public interest and should not be enacted. I want to speak briefly about the First Nations perspective. The National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service has said that the proposed merger will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable, uh, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families who need the most support. They've said, from our perspective as Aboriginal organisations, we say that mainstreaming does not achieve efficiencies or better outcomes for our people and that specialisation in the law is important and it works. Our main call is for, the, for more specialisation and more resourcing into the cultural competencies of the family court system. The introduction of specialist Aboriginal courts in the family law system has seen an increase in Aboriginal participation and we implore the parliament to do the right thing by our communities and reject the bill which does not address the root causes of these problems. We fear in the middle of this global pandemic, the, the bill will exacerbate the issues that our communities are facing. How often are the pleas and beggings of First Nations organisations have to be made in this chamber, only to see them ignored? It seems you're only capable of hearing about what you can do to the First Nations peoples and not what you can do with us. Even with the First Nations Minister. Why is it so difficult for this government to listen and to respond to First Nations peoples? Only two days ago in this parliament marked the anniversary of the national apology to the stolen generations. In my statement to this chamber on that occasion, I spoke of the terrible suffering and grief caused to the removal of children, or by the removal of children. And I spoke of the continuing pain and caused by the over-representation of, over, of First Nations children in out-of-home care today. Let me repeat some of those salient facts. First Nations children are nearly 10 times more likely to be living in out-of-home care than non-Indigenous children. There are currently over 20,000 First Nations children in out-of-home care in Australia. They make up 37 per cent of the total number of children in out-of-home care, despite representing only 6 per cent of the children population. More First Nations children are in care than at the time of the Bringing Them Home report was published more than 20 years ago. These figures are totally unacceptable and they are worsening. While the child protection system is distinct from the family law system, there is a critical connection. The family law system plays an important part in diverting families from the child protection system. It is an avenue for families, it's an avenue they can use to raise issues early and enable family members to step in and seek care of their children without the intervention of the state. By accessing specialist courts proactively, aunties, uncles, grandparents and parents can protect their children and ensure they remain connected to family and country in ways that are made much more difficult once child protection services get involved. A bill that diminishes the family court and the family court system is a bill that does not serve the interest of First Nations peoples. Yet again, this government shows its disdain for the views of First Nations peoples. A good family law system would take a human rights approach underpinning, underpinned by principles of self-determination. A good family law system would see the appointment of, a special, of specialist judges with the ability to decide cases in culturally appropriate ways. A good family law system 
would fund the preparation of cultural reports to aid those judges in their decision making. A good family system, a family law system would adequately fund the uh, legal assistance services to provide advice and representation to vulnerable lit litigants, including First Nation litigants. A good family system of law would provide family support services that are culturally safe for First Nations peoples. All of these things our government can do, but will they do it? No, no, no. On the vote of a couple of people, you're going to go down a road and destroy one of the best things done under the Whitlam government and has proved in this nation to be one of our best institutions, despite the lack of resourcing. All of these things our government can do. Instead, you're intent on dismantling a core component of what once made our family law system the envy of the world. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I understand, uh, Senator McCarthy, that you're ready to participate in the debate. Can I just confirm that you can hear us and that you're able to, to be heard? Yes, I can, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me? Uh, we can see your lips moving, but no sound coming through just yet. We can hear you very faintly. Perhaps broadcasting might assist in some way. Okay, thank you. Shall I just begin speaking to see if broadcasting can lift the volume? Okay, so, so at this point of time, we have no volume for you, Senator McCarthy. So can we ask the technicians to see if they can resolve that matter? And uh, I believe now... On uh, having been where Senator McCarthy is, just double check that your computer volume is up as high Senate, as it can. Senator Waters, thank you very much for the contribution. Um, thank you. So the suggestion is that your volume thank needs you. to be up, Senator McCarthy. Do you want to try thank again? Thank you, Deputy President. Can thank you, you for now? that assistance, Senator Waters. The volume uh, much button, it seems <laughs> does matter. So I call I call you now, um, <laughs> Senator McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you. I rise to speak against the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019 and Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. These bills would rob the Family Court of its essential distinguishing feature by collapsing it into one of Australia's busiest, most poorly resourced and overburdened courts, the Federal Circuit Court. This merger is being proposed without a sound policy basis and against expert advice. The Family Court of Australia is a proud Whitlam legacy. Like most of the great social reforms that have occurred in Australia, from Medicare to our world-leading superannuation system to free legal assistance services for Australians in need, the Family Court of Australia is an institution that has served our nation admirably. admirably. The Family Law Act 1975 instituted two major changes, no-fault divorce and the establishment of the Family Court of Australia, a specialist multidisciplinary court for the resolution of family disputes. This bill is proposing to undo the second of the major changes introduced by the Family Law Act, establishment of the Family Court of Australia as a specialist superior court. This would be a profoundly retrograde step which will harm Australian families and in particular children at their time of greatest need. The Morrison government claims that the proposed merger has been informed by independent reviews and inquiries over a decade. The Attorney General's department's website lists five reports under the heading, the evidence base for the reforms. In fact, none of the reports listed on the website recommended these radical reforms, none, none whatsoever. None of those reports even considered these reforms. In fact, the only one of the five reports that recommended restructuring, the Family Court and Federal Circuit Court, recommended an entirely different model, which would have maintained a standalone specialist family law court. The proposal to merge the Family Court with the Federal Circuit Court 
is not based on any consultation with Australian families or family law experts. More than 155 stakeholders in Australia's family law system have now signed an open letter to the Attorney General opposing the government's flawed bill to abolish the specialist standalone family court. These signatories represent a range of professions and community organisations from the Law Council of Australia to women's legal services, community legal centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, child protection advocates and disability services from across Australia. It also includes 11 retired family court and federal circuit court judges and chief justices, the Honourable Elizabeth Evert AC and the Honourable Alastair Nicholson, AO, RFDQC. Individuals and organisations oppose this proposal because they believe that it will harm vulnerable children and families in need of specialist family law assistance, increase rather than decrease cost, time and stress for families and children in the family law system, place further stresses on federal circuit court judges who are struggling under unsafe, unsustainable and unconscionable workloads, and it fails to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence survivors falling through the cracks. Northern Territory stakeholders who have signed on to that letter include representatives from the Darwin Community Legal Service, the Central Australian Women's Legal Service, the Central Australian Family Violence and Sexual Assault Network, the Catherine Women's Legal Service, Dawn House, Northern Territory Council of Social Services and the Sex Worker Outreach Program Northern Territory. The National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services has said that the proposed merger will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families who need this support. From our experience as Aboriginal organisations, we say that mainstreaming does not achieve efficiency or better outcomes for our people, and that specialisation in the law is important and it works. Our main call is for more specialisation and more resourcing into the cultural competence of the family court system. The introduction of specialist Aboriginal courts in the family law system has seen an increase in Aboriginal participation. We implore the parliament to do the right thing by our communities and reject this bill, which does not address the root causes of these problems. We fear in the middle of this global pandemic, the bill will exacerbate, exacerbate the issues that our communities are facing. The CEO of Community Legal Centres Australia, Nazim Miraj, said the merger would move away from a specialist family court model, exposing survivors of family violence to unnecessary risk. Law Council President, Dr. Brash QC has said, as the impacts of the devastating shadow of family violence experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic continue, now is not the time to proceed with an unnecessary risky bill that has been opposed by all non-government members of the House of Representatives. Madam Acting Deputy President, as signatories have said, if anything, there is in fact more need for a specialist family court. As the Australian Law Reform Commission noted in its landmark 2019 report on the family law system, a report the government commissioned but is completely ignored, the Whitlam government could not have foreseen the growth in the incidence and awareness of family violence and child abuse since 1975. Here in the Northern Territory, the Central Australian Women's Legal Service, a signatory to the open letter agrees action can be taken now to further increase family violence specialisation in the family law system. Women's legal services across Australia work on the front line to represent family violence victim survivors in all state and territory justice systems. They recognise that the core business of the family law court is family violence. Yet the family law system 
is not adequately protecting the safety of women and children. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families experience family violence at higher rates than other Australian families. In comparison with other Australian women, First Nations women are 34 times more likely to be hospitalised as a result of family violence and 10 times more likely to be killed. Here in the Northern Territory, we have one of the highest rates per capita of domestic and family violence in Australia. We know this because we have mandatory reporting of domestic violence in the Northern Territory. It was something that I introduced as Minister for Children and Families in 2009. And we did this in order to recognise that we needed to change attitudes towards family and domestic violence, and that it is everyone's problem. The National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, NACHO, points out that there remains significant fear amongst First Nations people of engaging with the family law system as a result of the historical legacy of the forced removal of children and forced resettlement of communities. As my colleague Senator Dodson has said in his response to this bill, we've only seen again and again in the reports this week of the stolen generations and the continued trauma of families of First Nations children throughout the country. NITO recommend that legal education, information, options and processes to be made more accessible to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in First Nations languages, plain English and formats appropriate to particular communities and age groups and that Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, ARCHOs, are funded to provide family dispute resolution practitioners programs. English language and literacy issues have presented a barrier to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people accessing the family law system and related services, particularly when English is not a first language or when there are literacy difficulties. I have stood in the Senate on so many occasions to express the enormity of the different languages that we have here in the Northern Territory, of nearly 100 First Nations languages uh, that is covered under the Aboriginal Interpreter Service System here. While appropriately trained and qualified on-site interpreters can be critical to mitigating communication barriers, the availability of interpreters, particularly in First Nations languages, can be severely limited. Further compounding and complicating communication barriers is the need for interpreters to be of a particular gender, age, or even relationship to the client. Technical legal terms and processes, the relationship between a client and their lawyer, and conflict of interest issues also make some interpreters inappropriate. Without adequate legal representation, clients may not understand their legal options and may not convey their case effectively in court. We know that there are problems in the family court, and these have led to unacceptable delays for families and in particular children. But these issues do not arise out of its specialisation or even its structure. The reason why the family law system is not performing as it should is because for seven years, the Liberal government has cut funding to legal assistance services like ATSILs, family violence prevention legal services, and other Aboriginal community controlled organisations. It's failed to replace retiring judges in a timely manner and failed to even respond to the dozens of recommendations that have been made by experts to improve the family law system. As the Australian Law Reform Commission found, the family law system has been deprived of resources to such an extent that it cannot deliver the quality of justice expected of a country like Australia. And to whose family law system other countries once looked and tried to emulate? Madam Acting Deputy President, this does have impacts for most Australians, but in particularly for my constituents here in the Northern Territory. We're getting to court and accessing legal services can be difficult for people in rural and remote regions, most of whom are First Nations people. The Central Australian Aboriginal Family Legal Unit points out that due to geographic and economic restrictions, many First Nations families have limited or no access to family law services. In Alice Springs, for instance, the federal family court sits only three or four times a year. 
the local court does not exercise family law jurisdiction. This presents significant challenges to the ongoing safety of First Nations families experiencing family violence who require urgent family law orders. Will this bill help solve this issue? Or like the evidence from experts point out, will this merger proposal in fact increase cost, time and stress for families and children and place further stress on federal circuit court judges? As the experts have made very clear, this merger proposal will do nothing to address delays in the family court system. There's nothing in this bill that will increase the number of interpreters, judges, registrars and other court staff. There's nothing in this bill that will force the Attorney General to do his job, even something as basic as appointing new judges as vacancies are created. There are many things, Madam Acting Deputy President, that need fixing within the family law system. But this bill will do none of it. This bill will do nothing to help Australian families. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I call Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. And it is quite an honour to follow on from Senator McCarthy and Senator Dodson. And if there's two people in this chamber who have some expertise around uh, First Nations groups, then it is these two. I mean, Senator Dodson's track record is enormous over many, many years, and uh, he's not known as the father of reconciliation for nothing. And yet his contribution today, pleading with the government, pointing out uh, how bad the merger of the court systems will be for our First Nations people, I suspect, as he said, has fallen on deaf ears. Senator McCarthy has lived her life in the Northern Territory, one of our states that um, you know, has very vulnerable citizens living in it. Senator McCarthy has been a minister in a Labor government in the Territory. She has some expertise in these matters. And yet the comments that she made and the very valid contribution that she made about um, the likely impact of this legislation on First Nations people in the Territory, I suspect will be ignored. Um, I've had the honour today of chairing a lot of the Senate and I've heard a lot of the debate. And it's, it just makes, no one has put to me yet why this merger makes sense, no one. And Senator McCarthy, when she started her speech, um, alluded to the fact that the, the website, the minister's website, apparently under the justification for the court mergers, has five reports none of which recommend what is currently being proposed. The other issue that disturbs me greatly is it's one thing to have a debate in this place uh, and do the best you can to negotiate, to try and get improved outcomes as particular parties see fit. It's quite another just to trade your vote off just to trade your vote off for some improvement in your state or some commitment to something else at a later stage. That's not democracy. That is not democracy. And there's not a single group outside of the Morrison government who thinks this proposed merger has any merit at all. And I don't know why that falls on deaf ears. Surely someone on the government side is listening we have yet to learn about why this merger is taking place. Certainly none of the legal centres in this country agree to it. None of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal centres think it's a good idea. Former judges don't think it's a good idea. So why is the Morrison government doing this? We've seen particularly this week but certainly since the time of Mr Abbott's election as Prime Minister. This is a government that really hasn't done much towards the advancement of women. So is it yet another example, because women are disproportionately affected 
by the, the outcomes of the family law court. So is it that continuing um, ignorance and do-nothing approach in relation to women that's driving the Morrison government? I mean, their budget this year was criticised from all sorts of quarters because it didn't deliver to women. Is that why this government is doing this? Is it some punishment of young children? Because we've seen, uh, again, the Morrison government's childcare policies not deliver to children. Is that what they're doing? We're now having Australian families out of pocket in relation to childcare uh, costs. So is it that continuing not caring about the welfare of children that's at stake here? Or is it, as we've seen both uh, the Abbott government, the Turnbull government and the Morrison government, try and take force more responsibility and costs onto states? Is that what's driving this move? Is that what it's about? You know, we had, um, I think it was Mr Turnbull come up with an idea at the snap of his fingers that somehow the state should fund their health systems. Um, Mr Morrison is very good at saying, well, it's not his responsibility. So is this merger about forcing the states to um, pick up more responsibilities? Certainly when we go to welfare issues and the negative outcomes that will undoubtedly be a result of this merger of the court system, who picks up the cost for that? Well, not the federal government, it will be the states because they are responsible for, for uh, welfare. You know, we've heard from uh, today from uh, Senator Dodson and S Senator McCarthy about the appalling state of ch child removal, which with a court system that's merged could well get much worse. Personally, I've had experience of the family law court my experience was pretty reasonable and fairly quick because I was able to settle most things amicably with uh, my partner and we both, my former partner, and we both had to go to the family law court uh, and talk about uh, and explain how our children would be dealt with. Now, you know, I'm an educated middle class woman, but even that for me was pretty onerous. I can't imagine. Uh, how um, women and indeed men will get on in a merge system where those support services are much harder to, to access or may in fact fall away. I've also um, been inside the court system, the criminal court system, and I tell you what, the court building in WA, they're very stark. The family law court is actually quite a nice building. But the central law courts are not a place you want to be. They're full of police. We already know about many people's poor interaction with the police, but the police are there because they've got other matters to transact. But nevertheless, that's what you are confronted with. Um, they're heavily secured, as they should be. But again, uh, vulnerable pe people having to go through that, have their bags searched, maybe they've got children with them, they're already in an emotional state, that's a very poor experience. WA is not a heavily populated state, but nevertheless, the Central Law Court is a big court. It's a big court to find your way around. I've sat on a couple of jury trials, and that's not, you know, I did my duty. Um, but to see the vulnerabilities that I saw as a juror is awful and merging our court systems will put all sorts of people in the same area. It's just a very poor system. I've spoken in this place before and, you know, a lot of Labor senators have made the contribution today. Well, is this because it was put in place by Gough Whitlam, the great social reformer? Because we know that the Morrison government certainly doesn't like Medicare. It attacks Medicare at every opportunity. And the amazing reforms that uh, Mr Whitlam put in place are la have lasted us through to this day. And one of the really important reforms was no-fault divorce and the establishment of a special court to deal with family breakup. Because 
as a young person or even a, as an older person, when you commit through formal marriage to someone, it's a big deal. You see your life um, before you with a partner, maybe children, owning a home together, having your soulmate at your side. It's a big deal to make that commitment. And for many couples in Australia, including me, it doesn't work out. So at that point, you don't want to be having to deal with more vulnerabilities or um, to be having to go to court in an emotional state and not be dealt with in a fair manner. We're not dealing with people uh, in a family court situation who are on top of their game in lots of cases because their emotions are all over the shop. And that's made much worse when, as we've heard from many other senators, it's coupled with um, domestic violence and family violence. If you are also, you've experienced domestic violence, imagine then having to go to some kind of merged court. But I want to talk about my mother. Thankfully, when my mother went through uh, her divorce to my father, it was before Gough brought the reforms in. So they had to invent a reason for their divorce. The other point was that in, um, in the days that my mother got divorced, there was a list in the local newspaper of who was getting divorced and the reasons. And the reasons. Now, my mother was um, a prominent woman in the local community. She was a deputy principal of a primary school. She was devastated, one, at having to come up with a reason. Her marriage, like mine, simply broke down. And the easiest way to get a divorce when we didn't have uh, no fault divorce was to imagine the reason was adultery. So imagine how my mother felt putting the reason for her marriage breakdown as adultery and imagine when that was published in the paper. What a scandal. What a scandal. Now, my mum was still in love with my father when they divorced and having to go through that bogus system of having it published in the paper that, one, she was divorced and, two, that it was adultery must have been awful. It must have been awful. So thankfully, with the um, evolution of the um, specialist family court, we've done away with uh, no-fault divorces. But gee, you'd have to wonder, because remember, and I think I'm stand corrected on this, I do believe it was under the, uh, the Abbott government, when um, minister, as he was at that time, uh, Kevin Andrews, came up with this notion that well, people were going to make money available for couples counselling. And he made, I don't know, I think it was $200 from memory to try and stop people going down the divorce track. So we've already seen a little tiny snip snip. Before you get divorced, we just give you a bit of counselling. This from a government that stands in this place every day of the week and tells us how it doesn't interfere in the lives of individuals. It doesn't look over people's shoulders. It doesn't tell them how to spend their money. And yet here we have a government that wants to dictate about how you'll get a divorce. Now, of course, you've heard from many senators in this place today about the resource issue at the uh, family court, and none of us are glossing over that. There is a resource issue. We've had a conservative government that's been s slow to um, appoint judges, that has starved the court system of um, dollars. And remember when I think it was Senator Cash and uh, Senator Brandis was still around, how they decided to take money off the CLCs. So if, for whatever reason the government has, which is completely uh, hidden by not only Labor senators and other senators who oppose the bill in this place, but from anyone connected with the family law court, we have a government who wants to reduce funding to the courts. That community law centres, when the government 
took their funding away. They denied it for about eight months and they finally had to fess up, Senators Brandis and Cash. But yes, they had and they quickly slipped some of the money back. I mean, I've seen how those community law centres work. They operate off the smell of an oily rag. And we're a wealthy country. We should have a properly resourced, separate family law court. And I hope tonight we will hear from the minister why they are wanting to merge the courts, because it makes sense to no one except the few people in the Morrison government who came up with this idea. Roll out the organisations who support this merger, because we haven't heard from them. No one in here has named any of them. We've just heard opposition after opposition from leading specialists, from former judges. It's a good system. Yes, there are issues with it. It's a resourcing issue. Ask anyone and that's what they'll tell you. And I can't believe that we're here debating a bill tonight which has essentially been traded away for some kind of partisan interest. It's disgraceful. And that is not how democracy works in this country. You have a fair debate. You have a fair process. You don't go and do a side deal with a couple of senators to get your legislation pa passed. That is not democracy. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Stirl. Yeah, uh, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make my contribution to this cluster mess that we've got in front of us here. And it's nothing more powerful than when you hear from senators who speak on an issue of something that they have either lived or breathed recently or for many years. It is powerful and it is even more moving when they can share their experiences with the topic at hand. I myself have been lucky. I have not had to go to the family court. I have been a visitor at times to certain other courts, Senator Gallagher, that was all in the fair day's work, wasn't it, mate? Um, so anyway, um, one thing before I do talk about the bill, and I do want to touch on uh, um, a statement that, that Senator Lambie, and Senator Lambie, I was in here early this morning, Senator Lambie's um, passionate contribution, it was powerful. And uh, I, what got me with Senator Lambie was she made one statement and she said, you know, we all know the lawyer's picnic. Well, this is the lawyer's banquet. And I just want to share a few stories here. And I, I, I consider lawyers are essential when you've got yourself in a bit of manure and you need to get out of it. But they're like, to me, they're like insuring your car. No one wants to pay it, but by crikey, you wish you had it when you prank it. But the experiences that I have heard and conversations I've had with many um, people with the family law court, well, I'm pleased to hear Senator Lyons one wasn't too bad, but I don't think I've ever, prior to that, heard of a happy divorce. What I have heard is the drawn out, and, and, and it's anecdotal because it's people telling me, um, times that it takes to get to court, to the family court, and a lot of it's created because, as Senator Lyons said, that there's resource issues. I get that, and I'm not, and not at all um, having a crack at the, the judges and the fine people that work in the courts, but I'm scathing of the lawyers' picnic, banquet, whatever you call it. The stories that I have heard where divorces, and let's not forget that there are children a lot of the times involved. Let's not forget that it's probably, I could see it could be a very traumatic experience, uh, if it, if, even if it only went for, for, for a few weeks or a month. But these go on for years, years and years. And I'm going to say this, and I'd make no apology to the, law, the legal fraternity out there. By God, there's some parasites amongst you. When I was running my trucking business, I wish I could charge what you people charge. I, you know what I would have given to be able to charge 30 bucks for a piece of photocopying? Would you know what I would have given for, for, for the blood, the sweat and the tears that, that, that I lost over the years between Perth and the Northern Territory that I could charge by the minute? My goodness me. And not only that, the stories that I've heard from friends of mine that have gone through this, when they have made uh, offers to their partners and, and, and their partners, for whatever reason, have said no, this is male and female, and then they go visit the parasitic law, legal firm that gives them the false 
hope. And I say false hope because it is false hope. When they get in their ear and they stretch it out and they say, no, we can go for this or we can go for that or we'll want more, let's just get another hearing. But, oh, by the way, we can't get there for 12 months or 8 months or 13 months and then we'll get there and someone might not turn up and here we go again. It's another four or five months. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. You can hear, you can hear, the, do you can hear the dollars falling out of the poor devil's pockets into the parasitic legal firm's pockets. And you know how many times... I have got to that situation where I said to me, and I experienced a lot of this when I was on the road. Um, and I'd say to me, mates, I hadn't seen them for a month or so, and we'd cross each other's path. I said, How's your divorce going, mate? Oh, crikey. And he said, You're not going to believe this. He said, It's cost me, and I'm making up figures here, X amount of dollars. And I'm not talking 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, massive amounts of money to be dragged through the courts through the, and the partner to be dragged through the courts and a heck of a lot of dollars goes to both sides of the legal representations around that have been leading these poor devils down the wrong path all this time, walking away with 100, 120, 150 grand and the settlement many times has been what the first offer was. Now, who in the heck thinks that's a good idea that we can just give these people licence to print money whenever they like. So let me come back to the bill. I just have to get that out because there will be no one in this land, no one will convince me that I'm not on the side of the angels here. There is no one in this land or this parliament that will convince me that I may be a bit rough on the lawyers. And I don't care who the lawyers are. It goes for the lot of you. So coming back to the mergers of the two courts, and listening to the conversations, the, the contributions, predominantly from this side of the chamber, probably all from this side of the chamber at this, this stage, I'd say, where are the government senators on this? Because it would be lovely to know. See, this is the problem. When you get lawyers making laws in this building, when they're not lawyers outside, where's the influence coming from? All right, okay. And there's, there's so many questions that haven't been answered. The Attorney-General, I've got this, the Attorney-General, another lawyer, fancy that, did not undertake any meaningful consultation in relation to this pro proposal to effectively abolish the Family Court of Australia. Didn't take any consultation, yet there's a bill going to go through tonight and they've got the numbers. It's going to happen. There was no meaningful consultation with the legal profession or with, with other family specialists. One would have thought, crikey, you'd have to talk to them, wouldn't you? You know, the, the, like counsellors didn't get consulted, child psychologists, I'm told, didn't get consulted. We forget about it. As I said earlier on, most senators have touched on that the pain that the families go through, the grief, and then when the kids are used as pawns, that's another... You know, I don't even want to go down that path. That's painful enough for the people that have, have been through that. Fortunately, I haven't. There was no consultation with users of the family law system. So Australian families don't get a say in this. Other than with the Chief Justice, the government did not even consult with the judges of the family court. So, so Senators, I ask you, how are we... How are we going to sit here and watch a bill go through tonight where, what on the surface, it appears that it was a good idea between the Attorney-General and, and the Chief Justice and the LMP party room? Like, yeah, tick off. No worries, mate. She'll be right. Let's go for it. If that's the way their caucus room works... Might... Anyway, I know you're distracted. There's other things going on, as there is in this building all, all, all the time. But something as simple as this. So... What I am told and informed um, um, quite clearly is that no less than 110, 110 stakeholders, ranging from the Law Council of Australia to Women's Legal Services, Community Legal Services, and as we so um, uh, heard before from Senator Dodson and from Senator McCarthy, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services, child protection advocates and disability services from uh, across Australia have written to the Attorney-General to ask him to abandon this proposal. And sadly, I'm well informed, they've been ignored. But that doesn't surprise me because this Attorney-General, Mr Porter, has form on ignoring people. How do I know? Because I was uh, at his office with a heap of women who are uh, uh, seeking access to JobKeeper because the government had shut down their industry and all they wanted to do, peaceful protests, they presented the document, knocked on the door and said, could we speak to Mr Porter? He wouldn't even meet with them. So I'm not surprised about that. 
doesn't surprise me at all. He's got form around it. Still, and I'm still waiting for him to correct me because I know, he, I know because I was there. So these 110 individuals and organisations oppose this proposal because they believe that it will harm vulnerable children and families in need of specialist family law assistance. How are you going to sleep at night just with that one line? The, 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 I'm shaking me out. I'm hoping I'm going to wake up. It's a bad dream. In, and it's going to uh, increase rather than decrease cost, time and stress for families and children in the family law system. It's going to increase it. So, Mr Porter, please explain that to me, how you think that's a great idea. You can't because you got together with someone who we're not quite sure who it is, made up this decision without even consulting anyone. But you'll be right, mate. You'll tuck yourself in your safe office there. You'll get your $400,000 a year. Bit of luck you won't even have to talk to your staff if they put another door on the building for you. They also say that it will place further stresses on the Federal Circuit Court judges who are struggling under unsafe, unsustainable and unconscionable workloads. And I can imagine that. I touched on that. I couldn't imagine the workload of a judge. I know our workload. But I, but I sympathise with the judges' workloads. They also say it will fail to address any of the fundamental problems plaguing the family law system, including the risk of family violence survivors falling through cracks. Surely wouldn't that be a red flag for the Attorney General who doesn't like to talk to people? I, I really I just, I just wish the party room, and there's lawyers on the party room there that I would really wish, I'd love to hear from them. I'd love to hear from you know, those on the opposite side, even if they just challenged their Attorney General to find out what the hell is going on. And they quite rightfully should. I'd love to know why that hasn't happened. And if it has happened, sadly, he doesn't even listen to his caucus. So the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System received no more, uh, sorry, no less than, wait for this figure, for those of us that have been around this place for a while and those that have just arrived, 1,700 submissions. I thought I'd read it wrong. I thought someone's you know, got an itchy finger and, and put another zero on. I have been, I can't, can't, I can't remember how many inquiries I've been on or how many uh, motions I've seen go through this place to send uh, bills off to committees. 1,700. I'd probably challenge, apart from the Royal Commission maybe, I don't know, have we ever seen any, any, uh, as many as that submissions go to one inquiry? Gobsmacking. Now, as a senator representing the great state of Western Australia, I'd like to take the opportunity to read into the Hansard some of the concerns and reasonings from organisations and, in, in, and individuals sorry, in WA who made submissions so we can look at this debate from their perspective. Now, as we've heard, the ALRC released a landmark report on the family law system in 2019, which, sadly, this government has ignored. The Family Law Practitioners Association of WA, the principal representative body of Western Australian lawyers, practising in the area of family law, in its submission to the inquiry on Australia's family law system, said they were, and I quote, concerned that this inquiry was being conducted in circumstances where the government was yet to address the recommendations of the recent ALRC report. <coughs> and I quote, family law for the future and inquiry into the system. That's what it was titled. They also said that they hoped that their submission directed the committee's attention to some of the relevant recommendations of the ALRC report. Now, Community Legal WA, headed by my former colleague, the member for Hasluck, Sharon Jackson, in its submission made a standalone recommendation which relates to exactly what this bill is trying to achieve. Now, Community Legal WA recommends that any proposal to merge the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court of WA be abandoned with any discussion of future amendment to structural arrangements based upon the recommendations of the ALRC. <coughs> Again, this is the very ALRC who was tasked by this government to produce a report to look into the family law system in Australia. The ALRC produced that report, all 500 and 83 pages of it with 60 recommendations, and the government's still ignored it. Now, I know it might take Mr Porter maybe a lot longer to read 
583 pages of, you know, I understand that. But you didn't, wouldn't you think you would just have the decency to respond when you ask people to send recommendations or write reports? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Now, the very first Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Elizabeth Evatt AC, has said that, and I quote, the proposed merger of the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court will lead to undesirable outcomes for families and children. Any senator or any member of the House of Representatives in this nation, surely that would be the first thing you look at and say, why? Why would I go to my caucus room and play Geppetto and get them all dancing up and down while I'm pulling the strings, telling them what a great thing it is, even though I'm not answering anyone and I'm not telling them what I'm going to do? Who would think that you could pass a bill then pull the guillotine on if you don't get, you know, if you're running out of time, uh, and and not think if it's going to harm children and families. Who in their right mind would wake up in the morning and think, "Geez, I might pass a bill, and with a bit of luck, I'll be able to harm some children and a family." Now, if I was the AG, I would be defending my stance on this. I would be busting down every door to get into every place I could to say you're wrong and these are the reasons you're wrong. But typical of Mr Porter, he's the phantom. Pfft, and he disappears in a puff of dust. God almighty, there's people at my door. Oh, my. oh I'm sorry, I've just ran out of time. We're rejecting the bill. Thank you, Senator Stell. <laughs> Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I'd too like to make a contribution on the Federal Circuit Family Law Court uh, of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. And <clears throat> knowing absolutely zero about this bill and realising that I had to make a contribution on it, I've uh, read as much information as I could uh, get my hands on and listened to as many contributions uh, as possible today. And as always, when I don't really know what's going on, I go to the ever-reliable people at the Parliamentary Library and ask for a, a Bill's Digest. And, as always, they come good. And now the Bill's Digest at a glance, I think there's a, a little bit of irony there because at a glance the Bill's Digest is 37 pages long. So you need more than a passing glance uh, to get across the issues that are canvassed in the, um, <clears throat> the Parliamentary li Library's Bill's Digest. And basically I'm instructed that the, these bills were first introduced in 2018, lapsed at the end of the 45th Parliament on the 1st of July 2019. Uh, the 2019 uh, FCFC bill includes the following changes from the 2018 version. Rather than both divisions sharing the same original dis jurisdiction, there will be a single point of entry to the court with all matters initially filed at the FCFC Division 2 and the ability to transfer cases between divisions. Uh, the FCFC Division 1, rather than the Federal Court of Australia, will be responsible for hearing family law and child support um, appeals. The criteria for judicial appointments has been amended to require the FCFC Division 2 uh, judges to have the appropriate knowledge, skills, experience and aptitude to deal with the kind of matters that might be expected to come before them, including family violence in the case of family law matters. An express reference to family violence has also been added to the criteria for appointments of FCFC Division 1 judges. And regulations may, but are not required to, prescribe a minimal number of FCFC Division 1 judges. And the government has stated that this number is intended to be 25. So that's uh, the short, short history of the bill. And there had been a Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee um, inquiry and reported on on the 20th of November 2020. Uh, the Legislation Committee, so the Government Control Committee and the committee recommended the bills be passed. The Australian Labor Party, um, the Australian Greens issued separate dissenting reports. And I think as Senator Still has touched on, that might be just set aside as political you know, opponents not agreeing. <laughs> but the stakeholder comments referred to in the Bill's Digest 
they're quite instructive as well. You know, the majority of submitters to the Senate inquiry argued that greater resourcing rather than structural changes were required to address the issues faced in the family law system. They call on the government to respond to the recommendation of the Australian Law Reform Commission uh, when it produced family law for the future. So it was argy-bargy and the government went ahead with its uh, recommendation to be passed. Uh, the Australian Greens and the Labor Party uh, went the other way. But it's instructive that the majority of submissions were against the, uh, the bill. So we really do get to a system uh, here, and I, I think it's quite uh, instructive to, uh, to skip to the uh, Productivity Commission uh, uh, evidence in this matter. And the Productivity Commission's report on Government Services 2020 has highlighted an increase in the backlog of cases in the Family Law Court and a Federal Circuit Court. That is, cases in the court for over 12 months. It has identified a 34% increase in the family's backlog between 2013, 2012, 13, 2, 18, 19, and a 63% increase across the Federal Court, Federal Circuit Court. In respect of the funding and judicial appointments across the same period, the New South Wales Bar Association uh, provides the, same, the following summary. There's been an increase of just 2.7% or 6.7 to 24 million in operating appropriation provided to the Federal Court. Federal Circuit Court and the Family uh, Law Court from 2013-14 to 17-18. Real recurrent expenditure in the Family Law Code is almost halved from 100 million 940,000 in 12 13 to 57 million in 18 19. Real recurrent expenditure in the Federal Circuit Court increased from 111 million 486 in 12 13 to 154 942 in 18 19. And from the 30th of June 2013 to 19th of January 2018, only two judicial officers were added to each of the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court of Australia, bringing the total of 66 F F FCC judges and 33 uh, Family Court judges, representing a total increase of 4.3. So I think that paints a picture of a, a steady and increasing workload, a steady and decreasing uh, financial uh, support and not enough judges. And this is sort of uh, you know, instructive. Now, the, the 2021 budget, the Commonwealth made multiple funding commitments for the Federal Family Law Courts, including uh, $35.7 million over four years in additional resources and judges for the Federal Circuit Court to assist with the timely resolution of a problem it's caused in family law and migration matters. 2.5 million over two years from 2021 uh, for family law courts to maintain specialist court lists for urgent matters arising from COVID-19. And on the 13th of November 2020, the Attorney General, the Honourable Christian Porter, announced two new judicial appointments, currently uh, Federal Circuit court, court Judge Thomas Aldabello to the Family Court and uh, Kyle Beckhouse, Kylie Beckhouse to the Federal Circuit Court. So, you know, a long period of, uh, of lower funding, uh, a long period of increased workload, and not very good outcomes. And somehow or other, and I, I, you know, I do respect the work of the Parliamentary Library. This is a very, very, very complex issue. And, you know, there's been a KPMG review in 2014. It is recognised that the FCA, FCOA and the FCC operate in a broader constrained fiscal environment, which necessarily impacts on timely, efficient, equal, equal access to justice and facilitation of judicial decision making. Equally, reporting increases in case complexity and changes to the client profile uh, mean that the court are operating in a new landscape which present challenges to the timely, equal, efficient administration of judges. 
Now, presumably in 2014, that was a, a Liberal coalition government that uh, initiated, initiated the KPMG. And at the time, KPMG review of all three courts projected budget deficits for the years, financial year 14-15, and it was recognised as entrenched, entrenched structural funding issues. Amongst other things, the KPMG review concluded the current funding model for the courts is not sustainable. The question of sustainability cannot simply be addressed through the injection of additional funds or one-off cuts. It requires more fin fundamental uh, um, a review. And to achieve the budget, uh, uh, to achieve current budget across the four decimals of three court would require significant cost to service, cuts to service and staffing levels. Such cuts to administrative services are unlikely to form a sustainable basis or a driver for long-term efficiencies. So, you, you, and I don't, there's 37 pages from the parliamentary library of this information. I'll take you to the P, PWC report. 2018, the Attorney General's Department commissioned PWC to review the operations of the court in relation to the family law matters. Uh, the PWC report measured the performance of the family law court in the Federal Circuit Court in the following ways. By backlog, so between 12-13 and 16-17, pending cases older than 12 months grew by 38% in the Federal Circuit Court compared to 5% in the Family Court. Around 29% of all Federal Circuit Court uh, pending final order cases were older than 12 months compared to 42% in the Family Court. By time to trial, between 12-13 and 16-17, the national medium time to trial grew by 11.5 months to 17 months in the Family Court, while in the Federal Circuit Court, the medium trial, time to trial grew by from 10.8 months to 15.2 months. By cost of finalisation, in the Family Law Court, it costs nearly, uh, nearly 17,000 per finalised matter. In the Federal Circuit Court, the cost was approximately 5,500. By the amount of final orders on a judicial full-time equivalent basis, approximately 114 final orders were finalised by the Family Court judge per annum. In the Federal Circuit Court, approximately 338 final orders were finalised per judge per annum. And the cost to litigants, the party to party costs to be paid by litigants were estimated to be in the order of 110,000 per matter in the Family Court, including court fees but excluding appeals. While in the Federal Circuit Court, this was closer to 30,000. So I think what all this tells me, and I say at the start, I'm not really across this issue per se, but reading the, uh, the various um, submissions that I've seen, uh, reading this uh, parliamentary digest, Bill's digest, it says to me there's a huge problem here. Uh, but when you look at the Senate reports, the Joint Committee reports, and the position of respective organisations outside the party, and if you go back to Senator Steele's comment of 1,700 uh, submissions, you know, and the majority of which don't appear to be in support of the government's position, you have a huge problem which is being fixed by a government in a way that won't please anybody. And if it doesn't uh, please the legal fraternity, well, you may be able to say, well, you know, they have a vested interest. But if it doesn't reduce the time taken to get matters delivered, if it doesn't reduce the time or, or the amount of uh, money litigants have to pay, then how is it going to be more efficient? And I think that's a question that uh, Mr Porter hasn't... Uh, quite answered in this, uh, in this debate. And I, I didn't hear any particular comments of note from the, uh, from the other side of the chamber. So, you know, the Labor Party is opposed to this. I understand that Senator Hanson has, um, you know, has a different view. I understand the Australian Greens are probably going to oppose it. And the crossbenchers will do what the crossbenchers do, with either support, oppose or transact on it. And that's the way the parliamentary system works.
But I really do think that, um, you know, if people are in the unfortunate situation of not being able to deal uh, with family uh, separation or family court matters um, in a amenable way, and it does result in um, appearances at courts, uh, the use of lawyers and judges, that that should be a, an open, transparent and fair process. Um, I can't imagine a, a family with three children going through 18 months of litigation about who has access to who. And I mean, that sort of stuff is happening. And I think we are a better nation than that. And people should be able to have access to a jurisdiction which is eminently fair, reasonably inexpensive, and adequately resourced so that the impacts that may be felt by children in these awful situations is minimised. So, you know, in, in summing up from our position is very, very complex area. Um, you know, it's, uh, if you like, a Labor Party legacy from Gough Whitlam's day, and we've heard about, you know, people having their divorce published in the paper and the reasons why. Well, no one wants those days back. But we do want an open, transparent and fair system which allows access to justice, transparent, transparent and fair treatment, and it shouldn't cost you an arm and a leg. It shouldn't cost you half the family home. Um, people should be uh, you know, guided into solutions because it isn't all that complex. And most people, when they sit down, could work it out themselves. But that's not the system we have and this won't make it any better. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank members for their contributions to this important debate. The Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill of 2019 and the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill of 2019 brings together the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court of Australia to be known as the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia, or the FCFC. The Consequential Amendments Bill will facilitate the transition to the new FCFC. The FCFC will bring together the Family Court of Australia as Division 1 and the Federal Circuit Court as Division 2. The FCFC will continue to comprise the existing judges of the Family Court in Division 1 and the existing judges of the Federal Circuit Court in Division 2. The FCFC will provide a consistent pathway for Australian families and have common, streamlined processes and procedures to operate consistently. It will be simpler, more efficient, more effective and a more accessible court for Australian families to resolve their matters, meaning that we increase the number of matters that can be finalised each year. These proposed reforms have been developed in close consultation with the federal courts, including the heads of jurisdiction, and informed by a number of substantial inquiries over the last decade, including the 2008 Semple Review, a 2014 KPMG Review, a 2015 EY Report, the 2017 House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs Inquiry, and a 2018 PWC Report. Under this bill, there will be a single point of entry for all Australian family law matters, with all matters to be filed in Division 2. This will be of significant benefit to Australian families because it will simplify the process and save time and effort for those navigating the system. This is a reform that has been long called for, but to date it has not been able to be achieved or delivered. The bills will facilitate common and harmonised rules of court, which will simplify forms and the case management process for the ultimate benefit of the Australian families who use the system. While there has been long-term agreement that there should be common rules and practice, this has never occurred under the current existing legislative arrangements. As part of the bill, the Chief Justice will be invested with the power to make the rules of court for a limited period, after which the power will revert back to judges or a majority of judges of each respective division. While the bills originally prescribed that the Chief Justice would have this power for two years, the government has agreed to reduce this period to 18 months. The bills retain the appellate jurisdiction 
in the FCFC Division 1. But all Division 1 judges will be able to hear appeals, both as individual judges and as members of a full court. Further, the bills will enable the court to deal with appeals more efficiently, as appeals from decisions of the FCFC Division 2 will ordinarily be dealt with by a single judge from Division 1. The Chief Justice will have the ability to convene a full court to hear an appeal from Division 2 where appropriate. This will provide flexibility for a full court to hear appeals involving novel or complex questions of law. Both of these changes reflect the approach taken in the appellate jurisdiction of the federal court, which successfully exercises a substantial and diverse appellate jurisdiction. I can't tell you, Madam Acting Deputy President, how unfortunate it is that so much of the debate on these bills mischaracterises them and the current system as a whole. Most notably, despite what has been said, the bills we are dealing with and I make a point of this, Madam Acting Deputy President, do not abolish the family court. Judges appointed to the family court and the federal circuit court will continue in their existing appointments, and the government had committed to a minimum of 25 Division I judges in line with the recommendation of the simple review. The government will also now entrench that minimum number of Division I judges in the legislation itself, so there can be no doubt. It is also necessary to respond to claims that these bills will result in a loss of specialisation. That claim is false. The reality of our existing family law system is that the Federal Circuit Court deals with close to 90 per cent of family law parenting matters. There are around 40 judges of the Federal Circuit Court who hear only family law matters. It doesn't get any more specialised than that. And the average FCC judge hearing family law matters has, on average, 25 years of experience in family law. These judges have experience with matters involving families with complex needs, and the unfortunate reality is that they also have experience dealing with matters involving family violence. There have also been suggestions that the family court provides some greater level of service to families than one can get in the Federal Circuit Court. However, the CEO of the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court told the recent Senate committee inquiry, and I'll quote, for the avoidance of doubt, the court's internal family law services are shared between the courts. This includes registrar resources, family counsellors and registry staff, close quote. There is no difference in the level of service provided as between the two at present. There have also been claims made by those opposite that the government has failed to provide funding for the federal family law courts and the family law system. That simply ignores the significant investments this government has made. Since 2015, the government has committed $84.8 million for specialist domestic violence units and health justice partnerships, whereby lawyers and social workers provide legal representation, advice and support to those experiencing family violence. The government has provided $48.9 million to establish family advocacy and support services, which operate in family law registries to deliver duty lawyer and support services for people affected by family violence in their family law matters. We have banned the direct cross-examination of parties in family law matters involving allegations of family violence and allocated over $20 million in funding for legal representation to those affected by the ban. We've allocated more than $56 million to help families resolve family law property matters, including funding for family relationship centres to deliver mediation, for a two-year trial by legal aid commissions of lawyer-assisted mediation for property matters, and for the federal family courts to conduct a two-year trial of simpler and faster court processes for resolving family law property cases. Since early 2020, the government has co-located police and child protection officials in family law registries to improve information sharing between state and territory agencies, implemented with a $10.4 million investment. We've allocated $13.5 million for the Lighthouse Project, which has commenced in the Brisbane, Parramatta and Adelaide family law registries to pilot a systematic approach to identifying and managing family safety. 
We've implemented a new national legal assistance partnership worth more than $2 billion, and with $248 million of that being additional funding. The largest recipients of this funding are legal aid commissions, and 93 per cent of the representation services they provide are for family law matters. Over $140 million has been provided by this government in funding as part of the most recent budget to expedite family law matters and increase resourcing in the Federal Circuit Court. That includes funding for family law services, for the continuation of the current COVID-19 lists being operated by the courts, for improved and safer facilities for the Federal Circuit Court in Rockhampton and Launceston, and additional Federal Circuit Court judges and registrars, including an extra family law judge and five new family law judicial registrars. The government has also previously committed to the appointment of an additional Division I judge subject to the passage of these bills. The government has always held the view that resourcing applied to what, up to this point, has been a well-recognised failed structure in these courts would ultimately represent a situation where these valuable resources won't have their maximum impact for the taxpayer or for users of the court. As part of the implementation of this bill, the government will also provide a further Division I judge, two additional Division II judges and an extrajudicial registrar to support the Adelaide Registry and an additional $14.3 million for further legal assistance in South Australia to be used to establish a pilot program for family law matters. In addition, the government will re-establish the Family Law Council to provide further ongoing guidance on the family law system, and the government recognises the advocacy and support of Senator Patrick for those initiatives. The structural failings of the current split family law system are widely agreed and continuing to do nothing to fix this problem is not an option. Reform of any long-standing structural problem is challenging. The proposed reforms are the least radical path to end unnecessary confusion, costs and delay for thousands of Australian families that have arisen by virtue of this split system. The government is confident that these bills will deliver a significant improvement to the lives of the Australian families that are required to navigate the federal family law courts. I commend the bills to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Um, though the ayes will move to the, all of those of that opinion say aye, those against ayes, aye. those against say no. No. I only think I heard one voice. No. Don't, no. Two noes. Um, I think, I think the noes have it. Division required, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone tell if the ayes, Senator McGrath tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, we have two other impending divisions with other second reading amendments. I ask you to remain in the chamber. Senator Watt, I understand you're going to move an amendment on behalf of Senator Polly, is it? Senator Watt. I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1203. The question is that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt on behalf of Senator Polly be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone tell if the ayes, Senator McGrath tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 33. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber. There is one more second reading amendment to be immediately put. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Pratt, I move the second reading amendment on sheet 1206. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt on behalf of Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell off the ayes. Senator McGrath, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 32. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. Senators, we now move to the question on that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. The question is, the bill is be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath, tell if the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. We will now move into committee and I will call the clerk. Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill 2019. Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Bill 2019. With the concurrence of the Senate, the statements of reasons accompanying the request circulated for this bill will be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. There being no objection, it is so ordered. It is the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole. There being no objection, it is so ordered. Minister? I table supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to the government amendments to be moved to these bills. The question is, oh, sorry, Minister. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move together. Amendments 1 to 3 on sheet UN 126. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister? I seek leave to move together amendments 1 and 2 on sheet RC 137. Is leave granted? Senate. <laughs> Senator. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the opposition would agree to. Uh, moving amendments one and two on sheet RC137 together, but we would not grant leave to deal with sheets UN126 and RC137 together. 
so just need to clarify what it was that Senator Stoker was seeking to do. Senator, um, um, Minister. Thank you for clarifying that you're prepared to grant leave for sheets one and two of sheet RC137 to be dealt with together. Um, we also seek leave for um, amendments one to three of sheet UN126 to be dealt with by leave together. So you don't grant leave in relation to leave that? Leave is not granted, Minister. Leave is not granted. Sorry. Not both together. We'll deal with your th I think You'd we'll like deal, to deal with, with the, the first um, request first in terms of sure. um, sheet RC137, and then you can, after that is dealt with, we'll, we'll deal with your That's other fine. request. No problem. Thanks very much. A minute. Um, elaborate on the remarks I've made about the amendments other than what I have already put on the record during my summing no. up. So the question is, is that government amendments on sheets one and uh, 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 amendments one and two on sheet RC137 be agreed to? Senator? Uh, thank what? you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Just a short contribution here. Um, the opposition uh, this is a very, very modest change to a truly terrible bill, uh, but if, against the advice of all the experts, this bill is to pass the Senate, it's better that it passes with this amendment than without it. So on that basis, Labor will be voting in favour of this amendment. The question is, is that the, mem the amendments as moved be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The eyes have it. Minister? Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I would suggest that the question uh, be put on Amendment 1 to 3 of Minister, sheet. Minister, did you want to seek leave to move some amendments together? Um, I would like, I'd like to deal um, with UN 126 now. UN uh, UN one two six one two six. So I move Amendment One on sheet UN one two six. You didn't want to do them together, yeah. Senator Watt. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Just to clarify, the opposition is willing to, and in fact, I think has granted leave uh, to deal with amendments one to three on sheet one two six together. No, we, no, we didn't want them combined Sorry, with... Senator, Senator Watt, so, Minister, if you just seek leave now to um, deal with amendments one to three on UN 126, okay. and then we'll... already have continue. that leave? Yes. Yes. What? You'd like me to... Okay, I'll put it on the record. I seek leave to deal with amendments one to three on sheet UN 126 by leave, leave together. Granted. Leave is granted. Minister. Okay. Um, I would... I don't intend to um, do any more remarks, so I'd ask that the um, question be put that the amendment be agreed to. Senator, Senator Watt? Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm not sure uh, that Senator Stoker necessarily wants to move that the question be put. Um, no, I'll do that. Yeah, sorry. That's okay, my, yeah. sorry. You sorry. Just, we've moved uh, amendments one to three on UN sheet UN one two six. And the question is at that the amendments be agreed to. Thanks, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the amendments to the government amendments as circulated in my name on sheet oh. one two o eight. Uh, item one on the government sheet of amendments would if enacted, ensure that there would have to be at least 25 judges in Division 1 of the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia. These amendments would marginally improve a terrible piece of legislation. Let's not forget that when the Attorney-General first put forward a bill to merge the Federal Circuit Court and Family Court of Australia in the 45th Parliament, he explicitly stated that he intended not to appoint new judges to, to Division 1 as they retired. That would have amounted to a gradual abolition of Division 1 over time. And let's remember that Division 1 is, is what the existing family court would become if the government's legislation passes the Senate. The Attorney-General was forced to back away from that position in the 46th Parliament. 
Under its current iteration, the Federal Circuit and Family Court of Australia Bill would allow the Attorney-General to make a regulation to prescribe a minimum number of judges for Division 1, but nothing in the Bill would require the Attorney-General to make any such regulation. The fact that the Attorney-General has stated publicly that he would prescribe a minimum of 25 judges is meaningless. The Morrison government commits itself to doing things all the time and it almost never follows through. Item 1 on the government sheet of amendments will ensure that the Attorney-General cannot crab walk away from his commitment to prescribe a minimum number of 25 judges for Division 1, but it would still allow the Morrison government to reduce the number of judges in what will become Division 1 from 32 to 25, and I note that there is also a vacancy that has been created recently. We do not think that that is acceptable. That is why I have moved an amendment to this amendment to prescribe a minimum number of 32 judges in Division 1 so that the number of judges in that division cannot drop below 32. But even if our amendment to this amendment succeeds, none of the changes to the bill that we are debating will address any of the fundamental problems with the legislation. The government's bill will still rob the Family Court of Australia of its essential distinguishing feature, which is, a, which is that it is a court that deals only with family law matters. The government's bill will still do nothing to address any of the problems in the family law system, a system that the Liberals and Nationals have neglected for over seven years. The government's bill will still make an already bad situation even worse for Australian families. The government's bill will still, in the words of the Law Council, represent a terrible gamble with the lives of children and families. But in the event that this bill does pass the Senate, it is better that it passes with these amendments than without them. The question is, is that opposition amendments to the government amendment be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. A division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the opposition amendments to Govern Amendment 1 be agreed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as seller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as seller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.